Hello, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Visual Studio Code with Node.js. I'm Rami Sayar, and with me is Stacey Mulcahy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm fully with you this morning. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and, oh, wait, already. There's, there's, already. A, there's the one, the first, the first awesome counter. <laughs> uh, no, that's two now. Wait, what, where's the awesome count? Anyways. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Oh, there we go. Yes! yes. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about Node.js, and uh, we're going to be using this really, really awesome new tool called Visual Studio Code. For those of you who have come from another background, perhaps maybe using Sublime or some other uh, editors, you're going to find yourselves really, really excited about this tool. It's, it's going to be amazing. It's beautiful. It is. It, it is, is beautiful. I actually beauty. like it's now yeah. my, my go-to tool every single time I code. Um, so yeah, a little bit about us. Hi, Stacy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Stacy Mulcahy. I'm a technical evangelist out of New York City. Uh, I focus mostly on the web stack, so HTML, JavaScript. Um, I dabble in the IoT uh, design and UX. Um, you know, so I, I talk about all those things, and sometimes I cover uh, even marketing. You can find me on Channel 9, uh, doing lots of random things across the board. My name is Rami, and uh, I'm actually from Montreal, so if there's any Canadians online tonight, please, please, please put some, uh, some chat, uh, some A's in the, in the chat. Some It'll maple definitely, syrup. Uh, some maple syrup as well, if you can find a way to do that. Uh, that would be great. Uh, so actually, my focus is so very similar to... Um, Stacy's. I focus on the web, HTML5, uh, Node, uh, and right now I'm super into Microsoft Edge, working on uh, getting those uh, web standards uh, uh, there and, and showcasing some of the really cool stuff we could do with Microsoft Edge. Uh, in Montreal, I like to help out um, different developer communities. I speak at a lot of different conferences, and I work a lot with startups as well. And if you're curious about some of the stuff that I've been working on, it's all on MSDN. So that's definitely uh, the place to go if you're interested in HTML5 articles, Node.js articles, it's all up there. So today we're going to be covering a bunch of different things in terms of Node and uh, kind of showing you uh, Visual Studio Code and some of the features of Visual Studio Code. And so what we're going to be covering today is we're going to be doing an introduction to Node.js. So this is going to be taking you through the very beginning of Node.js. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, introduction to Express, very popular framework that you end up using with Node. Um, we're going to talk about Express and databases. We're going to also be doing a little bit of the front end for your Express uh, web apps, you know, explaining things like Bootstrap a little bit and Jade and how they kind of relate to Node and Express. Uh, we're going to go through debugging and deploying Node.js, and we're also going to be talking a little bit about, okay, you've been using this mostly throughout the day to build websites. We're going to talk a little bit about how can you actually build something that's like a, you know, like a, a cron job or an Azure web job, and, and how can we call it continuously, and what kind of things can you do there? So, you know, having a little bit of fun, I think, towards the end of the day in terms of uh, expanding your knowledge. Yeah. Uh to set some expectations, uh, ideally, you guys might have had some experience with web development. Uh, if you're a web designer who knows HTML5, CSS, you'll feel right at home. We're going to walk you through uh, Node.js straight from the beginning. Uh, so if you've seen or used or played around with JavaScript, you'll be great. Uh, and of course, any developers with experience using other service-side languages like Python, PHP, Ruby, uh, you'll actually really enjoy this uh, tutorial today. Uh, now, of course, there are some great, great um, other resources out there. Among them, uh, Mastering Node, which is this free book that you can find online. And uh, if you're curious about how to set up Node.js on your Windows machine, or if you just want to read a very lengthy article that explains all the different pieces of Node.js, uh, you can go to that short link at the bottom, aka.ms-node-101. Uh, uh, and it'll be a great um, uh, article for you. So again, taking this course, you can earn some points. And so if you enter the code Node.js Visual Studio, and that's going to expire on the 30th of August, um, you can get your points, 50 MVA points for this. Um, and you know, again, this is going to kind of be a follow-up to our previous one that we did. So this is going through a little bit more of visual code. So get your, get your MVA points while you can, I guess. Yeah. The best way to put it. All right. Let's get started. So introduction to Node.js. I guess in this module, what we're going to cover is uh, the basics of Node. What is Node? Uh, when was it started? Uh, we're going to show you how to set up your environment if you're on a Windows machine, if you're on a Linux distribution, or even o o OS X. We'll uh, 
we'll uh, show you how to get that started up and running. Uh, and then we're going to build our first Node application. So we're going to walk through um, the different parts of Node and how it's a little bit different from JavaScript. And then uh, once we've got a couple of great applications uh, that we've built, we're going to talk a little bit about the Node Package Manager, which is phenomenal. It's it, the, 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 the single thing that I like the most about the Node community, it's the Package Manager, seeing all of these packages out there and helping you build your projects really fast and really quickly. It's magic. It is. It is magic. It's like all of a sudden we've got uh, all of these things that like just do half the work for you. <laughs> but really, the, your job at that point is to just make sure that the packages work correctly and to put them together. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. Um, now, if you want to check out some of the code that we're going to be playing with today, uh, it's actually on a uh, GitHub repo already, so you can go get it uh, right there. Um, you you might want to pay attention. So as we're doing the tutorials, we're going to be going through uh, uh, all the different folders, but we're going to be uh, perhaps jumping between some of the folders uh, and just pay attention during the video so that you know which folder we're actually in. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so why don't we get started? Yeah, let's all do right. this. So let's talk about Node first. Uh, what is Node? Ah, it's like you're asking me the ultimate question. <laughs> uh, you know, Node.js is a runtime environment and library for running JavaScript applications outside the browser. And at the nutshell, that means that if you're a JavaScript developer and you're used to doing something on the front end, you now can take that knowledge and start doing things on you know, server-side or back end. Um, yep. Node is mostly used to run real-time server applications. And, uh, shines through its performance using non-blocking I.O. and asynchronous events. Yeah, and that's actually really powerful because f traditionally that's been always a complex way to build applications, like real-time applications. You know, you had to have this loop of some sort that was keeping track of time and whatnot, and it, it was fairly complicated, but Node makes it fairly straightforward, I think. I think that's one of the beauties of Node is, again, we were talking a little bit about package managers and things like that, is that if you've never touched it before and you come to it, you start to realize, oh, there's all these things, there's all these Lego building blocks that I can start to use and just yeah. plug in and play. And, and so, like, for me, that's one of the great things coming to Node. Yeah, so um, Node, if you, if you haven't uh, ever seen it before, it's, um, it, it's a great uh, platform and it uses JavaScript and it's uh, most predominantly used on the server side. But now we're seeing it more in IoT devices, pretty much all over the place. Anytime that... Uh, um, you're seeing different platforms, even for mobile apps, you're, you're st starting to be able to use JavaScript there. Uh, now, what's really cool about uh, Node and JavaScript, if you're building for the web, is that you really have a unified development environment and the same language. Um, now, Node itself, all right, we, we've said that it's a, it's a uh, platform that uses JavaScript, and um, essentially it came about because uh, JavaScript, uh, which for a long time was fairly slow, has finally been becoming high performance. And in fact, lots of different browsers have very high performance uh, JavaScript engines, and that's what really allowed us to take uh, JavaScript from the browser front end side and actually put it on the back end where it's able to handle the load. Uh, and uh, in Node in particular, it actually uses the V8 uh, JavaScript engine. And uh, Node itself was created uh, in 2009 by Ryan Dahl, and it's an open source technology. So you can go uh, check out all the code that's behind Node. You can see its evolution over time. And uh, it runs on Windows, Linux, OS X. It pretty much runs everywhere, actually, uh, including little IoT devices like Raspberry uh, Pis and whatnot. Yeah. Now, you might think, like, hey, I, I went to the Node page, and, like, what is this zero point something, <laughs> like, virgin number? Like, what, what is this? Uh, well, yeah. I, I guess you could say that Node is in beta phase. You could like, say that for a lot of things. But you could say that though. for, yeah, like a lot yeah. of things you could say that for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but really, it's actually been used in production in so many different places now that uh, you cannot call it beta. But like, I guess it's not 1.0 yet because people still want to, the developers still want to change things, be flexible, and, and really uh, help the language and platform evolve quickly. Um, so if you're wondering, well, when do I actually use Node? Yeah, when do I use it? Tell yeah. me. Tell so me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> Node is great for streaming or event-based real-time applications. And we mentioned this earlier. But like, what does that actually mean? 
I don't know. Tell me. Okay. It means <laughs> things like chat applications, right? Right. Those are event-based. There's a chat that was sent, chat that was received. Right. Uh, they have to be real-time as well, in the sense that if you're chatting with someone, you can't wait like 10 minutes to get the next chat. Yeah. Or have wondering... to refresh the browser. You know, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. What are you doing there? Yeah. <laughs> Give me your message. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see are you, you typing. Are you still there? Are you I still see there? you typing. <laughs> um, it, you can also use it for real-time applications. So think like... Um, Anything that requires uh, some, some type of data flow constantly going back and forth. So if, let's say that you're building, I don't know, finance to websites or something. Right, uh, or like a... In, in stock tickers or something. Or even a shared conference environment yeah, even or something conference. where someone's you know, doing something at the same time as you and you have to make sure you're not overriding it or whatnot. But. Yeah, and, and there's lots of people that are building um, collaborative environments on the web with Node.js and That's JavaScript. That's a better way to put it, yeah. Yeah, collaborative <laughs> environments, things that people, where people work together. Yeah. Yeah, multiple browsers talking at the same time to the servers and all this information flowing around. <laughs> um, that also brings up the idea of game servers, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. so... Multi-user, yeah. Multi-user games. Yeah. Um, you can also, you'll you also see it perhaps in ad servers that, you know, have to ha do this um, high volume uh, amount of requests. Right. Uh, streaming servers as well. Um, so it's, it's really great when you need high levels of concurrency. So when you have lots and lots and lots of uh, small things happening at the same time. Gotcha. Um, but uh, you don't need as much hard CPU power. Right. Like no, no hard CPU power. You don't need like to do these complex math calculations that you know, take like 10 seconds even on our very advanced hardware. Um, yeah. You know, that, that's probably not where you want to use Node, right? Yeah. But for everything else that's related to the web where you've got high concurrency needs, where you've got lots and lots of users happening, lots of events happening at the same time, and you still want to be real time, Node, I think, is the best tools, one of the best tools that's out there right now. Uh, and of course, it's great for just writing JavaScript code everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just... I mean, why wouldn't you want to have it everywhere? Yeah, like it's. it's uh... Taken over. It is. It's, like, it's <laughs> everywhere. And uh, it, if you're wondering, like, where is it in the wild? Well, uh, we use it at Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, in fact, a lot of our uh, Azure cloud tools are, are built with Node. Yep. Um, there's other companies out there. Uh, what's interesting is that some of them are also contributing to the Node community. Lots of open source uh, uh, packages that are being produced by different companies around the around the world, and they are uh, all being open source, which is absolutely phenomenal for the Node community. Yeah, and you're starting to see even like SDKs are, you know. Um, maybe considering Node as one of the first things that they're creating an SDK for, or whatever it may be along those lines. So, you know, it's being embraced by everyone. Yeah, and speaking of that community, it's huge now. <laughs> it's huge. Oh, man. It, it's like, I, I mean, these stats are probably out of date now. They're totally out of date. <laughs> totally yeah. out of date. Uh, but like the, the last time that we had collected um, uh, stats for our, our, our slides, um, there was over 2 million downloads per month. It's probably a lot more than that now. Uh, Last a major version release, 0 0.10, there was 20 million downloads of that. Uh, over 81,000 modules on NPM. So uh, these are over, over um, like th that means that there's over 81,000 pieces of code that you can use in your application. It now, saves you time. It saves you time. Ideally. I, yeah, and but like, of course I haven't seen any um, Node application use all 81,000. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> I like how you just threw that down there. <laughs> I'm just like, if you can build an app that legitimately uses every single module that's out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I 50 will, more MVA points for 50 you. 50 more MVA points, <laughs> yes. Uh, and of course there's plenty of meetups around the world. Yeah. Um, Stacy, you're in New York and there's... Yeah. Probably several node meetups. Yeah, we have on. a bunch, uh, and and they are again quite regular, um, once a month, and we discuss like all sorts of things across from node. And we mentioned like different things that you might use it for, and, and some people might use it more as a utility to do you know things off the command line. Some people are building like a full and you know backend server websites, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of IoT stuff. So it's interesting because you're really seeing um, it kind of. Uh, you know, expand where people are using it. And so I think that's the most interesting thing for me, um, watching the community grow, in, at least in the past couple of years, for sure. Yeah, and it's the same story in Montreal. We've seen a, lot, uh, a huge community grow around Node. Lots of startups are using Node.js as their main stack. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's just phenomenal. Lots of contributions, lots of people, lots of players. Everyone's really happy when there's a big community, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it means you're going to get your answer. Yeah, yeah. basically. When, yeah. You got, when you got a question, yeah. you have lots of people locally who can guide you through that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm in Montreal, so if you're ever interested in, in talking about Node, just feel free to tweet at me. And uh, yeah, go. so let's, let's get started. Let's start with setting up your environment. environment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you're on Windows, 
Um, there's a couple ways that you could do it. You could go straight to nodejs.org and download these uh, installer files. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we'll install the Node.js binaries for you. That's how I do it. Um, if you want to build it yourself, you also can. Yeah. Uh, although it's a little bit more complicated. If you're a uh, purist. If you're a pu yeah, absolutely. Yep. If you if you uh, if you need to compile things. <laughs> the need. The need. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's needs to compile things. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you're looking at an excuse to do some sword fighting in the meantime while it's compiling. <laughs> uh, you can definitely do that as well. Uh, if you use uh, Chocolatey, just like a package manager for Windows. Uh, you can do uh, Chaco install Node.js dot install and, and it should uh, install Node.js for you. One thing to uh, keep in mind, and so something that I always recommend you double checking, uh, if you've got uh, Node installed and uh, ideally you want to have Node the executable file in your path, yeah. uh, so you got to make sure that it's actually in the system environment variable. And I, I left a little link there for a YouTube video that shows you how to get to your environment variables uh, in Windows 8 and 8.1. Uh, with 10 launching today. 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 Uh, you, you'll also want to do that as well. Uh, and just make sure that uh, this variable, this uh, path at the bottom right here of the slides, uh, program files, whatnot, is in your path variable. So yeah. that, that way, when you're in the command line trying to execute some node apps, uh, it'll actually find node. Uh, it, let's say that you're not running Windows. Uh, if you're on uh, uh, a Linux distribution, perhaps uh, Ubuntu, it's a very famous and popular yep. one. Uh, there, there's, it's also the, the same, similar to, uh, to Windows. The easiest way to install it is uh, with a package manager. Uh, and uh, we've got the command right up there. Uh, you probably also want to install some of the compilers and, and build essential tools, because uh, there's a couple of node modules that do use uh, some more native stuff. So. Yep. Uh, you'll want to run both of these commands, uh, app get uh, install build dash essential, and then again for Node.js and NPM. Yep. Uh, let's say you're on OS X. Um, again, the easiest way to do it is via the terminal using uh, the brew package manager. Uh, it's also how I do it as well. Uh, and uh, let's say that you don't want to, you can always compile it from source or use the installer on Node.js.org. So let's kind of get down to the very first initial Node application. Yay, moving on. Yeah. Hello, All Node. All right, so uh, basically, with every single language and every single platform, <laughs> the first thing that you want to do is just say, hello, world. Or hello, right? Node. Or hello, Node. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to our code editor, and we're using Visual Studio Code. And uh, this is a, 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 the uh, best uh, editor, in my opinion. And you can run it on. OS X, Linux, Windows. I'm running it on Windows here, but you can run it on your own platform as well. Uh, Node will work everywhere as well. So uh, let's get right down to it. So here I am. I already got my uh, folder open. This is the same Node NVA folder that uh, you will get when you go to GitHub. All right. So if you get this um, clone to your computer, you'll actually you're actually able to open up the whole folder straight into in Visual Studio Code. And the first thing that you want to go to is the app.js file in the 01 Hello World folder. Um, and this is pretty much how you do Hello World. It's quite simple. You just want to print it out. You can say console.log Hello World. Very similar to how you would do it in the browser. Sure. So instead of going into the inspector and right-clicking and seeing it, yeah. this is actually going to you know, pop up. This is going to pop it up. So when I run it, uh, so I'm going to open up my terminal here. And did I lose my keyboard? I hope not. No. OK, here it is. Uh, let's say that I wanted to uh, go into that folder first. Uh, to run it, uh, this very simple uh, app.js file, I just type in node app.js, execute, and there we go. Hello world. Yay! Success! <laughs> Success! This is awesome! Okay, we're done. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, now, let's, let's say that uh, you know, we wanted to actually do something uh, a little bit more relevant, right? I yeah. mean, node is a web platform technology, right? Let's yeah. say we wanted to do uh, a basic, make a basic HTTP server that will then do hello world and send that to our browser. Ooh! Leveling yeah. it up. Yeah, we're just plus gonna, one. Plus one, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go back to the code here, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a second folder, and I'm going to walk you through every single line here, uh, and it, with a couple of lines, uh, this is about six. You're actually able to respond to an HTTP request, uh, reply with a 200 OK that this is a a good request, uh, and uh, write hello world back in the response. So uh, the first thing that you'll notice is that in line one we've got this uh, require function. And if you're coming from the browser world, you probably have never seen this before. It's a little odd, right? What does it do? Um, well, basically, it actually gets a module for you. 
I just always want to ask you the question, what does it do? What does it do? Tell me, <laughs> tell me more. Um, so it actually will load up a module, and in this case, the module is HTTP. Right. right? And in this module, there is a um, um, bunch of different servers, clients for HTTP uh, protocols. Right. Uh, so the, the way that uh, packages work, and we'll cover this uh, a little bit later, is that uh, once you require something, it'll return everything that's exported uh, in uh, into a variable. And in this case, we're sending it to HTTP. Do you think we uh, could make the font just a little bit bigger? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, th I'm, I'm going to do that right now for you. I'm just going to try to remember how to actually do that. You can zoom in too. Okay, well, maybe we should run zoom it. We're just going to make that a little bit bigger so that, you, so that we can read it. Oh, okay. There, there we go. go. Is that better? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we got the thumbs up. That means it's better. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's take a look at this a little bit more. Um, we've got the require. It's put a bunch of modules and functions into HTTP, right? And uh, if we want to call some of these functions, um, we can just use the HTTP variable. And obviously, the first thing that we'll want to do is perhaps create a server for uh, responding to our HTTP requests. Ooh, let's right? do it. So in line three, if you uh, can see right there, we're going to say HTTP.createServer. And we're going to pass in a function. Now, this is a callback. Um, and we'll cover callbacks in, in a few seconds. But essentially, what this uh, will do is that for every single HTTP request our server gets, it's going to execute this function. And this function is going to be passed two parameters, uh, two arguments, uh, request and response. Right? So uh, once, uh, let's say that uh, we did get a request. Um, well, the thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to respond um, with a 200 OK. So we're going to say response.write the header of our HTTP response uh, with uh, the status 200. And uh, we're going to specify the content type text plane. Now, uh, if you've ever taken a look, a look at an HTTP header, uh, you'll, you would have seen um, uh, there's plenty of other headers that you can put. And with this object here, you can actually specify a lot of them. But for our case, we're just going to use text plane. Normally, you'll want to use HTML, of course, if you're sending HTML back. Uh, but in our case, we're going to keep it very, very simple and just use plain text. And uh, before we end the response, we're going to say, hey, response.end, hello world. Uh, once this is done, this is going to send a response back to our browser that's going to then uh, basically display hello world, ideally. And um, now the thing is, when we create this server, we actually don't tell it to start yet. We got to tell it to start um, by calling the listen function. So. Uh, HTTP.createServer is going to return an, an, uh, an object that we're going to put in the variable server. And then right here at line 8, we're going to go server.listen, pass in the port number that we want to listen to, uh, 7000. And then uh, if we get this started and we hit uh, our local host on port 7000, it should say hello world. Ooh, so, it's like the moment of truth. The moment of truth. Let us do it. So I'm back in my command prompt, and I'm going to go out and go into our second folder right here and do a node app.js again, and nothing has happened. And that is actually the correct behavior, because if we pay attention at the top, node.app.js is still running. Um, now, what we'll want to do is we'll want to open up our browser. All right. And we opened this page. Let's say that we're going to go to 7,000 right there. Boom! Hello world. Can you believe that? This is awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I'm going to open up this tool just to show you a, a little thing right here. Uh, if I go into my network tab and uh, I'm going to refresh this, there you go. It actually did send text plane. Nice. With the 200 status, which is exactly what we were doing. Perfect. Awesome. So all it did, all, we did all of that in six lines of code. Yeah. And, and, it's and that's... Uh, uh, that's one of the, part of the magic, I guess, of Node. Like you can do so much uh, web stuff in very few lines of code. Yeah, very I mean, good for programming productivity. Requiring that module, the module does all the work for you. You just have to understand how to yeah. like leverage it, and that's you'll that's going to be a theme throughout. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're going to show you how to use some of those popular modules as well. Um, so now let's. Uh, I guess we, we we touched on a couple of interesting things, like a callback. Yeah. Uh, there's some events and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, event-driven programming. Event-driven programming. I love that. So event-driven programming, you know, and just on the screen you'll see programming paradigm in which the flow of the program is determined by events. 
you know, such as user uh, actions, we're kind of used to this. I mean, especially if you're dealing with JavaScript, you're very used to capturing a click or understanding when there's a mouse enter or any of those kind of things. And so that's very much, you know, along the lines of, of what we're doing here in terms of events that we can listen to, a stream starts, it closes, that kind of thing. Yeah, an HTTP request got sent. Uh, that's an event as well. Um, and now you'll, you'll You'll notice that uh, we never actually started an event loop, perhaps. Like, there, how, did, how does this event system get started, right? Um, well, it turns out that Node provides uh, the event loop as part of the language. So uh, with Node, you never need to call start to the loop at all. And uh, the way that it works is that the loop uh, starts, and then it doesn't end until the last callback is complete. So if you have a callback, uh, like we did when we created our server for HTTP, uh, and as long as there is at least one callback, the event loop will continue uh, executing, and uh, the the program the node won't won't stop. Right. Right. So um, the other thing that you need to know as well about this event loop is it's all run under a single thread. So if you do some very long operations, like let's say a, a very complex math calculation or something as simple as just saying sleep yeah. for ten seconds, yeah. you're actually going to halt uh, the event loop and prevent all the other callbacks from being executed. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to bring some other interesting topics out as well. Like, how, how do we write code that doesn't block the event loop? Because um, ideally, you want uh, the event loop to be fairly clear uh, so that you can handle thousands of different events at the same time. Right. Uh, and uh, anything that's blocking that takes too long, we want to put that off to the side. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what blocking I.O. is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, here I have a, a very simple example, and uh, the way that I'm explaining it is by using some actual code, so you can see what it looks like. You can try it out yourself. Um, what we're doing here is we just want to read this file called package.json, which mm -hmm. we'll also talk about a little bit more in detail uh, further on. Yep. Uh, but it's uh, for now, just assume it's a regular text file. Um, now, if we wanted to read something in uh, Node, uh, we're going to have to require a module, and in this right. case, fs, which is file system. Um, we're going to say, hey, require file system. Uh, put it in this variable var fs, uh, fs, we're going to say read the file. Right. All right we're going to call it a read file function. Standard I.O., like standard st file I.O. Standard I.O., IO yep. uh, it's going to read the whole file before it does anything. Right. Uh, and this is going to be, uh, the way that we specify if it's a blocking I.O. is by having the sync at the end. So synchronous. Right. And this is going to come in a little later, asynchronous versus synchronous. Right. Uh, and um, now, if you look at this line of code, what it'll do is it'll actually read um, the file synchronously, and then convert it to a string that's going to put into the variable contents, and then we're going to print out that content. So the, the code is actually in the repo if you want to try it out. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit instead about how we do that same type of operation in a way that doesn't block. Right. Because, I mean, if, if it's you're doing it the previous way, you're waiting. You've yeah. got nothing. There's no input. It's, yeah. it, you're blocked out completely. Let, let's say that file was a gigabyte long. Yeah. That's going to take a while. Even, uh, <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, a lot of <laughs> twiddling of thumbs there. Um, so here's the thing. Um, I.O. is very slow, right? It's much slower than CPU. It's much slower than, um, it's typically much slower. And then f specifically, disk I.O. is very, very slow. Yeah. Even with SSDs, it's still slower than running uh, and writing to memory, reading from memory, doing CPU work. CPU work. Uh, so ideally, what you want to do is you want to have uh, things like file reads or even uh, network uh, uh, network I/O. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you want to make it in a non-blocking way so that you can still do some other work. You can process other events. You can do other things, yeah. uh, and that's really where the power of Node.js comes in because it makes that so easy. Um, and the way it does that is by having asynchronous functions that take a callback. Right. Uh, so let's say we wanted to read that same file again. If we take a look at the screen, um, we're going to call read file instead, and we're going to pass in the name of the file. But here we're also going to pass in a callback that returns a buffer. So what Node is going to do is Node is going to execute this file, uh, execute this line of code. It's going to continue executing other code until there is enough things in the buffer for it to call the callback. Right. Right, so what it's going to do here is once it gets enough things in, in the buffer, it will call the callback and will print it out to the screen. And then that way, doing it this way, you can be doing anything else at the same time, capturing anything else or another operation or yep. any, that kind of stuff. And all you care about is when is this? When am I getting this event? When is this callback being called? Yep. When can I handle it? So that brings up the topic of callback style <laughs> programming, right? Oh yeah. Uh, so if you're coming from another type of uh, programming. Uh, style, let's say, imperative or, or declarative in, in other languages, uh, you may not be particularly used to callbacks. Um, essentially, 
when you have an event loop uh, that's so crucial, uh, especially like in Node, where uh, the event loop is the main reason why you want to run Node, right? Uh, you want to be able to handle all of this uh, concurrency. Um, event loops typically result in callback style programming. And uh, your end objective really is to break apart the program to its underlying data flow to the underlying I.O. that you're doing. So if you're building a networked application, you want to make every single uh, callback almost the same uh, length as the actual I.O. that you want to do. So that, you can, that way you can do uh, uh, other things and other callbacks that, are, uh, that don't take up as much time. Um, so you want to split up your program into smaller and smaller chunks until each chunk is mapped uh, to an operation with data. So you don't freeze the event loop on long running operations like disk and network I.O. Right. Uh, now, of course, Callback. callbacks within callbacks within callbacks might lead to something that... <laughs> hey, I heard you uh, like callbacks. Like uh, yeah. callback in your callback? <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, you know, quite quickly, you'll often find yourself um, writing code that starts to look like this. It's like the pyramid, yeah. uh, like a pyramid sh structure. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, fantastic, but uh, there are ways to counter it, and we'll let you uh, explore those ways. Uh, as you dive deeper and deeper and deeper into Node. Yeah, just, you know, it's more, just be aware that this might happen to you and it's very natural um, because you're, you know, just trying to stub out what you're writing and, and everything just kind of falls in. Oh, when this gets called back, I need to do this and this. Um, and then and before long, you're gonna be like, okay, I can't handle this. I can't read it. It's not manageable. I, I can't follow what's going on anymore. Um, and so there's a bunch of demos that you can, or sorry, libraries that you can use along those lines to kind of help you with that a little bit. So, you know, don't, don't, don't be too worried that happens. Yeah. Now, I want to do some, some more coding, right? And uh, I've got another sample for you. Uh, and it's going to introduce some other interesting topics in uh, Node. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our folder 5 and then check out uh, our Hello World TCP uh, project. And here what we're going to try to do is we're going to do Hello World again, but this time using the TCP protocol. So uh, not HTTP. Now, the first thing I'm going to want to do is I maybe perhaps create a TCP server. Now, this will look familiar. Uh, it's almost exactly the same as the HTTP one. But in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to require net, which is uh, where all the TCP handling um, modules is. That's the module that you want to use. And we're going to call net.createServer. But in this case, our callback is going to take a socket. And what this socket uh, is going to do is it's going to give us an address, and it's going to be able to uh, receive and, and send data. Right. Right. So what we want to do, though, is we just want to send Hello World to anyone who connects. Uh, so our socket is only going to print out the, the remote address from where we got our connection from, and it's going to write Hello World to that socket. Uh, again, we'll assign this server to a variable and then call listen and give it a, uh, a, um, a host uh, where it's going gonna, it's gonna to run from. And in this case, it's just localhost, it's just home, uh, and then we're going to get it started. So if I open up a command prompt, Right here, I'm going to close this server. We're going to go out, go into 05. All right, I'm going to call node server.js. All right, there it is. It's running at the top. In the meantime, I'm going to actually open up another command prompt. And I'm going to do that by right clicking, putting it here. I'll put it side by side so you can see what's going on. Uh, let's go back into our dev folder go into our TCP, and I actually want to create the client now. So before I actually run the, the, the code that we have, I'm going to walk you through it a bit so you can see, hey, this is actually a little bit different from how we did our, our server. Um, now at the top, you'll notice the same idea uh, required a module. Uh, what we're going to do here instead is we're going to clear a socket. And then we're going to assign this new socket uh, to the client variable. And then we're going to tell that client to connect to 7000 localhost. That's it. There was no callback that we did here. Uh, instead, what we were going to do is we're going to say, hey, anytime the client gets data, then do something. Right. Right? Or anytime that the client gets a close, yeah. like someone closed the socket, do something. So basically, right? you're just listening to certain events there yeah, that so it's going to emit. So we've talked that, uh, about event-driven uh, programming already. Yeah. And in this case, this is a, a, a very simple example of literally <laughs> events, data and close, right? It's, it, that's, that's, it's right there. Cool. Uh, and this is going to bring up this topic of event emitters. Right. So these are uh, node concept, it's a node concept where we have uh, these objects that are emitting events. All right? Right. And in this case, the socket object is one of them. Uh, so now if I actually run this code, I open up my uh, two uh, um, uh, command prompts. Yeah. I run client.js. What? 
we got a connection on our server from our own home. <laughs> and yep. uh, we, in our server, we sent back immediately uh, this data. Yep. Uh, on data, in our yep. client.js, we printed it out that said data hello world. Now, if you remember, if we look at our code again, the server.js file does close the connection right at the end. It calls socket.end, yeah. and that's going to call um, it's it, that's going to call the close event in our client, and then it's going to print out connection close, which you can see right here. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So event emitters. Let's talk about what actually happened here. Event yeah. emitters. Um, basically, event emitters allow you to listen uh, for events and assign functions or callbacks uh, to run when events occur. And uh, of course, each emitter can emit different types of events. So in our case, we saw data, we saw close, but there's a special um, uh, event that typically is available, and that's the error event. And all yep. it does is it, it lets you know when there's an error in your event emitter. Uh, if you want to read more, there's a couple of tutorials uh, on, the, on the screen right there or in the slides so you can check out and let's, uh, take a look at them. Now, of course, if we've got all these events and we, it seems like we've got this stream of stuff going on, uh, what is a stream? Can we actually use it to do something cool? Yeah, and you know what? What do you use them for, and and, and what context? And I think most often for me, reading or using streams is usually I'm going to be. Uh, maybe I'm like downloading something or creating a stream where I'm like just filtering that information in and like, you know, uh, a good example is downloading an image and, and piping it into, you yeah. know, a, a temporary kind of placeholder or that yeah. kind of thing. So there's a, a new concept called streams and it represents data streams, like yep. you said. So some IO stuff, right? Yep. Uh, perhaps network or disk IO, maybe even uh, streams of, uh, of data from a, from a message queue or something. Now, these streams can be piped together, which is pretty neat, uh, just like in Unix. So if you've ever used uh, uh, a, a Unix-based, um, I don't know how to say this, uh, I don't anything know, you, that has some You were miming Unix it pretty concepts. good. Yeah. You're like, you know, when you do this when to this. this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It goes from one to the other. <laughs> so if you've ever used a, a Unix uh, type system, uh, perhaps OS X or Linux, uh, you've seen the pipe operator, this yeah. straight line that you can put in your in your code and just move uh, output from one and sure. put it to input for another one. You can actually do the same thing with Node. So let's say that we wanted to read a file, package.json. Um, we can actually pipe it straight to a write stream that's going to rewrite the entire stream that is in package.json to out.json. Right, so it's just bringing it in and writing it out. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, now, we keep talking about all these modules and, and stuff like that, so how does it actually work? Yeah, well, I mean, Node.js has a simple module and dependency loading system. And so in that sense, it means that you can you can create your own modules, you can use other people's modules, and just being able to easily install them, whether it be locally or globally, um, you know, you can start to use them. Yeah, and it's uh, very similar to the, I guess, Unix philosophy. Uh, we have the same type of philosophy in the sense that um, modules are typically small, and you, you want to write programs that do one thing and do it well. Yeah. Uh, in Node, you want to write modules that do one thing and do it well. Yeah, you see a lot of it for like um, working with APIs, right? Like uh, you're going to work with a Twitter API. There will be like a bunch of modules for that. You want to do something that's a, uh, you know, something working with date or time. You're going to have a module for that. So it is very much that concept of like doesn't do everything. It's it's, yeah. it's utility based and in your toolbox. Thousands and thousands of modules that you could use. Now, as we uh, mentioned a couple of times already, how do you actually load a module? Yeah. Well, you use the require function. Uh, you can actually give it the path of a file, so you can uh, require another Node.js file or even a directory that right. contains the module that you would like to load. And everything that is exported from that module is then put into a variable. So now let's talk about the Node package manager. Yeah. We, we, we like these uh, modules, and we know that there's a package manager that has all of this. Well, what is the NPM? Yeah, what is a NPM? <laughs> it's like every time you know you start working with Node, you're like NPM. What is it? Well, official package manager for Node, right? And so it's the idea that you know everything is listed there. There's a registry. You can find out. Uh, you know, you can go to the NPM site, figure out what modules you can get, um, and it's you know it does all the hard work for you. It bundles and installs automatically within your environment, and it takes care of all the dependencies. So if you are using a module that requires a couple other modules for whatever reason, you don't have to worry about all that dependency stuff and managing that, which we all know as things uh, change and move and get upgraded can kind of you know, be a little bit of, I don't know, hairy experience, right? But it handles all that for you. And so if you're looking at 
you know, working with NPM, which you will undoubtedly, you'll be using something along the lines in terms of usage. You'll go like NPM install, for example, and that allows you to install the module uh, name. You'll just need to know the name. Um, and then you can do the dash dash save, and that will actually list it, uh, you know, alongside your project um, in a listing that we'll get into called package.json. And we'll kind of keep all that sense of what you are using and when. Um, but again, you can, you can install these modules kind of locally, and you can also install them globally. So there might be something you want to use all the time, for example. Um, you know, so you'll use things like that or NPM update to update, you know, its registry listing. So you have the most current, for example. Yeah, so how does it actually work? Well, uh, whenever you do an NPM install, it'll actually install that package, uh, which you can call a dependency if it's a dependency for your project, into a node modules folder that sits locally right next to your package.json in the current folder that you're working with. Yeah. Now, if... Um, creates a little folder. Creates a little folder right yeah. there. Yeah, node modules. It, it, it actually does some, something interesting. It actually yeah. checks to see if there's a node modules uh, in the folder above all the way up to the root. And the reason why it does that, let's say that you're three folders deep into your project mm. and you do an NPM install there, it actually doesn't want to put it uh, another node modules in that folder. It'll right. actually put it in the, in the top one. Um, which uh, brings this interesting question. What about modules that we want to use all the time? Yeah. Well, in that case, you can actually install uh, with the global mode set, and that will ins make that node uh, module accessible to all the products that you have. Uh, and um, how can I install and from where? There's a couple of ways. You can get it from a folder, from the tarball, from NPM itself, like mm -hmm. using the web. Um, whenever you do NPM install the package name, it's actually going to the web. If you give it a, a folder or a tarball, it will go there. Uh, and, of course, you can specify uh, things like dev and optional packages that you right. might want, and that will all go into the package.json. So whenever you uh, download a node project, the first thing you typically want to do is npm install in that, in that folder. What that's going to do is going to read the package.json files for any of the dependency that project needs. Yeah. It's going to go fetch them, yeah. put them in the local node uh, underscore modules folder, and... Uh, uh, it's going to go fetch them, yeah, go off, gonna... put them in a the cart, bring them back. <laughs> dump it for you. Yeah, and then yeah. Uh, uh, it'll make the, the project ready for you. Yeah. And um, now let's actually take a look at what's in that project.json. It sounds very important, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's a listing of all of uh, the modules that you're going to be, or dependencies. I mean, we can just say dependencies at, at this point that you are using in your project, and it'll list everything from the name of it to the version description. So you can just look at this, open it up, and be like, oh, I'm using 1.0165, I don't know, of this module. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got to be very careful if I'm going to update it or any of that kind of thing. And when you create a module, as well, you start to list those things along those lines, whether you know there's a, a GitHub repo, an author, and the name, the description, all that kind of stuff. And again, it's just a, a simple JSON format that just fills out all of those dependencies within your project. Yeah, and um, um, what are some of the popular node modules? Uh, I mean, there's, well, for me, it's a, I mean, I think there's like request, we've got underscore, we've got async, um, we've got uh, low dash commander, right, express. Mm -hmm. Um, I like how you just queued up that slide. That was beautiful, my friend. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, Optimus, CoffeeScript. I mean, there's a bunch of really popular ones, and you'll see when you go to use one. You know, just check out, like how active it is and how many people are using it or downloads, and, and that'll give you a good indication of, uh, you know, if you want to pursue something because obviously it's you know, snippets of code people put up, and if they're not maintained, you you know, at your own risk, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, typically, most of these uh, modules are on GitHub, so you can actually go check out the code. And, yeah. Um, and uh, good way to learn. We want to highlight two modules that are very, very useful, and they're extremely popular as well. Yeah. Uh, the first one is async. Yeah. And uh, essentially, what async does, it's uh, it's a utility module that right. gives you very easy, simple ways to make functions work um, in different ways when it's when they're asynchronous. Right. Right. Because when you have asynchronous uh, JavaScript, you've got lots of callbacks. Uh, perhaps you've got multiple functions that you want to run in, in a series. Well, it's a little bit annoying to have all of that uh, um, uh, pyramid of, of callbacks. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you want to run them in series. Well, async provides a bunch of functions that let you do that. Uh, and uh, I'm going to basically show some, some of the code real quick right here. Uh, that first one at, at the bottom is async.series, so that lets you run an array of functions. Um, parallel lets you run all of these functions at the same time, and then when the results are out, it'll, or when the first one's done, It'll execute that callback that you specify. But there's two other powerful ones that uh, we use a lot, like map and filter. And basically what map will do is it will run uh, this, um, this um, function, fsstat, on 
every single uh, argument that's in this array, and it will return all of the results uh, in an array for each file. And let's say that you wanted to filter. Uh, well, filtering, it's, it's very similar in, 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 uh, in how it executes. It will run uh, all of this stuff, and it will uh, like this fs exist function on all of these uh, files, and it will return it all in the results. And there's lots of other functions that async pro uh, offers. Um, another very popular module that uh, Stacy will walk us through uh, is the request module. Yeah, request is um, it kind of simplifies the whole way of doing any kind of HTTP calls. And you have to do this all the time. Maybe you're, you're getting a page, maybe you're getting a, uh, an image, that kind of thing. So you can see the structure um, listed here uh, on the screen. And um, I have a couple of examples that I can uh, very quickly walk through. And so I'm just going to open up uh, code on my desktop. And again, um, if we're looking at this, I have a bunch of examples in here, and you'll see that uh, at the very top, I'm just you know including that request module. Again, I had um, installed it at some point, whether I've done it locally or globally. And I also am including FS, which kind of does all that file I.O. stuff. And at the very top right up here, all I'm doing is a simple request, and you just pass it the URL, and then you've got a callback. And it tells you, OK, I'm going to that URL. I'm going to get the response in the body from this page. And I can see, you know, was there a response uh, status code? You know. If there is, just log the whole body. If everything's good, and you know it's a 200, um, and it's just going to write back that HTML. So that's the idea of like just you know grabbing the content off a web page very simply. Um, but I have a couple other examples here, and I'm just going to uncomment this out, and I'll run this one maybe in a second. Wait a minute. Yes, this, this was a good one. This has something to do with me. Oh no. This one is one for you, my friend. <laughs> um, so you know, if we're looking at the bottom here. You'll see that what I'm doing is uh, I'm basically saying, OK, um, I want to create a, a write stream. I'm going to write an image, and then I'm going to go get that image. And I request this image, and I'm going to pipe it into this, uh, basically, this file that I've kind of this placeholder, this stream I want to pipe it into. And I can also capture when it's done. So I know that when this operation actually is finished piping it in, I have a sense of when that is going to complete. And so what I can do here is I'm going to bring up my command prompt. And I'm going to go into uh, GitHub. And I'm going to go into oops, uh, CD. This is where you get to watch me type, and it's really exciting. Sorry. Not prepared. CD node. And there we go. And now I'm going to do this. OK. So node. And then it should be app.js. OK, so it gives me, uh, writes back to the thing, OK, we've got the stellar pic of Rami. I've basically gone to the web. I've went and I've downloaded this pic of Rami that you see right here. I feel like maybe we should take a look at it. I feel oh, no. like it would be excellent to go and do I this. I actually don't know what this picture is. So it's all good. What? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, again, if you wanted to go, for example, and grab a couple pictures and download them locally, and you know whatever you might be doing, that's an easy way, and you can use uh, requests to do that. Yeah, and I see that you piped it into the the file stream, right? There. Yeah, I totally did the whole pipe right into it. Awesome. And uh, there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> so there's our, our request module demo. We have a couple of resources for you. Um, to kind of move you uh, along in terms of, of learning and other things that you can take a look at. We've talked about a lot of concepts in this first, uh, you know, hour here. And some of them, you know, you need to get a little bit maybe working with Node and building your stuff, and you'll understand how they come and plug and play and what you need to look at. But again, we've listed some resources. We've got the GitHub repo there. Um, really, if I think after this one hour, things that people should probably kind of look at, I would say, Understand asynchronous versus synchronous. Get a really good handle on that because, man, when you don't, it's just like it comes up at you and you're like, where did this come from? And all of a sudden, it's, it's a day of learning libraries like Q or async. Um, you know, get, get very used to uh, event emitters and, and how they work and, and NPM. Learn all the ins and outs of NPM. NPM is awesome. And then, and then come tell me, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, you know, that's, um, that's all we have for uh, this first uh, module, and we're going to take a short break, 
and we yeah. will see you shortly. Yeah, and if you've got yeah. any questions, please put them in the chat, and we will cover uh, some of these questions when we come back at yeah. the next module. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Awesome. All right, welcome back to Visual Studio Code with Node.js. I'm Rami, and with me is Stacy, and this is our second module, and we'll be talking about Express. Yay! <laughs> I'm super excited. It means yeah. we're going to be building stuff. Yeah, yeah. so uh, for those of you who didn't catch it at the last module, Express is a web framework. Yep. That we could use uh, to build web applications. Yep. And uh, in this module, we're going to cover what is Express. What like, is Express? Why would you use Express? Yeah. Yeah. How do you actually install it? How do you get started? Uh, we're going to have a couple of demos. Yeah. Uh, one of them is uh, how to build a simple REST API. Sure. Then we're going to show you how to build uh, an Express app that has multiple pages. Yep. Then we're going to show you how to build an even more RESTful API right. uh, as well. And yeah. we're going to cover, in the meantime, templating and a bunch of other concepts that are very important to Express. Right. Uh, so let's get started. What is Express? What is Express? Well, Express is a very uh, minimal open source and very flexible Node.js web app framework. And it's really designed to make developing websites, web apps, um, specifically single page applications yeah. uh, and APIs very easy. Right. So quick, 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 quick. Right? Quick. Just up and running. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's very simple. It's If you've ever used uh, Sinatra in the Ruby world or perhaps Flask uh, in the Python world, yeah. you might feel that Express is very, very similar. And in fact, it was inspired by those frameworks. Yeah. So it is uh, a very straightforward, simple ex uh, framework, and it is the most popular one by far yeah. in the Node community. So and, and you'll see why. You'll see yeah. why, yeah. Um, so if you're wondering, well, why should I use Express? Why can't I just make a simple uh, HTTP server that does everything? Uh, well, quite simply, Express um, makes a lot of different things easier. And one of those things is responding to different uh, URLs, so different routes. Uh, so with Express, uh, you can respond to requests uh, and uh, write specific responses to specific URLs. So let's say you're building a blog, or maybe you're building a uh, web application. Every time that you hit a specific uh, URL, you want to write a specific response. Express makes that very easy to do. Right. Uh, and of course, the other thing that it does is templating. Templating, you know, and, and once you, <laughs> I'm going to sing everything from now on. Templating, <laughs> once you, uh, I enjoy it. Sorry. But <laughs> templating is one of those things that once you get into a little bit, especially uh, building web apps, uh, you start to realize, okay, I can, you know, if I'm going to reuse this little bit of uh, HTML or, or whatnot, I can uh, create a template and reuse it again and again. So think of a product page where maybe the product has a picture and a title and a link and, and you know, a call to action or whatever, all that stuff, and it just repeats itself down the page. Why would you write out all that HTML? You can just use a snippet or a template, for example, uh, along those lines. And you'll see that working with Express, um, there are a lot of different templating engines, and they all kind of work in their own little way. They're similar uh, in a lot of regards in terms of what you can do and how they work. But, you know, everyone has their own thing that they like. Some people, you know, we're going to be showing you Jade, for example, which is pretty standard out of the box with Express. But, you know, some people like handlebars or, you know. Mustache. Or, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, all the beard-oriented facial hair I'm waiting. Ones. I'm waiting for the beard templating language. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yes. You know, but I don't know where they name these things sometimes. But, you know, you'll, you'll start to see that, it, you know, that's another reason why you're going to start to work with something like Express because it starts to simplify these things and make it much easier for you to get up and running and you just become more efficient. And who doesn't love efficiency? I yeah. mean and if you're a web designer that perhaps you've used already mustache and handlebars, yeah. you can actually um, replace Jade with those templating languages as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so if it's you're comfortable with other all those other ones you might plug and play. Plug, plug and, and play. play. Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna talk a little bit about installing and using Express. Very simple. Very You've seen NPM. Yeah, I'm You've seen like NPM in the last module. Yep. Well, here it is. It's back. <laughs> it's back. Uh, very easy to install Express. All you gotta do is npm install Express. Yep. That is it. Yeah, and if you want to install Jade alongside of that, it's just npm install Jade. And again, very simple. Just installs it for you, and you're good to go. Yeah. So why don't we start with a simple uh, demo? Um, we're going to create a REST API. So if you've ever built a complex web app or a single page application, you typically want to have some way to interact with the database that's sitting on the server. And uh, the most standard way to do that, I guess, is using an API. Yeah. Right? So you can do uh, HTML requests, uh, AJAX requests to that API, get some data back in JSON format, do something with it, put it on the screen, uh, and whatnot. So uh, why don't we show you how to create a simple REST API with Node.js? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to my code editor. 
and we're going to go to uh, the folder 08 uh, express rest. That's, what's, uh, that's where it's going to contain all the code that I'm going to show you right now. But I just wanted to show you again how to actually install um, Express. So why don't I go in to my 08 folder, and of course, I didn't do that. Now I did. <laughs> Take a look inside it. I'm going to make this a little bigger so that you can see it. Uh, we've got our app.js file, but here is the package.json. So if you remember, we said that anytime a package requires or depends on a module, yeah. uh, you want to put it in package.json. There's a quite simple way to do that. Um, you can go into your package.json and type it in right there, express3. For this sample, we're using express3, but in the other samples, we're going to be using express4. Uh, you can see that, hey, I've got this uh, basic part at the top that explains what this module does and, and whatnot, and then the dependencies right there. Um, if you put a star, it's going to install the latest version. If you specify the version, it's going to install that one. Uh, so now if I go back and I just go into my folder, I can actually just type in npm install, and it will read the package.json and install everything that's there. So if I do that, it'll do some magic. <laughs> Boom, everything's already installed, so it didn't do much. Is that your sign for magic, by the way? It is. I just like that. Just like text on screen, <laughs> magic. <laughs> for, so if you can't if you can't see me while I actually do that because we're focused on the same, this is what I actually did. This is what Stacy is referring to. I said magic, <laughs> uh, and I bet that's going to be a gif at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Please make it. Please make it happen. Please. So uh, yeah. So I, I keep switching my 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 screens around. Um, so once we've got the npm install. Uh, you can do that on your on your own machine as well to be able to actually execute this uh, this file app.js. Uh, if I go into it, you'll notice it's got the very similar uh, require at the top, and in this case, we're requiring the express module. Uh, what that's going to do is it's actually going to go into the node modules folder right here and find it uh, in your local node underscore modules. And uh, the first thing that I'm going to want to do is I want to actually call um, the express function. Now, you'll notice this is a little funky because previously, whenever we had to do something uh, from a module, we used to do express dot uh, something. Well, you can actually not just export a bunch of functions, you can export just one if you wanted to uh, and set the exports uh, for that module as that function. And in this case, that's what we did. So we can actually call express right here. And what that's going to do is going to return an app. Okay? And this app is going to contain a bunch of functions. Uh, one of them is get. Okay, and uh, what get does is it basically says, hey, whenever there's a get request, a get HTTP request, so if you know your HTTP methods, there's get, there's put, there's patch, there's delete, there's post, uh, get is one of them. <laughs> and uh, it's, we're going to pass in a URL for when it should execute this function, right. and a callback that gets a request and a response. Right. So here we are. Uh, we're going to say, hey, this app has one URL, just the home URL, and uh, execute this function when it's a get on that URL. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do with that response is we're going to write uh, to, the, uh, to the response in the JSON format this object that says message, hooray, welcome to our API. Now, once we've got all of these URLs set, uh, all of these routes, uh, we're going to actually start the app by saying app.listen, and we're going to take the environment, uh, the port variable that was passed in the environment, or 8080, and seeing as I will not be passing a port, when I go ahead and execute that file, it will be available on the port 8080. So now if I go to a browser, which I have right here, <laughs> and then I write in localhost 8080. Yay. There it is, application.json. Now, uh, Internet Explorer also Yay. tried to get the favicon icon. That's what you see right there. Um, exactly. Yes, yes, yeah, 200. OK, awesome. <laughs> um, so here we are. It yes. actually returned uh, application.json because that is the type that we wanted to send. And if you take a look at the result, hooray, welcome to our API. Everything works. Everything is glorious. Everything is awesome. And I am very happy. <laughs> Great. So, I mean, in that example, we talked a little bit about routes, right? And you're going like an app, get, and if someone basically is getting this route, which, you know, the slash just means the index page, right? Your kind of yep. home page. Um, and then you're, you know, doing all, all these kind of things. Um, you know, routes in that way, you know, uh, Express kind of helps you do the, the get and they do the put and all that kind of stuff. And you can start to see that um, whether we just use get, we'll use post or something maybe in the future. Um, 
But you can start to see that that get request was kind of like, you know, halfway down the screen, you'll see the local host, it's 8888, well, you did 8080, and it's like the index page. And so that's what that initial kind of slash, um, we have the index listed here, and you'd have the index at the top. But that's one of the beauties of routes is that you can easily in Express, uh, we just went to the home page, the traditional kind of index, uh, you know, root of the application. But, you know, Express allows you to easily add these routes. So if you need to have a route um, for your API that is going to be, you know, slash schools, uh, slash students, slash, you know, schools, slash students, for example, like, you know, the way that you kind of construct an API in that way, um, Express is very easy to do that. And again, it's exactly kind of how you saw. You just need to figure out what the route is, how you're going to handle it, and what you're going to do there. And so we saw the very basics of that yeah. there. And let's say that we were trying to build a blog, right? We want to have different URLs for different pages, different yeah. blog articles, right? Yeah. So we can actually also do that. And uh, I guess uh, let's say that we have all these different pages, but they're all roughly the same, right? Like, the, how do we actually write the same function callback? for uh, all the different pages that we have in our blog. Right. And I think that's what you're going to show us next. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to go through um, showing you the idea of like adding those multiple routes and just uh, very simply express for multiple pages. And um, this is very quickly, you know, can get you up and running. And so I'm going to open up code. And I'm going to show you uh, one little thing I kind of like about code in here. So I'm going to. Uh, make sure that I'm in the right one. So I'm going to open up that 11 express multiple. And one thing that you can do is you can go code, for, or I can go CD um, express, as, tab that out. Okay, I'm in that directory. I can go code dot. And once you install code, it's on the command line. So what it's going to do is it should, you'll see it's flashing at me, giving me a little heads up that it's ready and that it's open. And you'll see that it's opened up just that folder. So, you know, again, you can use it off the command line. You can go into any directory and just open it. One of the nice uh, things about code. One of the things that we showed earlier, we had to fix earlier actually, was our font sizes. And I just wanted to show this very quickly, was that, you know, all of your preferences are in here. So, for example, preferences, I'm going to have to do, uh, you know, user settings here. I'm going to have to uh, change my font size. Um, and I can do that right here. And I don't know, what should I make it, 18? Right, and it automatically just updates it and you can start to set all your preferences there in code. Um, so, you know, if you're kind of uh, used to doing that, you'll see that that's pretty basic. Now, what I've done in this Express Multiple is I actually use something that uh, we're gonna show um, called the Express Generator. And the Express Generator really just goes through and it like lays out a complete template. If you're like me, you know, a little lazy, maybe, I don't know, lazy, smart, fine line there. <laughs> but if you wanna just, you know, get everything set up, you can use this uh, Express Generator and what it will do is it'll just lay out all these basic things for you, a templated application, right? And so in doing that, uh, what I've done is I've gone through and we've seen some routes in an Express app. And so, you know, as we just saw before, it was very simple. We kind of didn't use any of this infrastructure here, but now I'm kind of showing you the whole entire infrastructure behind it you'll see that there's all these things being included across the board. And we have, you know, all these includes at the top from um, loggers, cookie parsers, body parsers, these things that you might want to use in your application. And by default, it gives you these routes. And so to explain kind of how a route or a structure goes in Express is that if we look on the left, when you create an Express uh, generated project here, you have uh, your app.js, that's your starting point, right? That's your main point. App.js is your, you know, your go-to. And you have views and routes and in public. Now to explain this to you just a little bit, public is always going to be things that are going to be, you know, um, JavaScript, style sheets, that kind of thing. Um, anything that's, uh, you know, more on the uh, client side, really. Images also? Uh, that's where I would put them. Yeah, in public, right? Because it's going to map everything to that kind of public folder. And I feel like you're going to be like testing me on this and I'm going to be <laughs> failing miserably. I'm be like, yes, no, maybe so. Um, and then you're going to have views. And views are basically, as we mentioned, we're using a templated engine. It's Jade. 
And so views are held in views, and these are the items or the snippets of HTML or the HTML pages um, that you want to use. And anything that you want to pull out of there will be contained in views. Now, the next one I want to show you is routes. And routes is going to be all of these uh, individual JavaScript files that handle the routes. And so what you do is you basically say to Express, Express, I want you to include this file that I want to use, for example, right? And what I want you to do is I want you to, when someone calls this route, so app use, for example, an app is going to be that variable that Rami did before he created it you know, a variable called app and had it equivalent to express. And again, we're using all the functions available in express. Um, and you start to see, you know, set the views. Here's where I'm going to get the views from. So that's a folder right there. This right here, express. Uh, the, the views, uh, line 15. Where are we looking at? Views. That Yes, this is going to give you the path. It's basically creating that directory name to that views right there so that you okay. know exactly where to get it from. And so you got the next one, the view engine, and you go down and you have, you know, some what we would typically have called maybe middleware, things that are going to do things for you, uh, body parser for JSON, things like that. Not going to get too much into that. But you'll see the app use. So I'm going to use when someone hits this route. So just straight up right at the, the root of it, it's going to use this variable that we created up before, which is pointing to this JavaScript. Right, and or this JavaScript function rather. And so again, we have users. So by default, when you do this, you'll get this. I added in this places one. And so what that means is someone goes and hits the slash places, they're going to get this route or this variable right here, slash routes, slash places, and that's going to handle that. That's the item that's looking forward to that. So let's look at this places. If we look at this places, you'll see that, again, very, very simple. Um, we've got, uh, we're using the express router here. We're including express. And the router is basically saying, OK, this is when I get that, um, that basic slash, which is just on places. So this is where you might say, if you want to go places slash um, schools, you might do that, for example. Right? Didn't even spell that right. but. And here's a callback, or here's what you should do here. So at this point, this callback is, am I going to render some HTML? Am I going to go out to an API and, and get some data back and, and write some JSON back like you did, right? Maybe let's get some data from a database. Or go, go get data from a database. Or write back a basic text string. Or do some on. JSON work. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Where you get busy and you just send it back, right? And so what we're doing here is we're saying, before you saw that uh, we had said, you know, basically to the response dot JSON. So we were telling it, okay, we want you to throw JSON back to the page. But what we're doing here is we're saying render. And what we're doing is we're rendering what template we want to use and we're passing it some data. So let's kind of see this in action or at least see this item um, being uh, started. So if I'm in here, I should be able to, and I'm going to go NPM start, for example. Because once you've installed uh, Express with the generator, and I should probably go through the Express generator and how you install it, but once you go, you can start to use NPM to actually start it, and it'll figure out what port do I start it on, what are your configurations that you set, um, all that, oh, that's not good, all that good kind of stuff. You, you probably want to do an NPM install. Oh, yeah. Thanks, buddy. I thought I did that already. Oh, there we go. You see that little icon? And you saw stuff kind of uh, moving down. It's a good thing you're here. Right, and then I installed everything. So again, once you get that package and once you start it, nope. Cannot find module. Cannot find module. Hold on. Let me see. What is going on here? Uh, do you see that? I don't see that. One sec. Okay, let's make it bigger. Well, let's do this. Node app.js. Nope, I've got an error in this one. All right. <laughs> Did you modify any of the files, perhaps? No, I didn't touch anything. Should be good. All right, maybe we can move on to the next one, and I can figure this one, and we can come back to it. There we go. First demo. Boop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, 
So... Hold on. Here we go. Oh, I actually know what's going on. Oh, uh, it's actually missing uh, the bin-ww uh, file. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so easy way to do that. Why don't we go up one folder and actually use the express generator? Uh, show you how to use the express generator, and from there we'll take the bin.ww folder that we forgot to put in the repo. <laughs> right. So if I do the generator, I have it installed, right? But I can go npm install express generator. Do you want to install it globally, perhaps? With the G flag? Yeah, yep. absolutely. That way I can use it on the command line. So if it's installed that way, I have no problem. Awesome. And then what I can do is I can just do express. Right, so I'm up a folder. It's looking, and now again, Express is looking for a folder here. And so I can easily just do Express at the root here, and it's just going to basically kind of go through, and it's going to be like, oh no, this is not empty, which is fine. Right, so now what I need to do is I need to install. And it's created all of these things, so it's going to write all that stuff. It's going to install all these things. Now it's going and it's looking to NPM for the registry and it's getting all the modules. And it's, you know, you start to see this list of crazy stuff coming down, right? And now I should be able to go NPM start. Okay, golden. So we've got it started and I can bring it up here. And it should be running on localhost 3000, that's the default. Okay, and you start to see that it has these items, and I think it was users or user. Okay, respond re with a resource. Now, okay, we're covered. I'm recovered now. Let's add a root. Let's show you how to do that real quick. So what we want to do is we want to go back into here, and I'm going to close this off. Okay, um, I'm actually going to close this folder. So if you want to close a folder, you can go close folder. I'm going to say don't save. I'm going to open the folder. So again, a couple little things showing you along the uh, along the way, and I can select this folder. It, maybe you want to copy the bin www folder that you were missing earlier. Um, I think I overwrote everything here. Did I not? No, you overwrote the node MVA folder. Oh, hold on. Yeah, right there. Perfect. Okay. You are ahead of me, my friend. Paste. There we go. Okay. So, now, mm -mm 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 -mm. let's do this. Let's kill this process. Okay. CD11. NPM. Uh, start. There we go. So now we're set up. Thanks, buddy. And we can start to look at 3000. And I had places. And you can see just that route right there. Thanks for getting me set up. You can see that just by changing that route, I changed the title of it. And you can start to add routes. So to add a route is very, very simple. And to do so, if we bring up code uh, again and we go to the apps, you'll see that what you need to do is you need to create a file and you put it into roots here and you use that root when they are calling that. And in this file here, you'll see that you can put anything that you want. So I have places, I could change this to be more data, I could use a different template, I could do all sorts of things. So to create a new root, it's just that, that kind of process. So can you walk me through this again? Uh, so this is the places.js file in the routes folder. Right. Right. And inside this file, we have the router that we've created. Right. right from Express. Yep. And then we add the get uh, request for that URL to the router. Right. And then we export the router. Right. Using module.exports. Right. So that when we go back in app.js. Yeah. And we go right to the top, we are requiring that places, right? Right, right here. Exactly. So that, so in that places, there's the router that we just set. Yeah, we're actually requiring the router. The router. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. And then when we go use, here is where we're specifying sort of that root URL slash places. Right. So that in our places.js, yeah. where we don't have to say slash places, right? Yeah, we don't we have to worry about any slash. of it. Yep. Awesome. 
So, and again, you know, if you wanted to use a different route or add multiple routes to places, for example, places you're going to have a get or a put or, or, you know, again, changing that, the complexity of the route, you can totally do that. Awesome. That's where you're at. Awesome. <laughs> Let's go back to our slides. Oops. One sec. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Okay. So... All right. Uh, slideshow. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about actually, we've shown a little bit of routes. So, like yeah, basic so we, pages. We've shown routing. Yeah. Uh, we've shown how you could uh, render a, a template, right, right uh, with your router. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to actually create what is called a RESTful API. Uh, and I have a I'm a big fan of dogs. I just got a puppy. Her name is Ruby. She's really awesome. So I figured, hey, I'm going to create a uh, RESTful API uh, for dogs. Just for right? dogs. Now, this is going to come in very <laughs> handy. <laughs> yeah, this is going to come in very, very handy when you're building, let's say, a, a single page application and you need an API for the different resources that you have. Right. Um, let's say that we're building, uh, I don't know, a, uh, a, a web page that showed all of my friends' dogs and, and my own. Um, Does this exist? I feel like you've made this. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe. I, perhaps, perhaps. perhaps. <laughs> um, um, it, funny, funny you mentioned that. Actually, one of my friends runs a startup that uh, is all about creating apps for dog owners. That's amazing. It is. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, niche, uh, but great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I didn't have a, a dog for a while, and then when I finally got one, I, I just yeah. immediately went up to him and said, hey, I need to use your app. Yeah. Uh, so let's say that we wanted to build a RESTful API so that we can create a single page application. Yeah. All right. Uh, in our in our uh, browser front end, that uh, will then get to all the the dogs that are in our collection, all the stuff that's that's there. Yeah. Um, now there is a, a a certain pattern that is very uh, very very common and almost standardized now, I would say, um, of how to actually build these APIs so that uh, your JavaScript on the front end knows what to do and can get. Uh, the different uh, properties of the objects that are in your database or in your collection or, or, or whatnot. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of this hand motion because I, I'm imagining uh, <laughs> sort of our, our, our browser right here. It's going to go get something from uh, the server. So some from something far away. Server's here. Server's here. Okay. okay. There we go. Server's there. There we go. Yep. It's going to get something. There you go. And then it's going to bring it to your browser. <laughs> um, that was really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we like to have fun on the NBA set, don't we? Yeah. You have to. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> All right. So uh, if we go back to the slide, uh, you'll notice that um, there's different types of HTTP methods. And uh, to create a RESTful API, the typical ones that we use are get, put, post, and delete. Right, and uh, there's really two type of resources. There's a single resource, or there's a collection of resources. Right, right, a list of, of these things. Right. Sure. So let's say that we wanted to get all of the dogs. Yeah, give me okay. all the dogs. All the dogs. Perhaps we want to create a collection URI, and uh, here's an example. Let's say that we had uh, uh, api.example.com. All right, perhaps a version of the API, like maybe v1, yeah. slash dog. So that's our collection. Never seen the v1 in an API uh, <laughs> before in my life. Never. Perhaps, I'm yeah. being sarcastic there. Yeah. <laughs> it's always like V1, V2, It's always V2, 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 yeah. V2, yeah. yeah. Lots of APIs get updated and they change things. So yeah. uh, in our case, we're just putting V1 right there. Uh, in the actual code, we don't have that. So if you wanted to add it, you can. Uh, but let's say that we wanted to um, uh, create that uh, collection URI being slash dogs. OK, dogs with an S. Um, and uh, perhaps we wanted to get all the dogs. So we would implement the get at this URL to just list all the dogs in JSON format. Uh, let's say we want to replace all the dogs with a new collection of dogs. Uh, we can use the put right. uh, HTTP method. Yeah. If we wanted to create a new dog, I don't know how you could actually do that, but let's say that in let's our we application could. we could. Sounds uh, fun. We can post to that same URL slash dogs to create a new dog in the collection. Yeah. And if you wanted to delete a dog, uh, we, we, we didn't say any other word, which no. is just remove it from the collection. The dog no. is still alive. Maybe just uh, archive it. Archive it, maybe. I don't Aww. know. We could uh, archive the dog. Um, okay, maybe the dog moved away or something uh, by using the delete uh, uh, HTTP method. The littlest hobo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's, um, uh, let's talk about how we can get a specific dog as well. 
Right. right. Perhaps that dog has an has a, an ID, a name, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we can actually use uh, the URL slash dog slash something right. to identify that dog. Uh, so if we use if we pair that up with the get request, then we can get a specific dog. Uh, if we use the put request, well, that's really meant to replace the dog, that specific dog, in, yeah. with other dog information in the in the collection. Uh, the post is not really used in uh, in uh, fairly RESTful APIs uh, for a, a specific um, uh, for a specific element. Uh, and if we want to remove that specific dog from the collection, we can just use the delete, uh, delete method. So you'll notice this pattern is actually used by lots of different APIs out there. Yeah. Um, this pretty much sort of has become the de facto way to build a RESTful API. Uh, and uh, if you're familiar with it here, perhaps you've seen it before, uh, you'll notice that it's, it's pretty much the same everywhere. When you start to think about, and, and once again, this maybe isn't specifically node related, so forgive me for one second, but when you start to think about building an API, is there anything um, like quickly that you think that people should just consider uh, or tools that they should use when they're trying to think about what their API is going to be? Absolutely. Uh, so there's one tool that comes to mind uh, almost immediately, and I actually use it every time that I am working with an API. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of them. Um, the one that I use is called Postman, uh, and there's other ones. There's REST Workbench. There's a bunch of these tools. But essentially what they do is they give you a client that you can simulate uh, REST calls with mm -hmm. to a API server. Right. So you can see what type of uh, response that you're getting for a specific uh, uh, URL with a get or put or post. You can even test your own API server if you're developing it there. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of different stuff with these tools on the client side so that you don't have to write a full web application to test your API. Right. And there are other tools as well, like things that you can embed with Node, <coughs> uh, so right. Node testing tools like Mocha or, and stuff like that as well. Uh, so why don't we actually get down into the code uh, and actually build a RESTful API for dogs. Ooh, I'm excited. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to switch to my screen and uh, we're going to open up this uh, advanced REST API right here. And uh, you'll notice that even this project was actually created with the Express Generator before I then remove things that I didn't need. Um, so you'll notice package.json has the, all the dependencies that we might need, uh, including things that I don't actually end up using. Uh, now, if you remember, we used npm start. And the reason why npm start uh, is a command that works is because we've specified in our package.json that there's a script that says start. And all it does is it calls node right. app.js. Um, so for my so for my bad previously I had, could have gone into the package JSON changed yep. that and I would have been I would have been solid. Yep. In theory. In theory. Yep. Yep. <laughs> there are more details, but we won't cover them <laughs> right now. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it, it's fairly straightforward. Um, you can change this to be anything. You can even use like uh, the different types of things. Like there are tools called um, node monitors, for example, is one of them. Uh, tools that basically ensure that node never goes down. If, if there's an error or something, it just restarts it. Right. Uh, but I like to use, uh, just, we're just going to use the straightforward node app.js, but we can call that with npm start, the name of that script. Um, and uh, if we were to start this, uh, basically we'll have our API up and running. But before we do that, let's actually go into the app.js and see what's there. Uh, so you'll notice a couple of interesting things. Right at the top, we're saying this is a node file, so you can actually sort of execute this app.js file. If you're in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Linux or, or OS X, you can make this uh, app.js executable. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you just say, hey, app.js execute, it will actually know that this is a node app, and it will run it that way. Uh, we're going to get our module dependencies. So we have HTTP, uh, Express. We have a bunch of other ones. Uh, and then we're going to do something similar like we did in the previous example. We're going to require a route, all right? And uh, I'll show you what these routes contain. There's two of them that we're uh, requiring. One is the routes, and one is the API router. Um, we're going to do go ahead and uh, create an Express uh, uh, app. Uh, after that, we're going to tell uh, Express to use a bunch of different middleware, including the body parser JSON, which is going to come in really handy because we're going to use JSON everywhere. Um, JSON this, for everyone. J JSON for everywhere, everything. <laughs> JSON, JSON, all the things. JavaScript, all the things. Uh, this is going to come in really handy because we're going to also want to send JSON back to the server. So we're going to want Express to know how to parse that, uh, parse that, that request with right. the JSON. So it'll actually convert it into an object in JavaScript and right. not just uh, a file of uh, uh, not just text. Um, and uh, then we're going to tell the app to use our routes that we've also required right up here at the top. Uh, and then we're going to do a bunch of different things, like, hey, if there's an error, then do this. 
Uh, if the environment is in development, then for the error, render the error message. If it's in production, don't render the error message. Don't share the details of how our servers work, because we don't want those stack traces leaked to the user, because then they could figure out how our servers work. Uh, and of course, we're going to set the port. And in this case, we're going to try to normalize the process.environment port. If not, we're going to use the port 3000. Finally, create that server. Tell it to listen. And if there's an error, do this. If it's listening, do this. And the rest at the bottom are just functions that we've called previously, if you want to take a look at them. Um, and they basically say, hey, you know, they, they give us slightly more useful error codes uh, if there's an error. Uh, and of course, on listen, it'll say listening to this uh, address at this port. So all of this is in the repository. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just run the app just to show you what it looks like. Now, if you're running this for the first time, you're going to want to go into the 12 folder. And you're going to want to do an npm install to make sure that you have all the packages that you need. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to do that as well. I love the little boop, working, working, working icon. There it is, and it's done. Uh, now, if you remember, if I do npm start, it should execute node app.js, and it did. Yes. There we go. And it says listening on port 3000. Now, if I go to my browser right here, and I say, hey, node 3000. Hello world. It works. Yes. Awesome. Um, now, of course, there's no default engine that was specified. So when we rendered <laughs> something, uh, we basically told Node that, hey, don't use J, don't use any templating library, because all we're going to use is JSON, right. and that's OK. So I'm going to reboot this just to remove the error so that we have a clear screen right here. There we go. Great. And uh, now, what I will show you. Uh, so we hit that index just in case you were curious what that actually looks like. Uh, all it does is just send hello world, which is why it complains because it doesn't know what, there's no templating, so it doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, but all we said is send hello world. What we want to take a look at is the actually the API. All right. So here we are. We've got Express. We've got our standard router right there. Now um, I have an array of dogs here. Uh, now typically you don't want to put your data in the file. <laughs> that you're developing. Yeah. But for the sake of our example here, that's what we're going to do, because we don't want to connect to a database just yet. In fact, the next module Ooh. is where we're going to do that. Look, setting it uh, up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for now, we're just going to use the dogs array. It's going to contain uh, a bunch of objects. Okay, And each object has a dog ID, which is the number of the dog. Uh, maybe it's name, Ginger. Uh, maybe uh, you know, Ruby is my dog. But there's also Buddy and a bunch of other dogs in this list. And uh, why don't we implement the first thing that we want to do, which is perhaps get all the dogs. Right. Okay? Give me all that data. Give me all of that data. Give it all. <laughs> so to do that, we're going to add router.get, OK? I'm going to say slash dogs. Yep. OK? Uh, and then we're, it's going to be real simple. We're just going to respond with JSON these dogs. Right. All right, and this is the dog array right up here. Now, um, if you were doing this with a database, you probably want to go get something from the database before you respond, uh, or even filter, or do a query of some sort, or even just read, if you're reading a file or whatever, maybe a, a picture or a video stream or something. Right. Uh, you want to do all of that and then respond uh, to that API request. But in our case, our dogs are already in the file. It's a variable that's, that's, that's available right out of that. And so when I do a respond.json, I'm just going to give it dogs, and it's going to convert that array into uh, JSON. So now if I go back to my browser and I type in dogs, well, correction, I type in API slash dogs, it will return there you go. that API. And in fact, we can even double check that it is returning the type application slash JSON, Perfect. which is what jQuery and all the other libraries expect. What everyone loves. All right, great. So that was fairly straightforward. Uh, the next thing that we perhaps might want to do is get a specific dog. Right? So here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, we've got the same type of get right here, okay? But we're going to introduce this new uh, concept of the uh, colon, okay, ID. And what this is going to mean is that it's going to take what comes after dogs in the URL yeah. and set it as a parameter called ID. Right. So anything after that, that whole entire thing, as long as it only sees it within that parameter. Area. Exactly. Okay. Now, if you wanted to add more, you could also add more right. by uh, typing it in and then saying, hey, perhaps the dog has a specific collar or something, and that collar also has an ID of some sort. Right. Uh, perhaps you don't want to call it that ID. You want to call it maybe caller ID. 
then it's going to put these two parameters, uh, um, and it's going to take them out of the URL right. as well. Now, we're not going to do that for this example. We're going to keep it simple. Which is um, awesome, because back in the day, we used to have to go and parse all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, figure out, like, oh, here's a query string. How many things do I have on it? How, like, I mean, we still have to do that. But you know, the routing there is really awesome. Makes it a lot simpler. You yeah. are correct. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, can you say that again? You are correct. Yes, I, uh, yes again, one more time. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, all right, cool. Small wins, small wins. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so let's uh, take a look at this. And uh, because I have an array, all I want to do is I actually want to iterate through uh, my array of dogs to see if there are any dog that matches that ID. Now, if you're doing this in a database, you can actually use a, a, a select or, or whatnot. You can mm -hmm. do actual proper querying. Mm -hmm. In our case, we're just going to iterate through the array. Very simply, you're going to use the for loop. Uh, we're going to create this variable i equals 0. And we're going to create a variable dog that's going to contain the dog that we found. Uh, first, we're going to set it to null in case we don't find anything. Right. Uh, we're going to loop through the dog, uh, the, the dog's array. So we're just going to do a standard uh, you know, increment by 1 every single time. If and then we're going to do an if statement that says if this dog's at this index of i, starting at 0, obviously, uh, see if there's a dog ID, and if this matches the request parameters the ID right. uh, field. So the, what that's going to do is it's going to take the um, ID from our URL. So uh, Express will parse this URL. It will put it in params. Uh -huh. All right, And then it's going to make it available as the ID variable, because that's the name that we gave it. So that when we compare the dog ID to this ID, if it matches, then that's the dog that we're looking for. Yeah, success. Success. And we're going to set that dog uh, at i to this dog variable, and we're going to break out of the loop. Now, of course, this is a very simple example. Um, we're assuming that our array has you know, uh, unique IDs everywhere. You know, like the, assuming we're perfect. We're here. assuming we're perfect. We're this assuming is just a we're very perfect. simple example. Yeah, right? don't don't do what don't we did. Don't do this in production, <laughs> right? Use a real database and the real query engine. Do uh, all your error checking, uh, everything you need do to do. Do your validation, yeah. check to make sure that the ID is actually a number and not just like some random string of characters. Right, or or yeah, or yeah. whatever you need to do. Just for the sake of our example, yeah. uh, we're gonna we're gonna assume that this is all perfect. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna check to see if the dog um, that if we found it. All right, it would not be equal to null, but if it's uh, so, if it's not equal to null after this loop is complete, either by the break or just by reaching the end of the loop, uh, we're going to respond with JSON of that specific dog. Okay, if it's equal to null, we're going to respond with JSON some status that we didn't find the dog. Right. All right. Yeah. So if I go back into my uh, browser and I go, hey, I want my dog, which is Ruby. There we go. It yeah. returns a specific uh, a JSON object. If we take a look at before, it actually returned a array. Right. So you can see right there. All right. And if I try maybe perhaps doing something like 11, 30, oh. status not found, ah, didn't find the dog. It's shouting at you. Yeah. <laughs> all caps. <laughs> did it wrong, OK? It's all caps. <laughs> if I say we try 0 again, we get actually ginger. Uh, and it's nice. It, it responds with application.json. Uh, all is well. Nice. So you can see right at the beginning, we're starting to slowly build up this API. Yep. We've already got the get for the collections. We've already got the get to a specific dog. Now let's see how we can actually post things. Oh, yeah, OK. We're getting real here. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, this is going to require a little bit uh, of a different tool, all right? Because unless we create the front end uh, and use jQuery to post something, yeah. we won't be able to post it right away. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the first thing that I want to do is perhaps uh, post a new dog, right? Add a new dog to the collection. So let's see how the code is actually uh, built. Uh, we're going to say router.post instead of dot get. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we're going to say we're going to use this URL. Obviously, we're going to post to the collection. So we're going to add a new dog to the collection. And in here, what we're going to do is we're going to stick the dogs array and we're going to add this new uh, dog. And we're going to assume, because we didn't do any validation here, we're going to assume that we're perfect. We're actually sending a JSON object that contains dog ID and dog name yeah. in the body of the request. Yeah. It's a lot of assumptions. Yeah, yeah. Don't do Careful this that. in production. <laughs> Please validate your APIs. Please like yeah. validate that the people send proper stuff, all right? Because you, you people on the web are, are a little uh, uh, sometimes 
they like to test your API, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They like to test your API. Yeah. And your so, databases. And your databases. So mm -hmm. be very careful on how you actually it. do this. <laughs> uh, make sure that you are um, ch checking that uh, that request contains a JSON object yeah. uh, with the body. And um, once we assume that we have this, we can push it straight to the array uh, and return with a status 200 OK. Everything yeah. is all good. We were able to add a dog to our API, uh, to our collection. Now, uh, I'm actually going to switch uh, browsers, and I'm going to switch to Chrome, because I'm going to actually show you how to do this with Postman. It's one of my favorite tools. All right, and uh, because, of course, I did not actually install Postman before I started, I'm going to do this real quick. Go straight to the store, add it to Chrome. Takes a second. Boom, done. It's added. Go right there. Wait for it to add. Go into apps. Postman should be there. Oh, there's a fact there's another client called Advanced REST Client. We'll use that instead. It's already there. All right, so let's say that we had uh, a local API. Okay. We can say, hey, we want to go to dogs, right? We want to post. We want to give it a JSON format. And we're going to say, hey, Pass in dog ID. We're going to give it a new ID that doesn't exist in our system already, like five perhaps. Uh, dog name. What do you want to call the dog? Brutus. Brutus. Okay. I feel like I need to add a little oomph to your dog oomph. names. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I send this, okay, and I just need to double check that we are in fact running on, th on 3000. Yes, we are. And go back here. We've got our API slash dogs. Do that. If I send this, uh, unable to set request her. Okay, actually, we did something wrong. We put it in the headers when, in fact, we wanted to put it in, in the, the body. Payload. There you yeah. go. So now, if I send it, voila, two hundred. Okay. Nice. Status is all good. Uh, now, if I actually go back and do a get for the same URL, okay, and I send this, it should return all of all of the dogs. So I press it. Let's do it. Oh, there is Brutus. Yes. Right there. Yeah. Okay, so you notice that uh, we made a, a teensy mistake yeah, right here. Yeah, we put it as a string. Yeah, we put it all as one glorious string, which was yeah. uh, the wrong thing to do, uh, but uh, that's okay. Um, the point is, it was actually inserted to our array. Well, it just goes back to our whole point of, don't do this, check everything. <laughs> check everything, <laughs> it's all good. exactly. <laughs> uh, so if I do this again with Postman, which for some reason went all big on me, I can do, uh, let's say I wanted to do a put. Uh, I wanted to create a whole new dog collection. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say I wanted to do a put. And just to show you what that actually looks like in the code first, uh, put is right here. What we're going to do is we're going to say put instead of post. Yeah. We're going to get all the dogs. All right. Uh, we're going to print out that body just for funsies. Uh, and then, <laughs> yes, I did just say funsies. <laughs> just for more fun. Just for more fun. <laughs> Uh, and instead of like adding the body using the push to the like uh, adding it to the array using the push uh, function, we're actually going to just set the whole docs entirely. All right, so we're going to assume that you know we actually did this correctly. So I'm going to do that by actually copying what I originally had. Okay, going into uh, Postman. Okay, giving it a place to go. Okay, replacing this with a put. Telling the body, hey, it's actually uh, raw JSON. All right. And I'm going to change this so that it doesn't have buddy. So it's going to be two dogs. Now, if I send this over, status OK. Yep. If I go ahead and do a get on that same URL, it should only put two dogs. Moment of truth. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> Everything works. I love clapping so much. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, now, last thing that I want to show you, because we are slowly reaching the end of this module, is how to actually remove a dog from the collection. Oh. If you want to remove all the dogs, okay, you can just call delete on the entire URL. But first, what we're going to do is we're going to remove a specific dog. Okay, so delete would just reset the, uh, the array to empty. Mm -hmm. To delete a specific dog, we do ver something very similar to what we did with the getting the actual specific dog. But in our case, when we find it from the ID, right. we want to splice that array by one yeah. so that we remove that specific element from the array and keep the other dogs in there and return 200 OK. If it didn't find something, if it never returned, never got into this if statement, it's going to return status 404 not found. So if I go ahead 
and I say, hey, uh, remove this dog from our collection, maybe dog 20, it actually should not find it. So it will say not found, that is correct. That's good. If I remove, uh, oh, no. let's say dog zero, Aww. 200 okay, we found it. If I don't go ahead and then get all the dogs, or if I try to get dog zero, it should say not found. Yep. But if I get all the dogs, it will return the last dog, Ruby, my dog. If I want to remove the entire collection, oh. all right, if I remove it, <laughs> 200 okay, it removed everything correctly. If I go back and try to get all the dogs, it will return an empty array. Oh, that's so sad. But success, our that's API success. Yeah. works. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's a process of going about and building an API for something you might be working on. Maybe you're getting songs from a database or, you know, whatever it may be. Maybe you got to get the most latest uh, uh, things that people had tweeted and you'd save them in a database or something. I don't know. But maybe, you know, that's the idea of going, retrieving, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I feel like that always comes up in, in a lot of projects. And to make this all right, right before we end this module in 10 seconds, we are actually going to... Um, Put all the dogs back. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, that makes me feel better. 200, okay. So now if you do I was that, actually really anxious there for a moment. There we go. So back. weird. It's just like, I knew it was going to work, but I was anxious because I was like, you're deleting a dog. That doesn't seem right. It seems so wrong. <laughs> it seems just, so wrong. Oh we put gosh. them all back. It's all good now. <laughs> yeah. All happy again. So we uh, have, we had what? Three successful demos, one failed. Not bad. That's 75%. Um, not a bad track. Yeah, not bad. High five. Yeah. High five. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so there's a couple of resources that we have up on the screen here that can kind of take what we showed you um, and get you started a little bit uh, further down those lines. So we talked about the Express Framework. You just want to want to go check it out, uh, read a little bit about it. Um, you know, again, it's like version four plus now, right? And we've shown things from three or four, that yeah, kind of so thing. So three was that first example that we saw with a very, very basic uh, Express. Um, uh, and then the, the last new examples that we saw, all of them were Express That's four. That's four. And there's a really good tutorial that's listed, Intro to Express. Uh, Jade templates, I feel like I constantly need to go and look up some of this stuff and understanding the templating. Now, we didn't really go through too much of the templating. We will when we start to talk about the front end a little bit more, and we'll kind of explain some of the basics of it. Um, and then uh, JavaScript and, and Jade templating, uh, really good uh, You know, up on SlideShare. There's a, uh, some good opportunities for you to catch up on that as well. All right, yeah. so stay tuned for the next module, and we'll be back. Yay! Welcome back. We're in the third module of uh, Visual Code and Node. That's a, a little bit of a, I don't know, rolls off the tongue quite nicely. I like Visual it. Studio Code and Node. Node. <laughs> um, oh, no. And, uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about working with databases. Um, and looking at a couple examples of how to work with databases such as Mongo, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if you remember in the last module, if you, if you watched it, uh, we uh, showed you how to build a REST API. Yeah. Right? And we mentioned a couple of times that, hey, you know, like you probably should not be writing things to an array <laughs> in memory. You should probably be writing things to a database, you know, validating things <laughs> that you might have gotten. Uh, so in this module, we're going to discuss data driven websites right. and what that means. Uh, and. Uh, where are, the, where are the different components of data-driven websites? Yeah, uh, we're going to show you how to use uh, MongoDB, which is a very famous one uh, for uh, the Node community in the Node community. The, this, the celebrity, yeah, like I guess it's famous. It's the celebrity database. <laughs> uh, there's this whole concept of a mean stack, and yeah. M is the uh, the Mongo part, E right. is the Express part, uh, A is uh, a uh, Angular, Angular or uh, some other web framework. You replace these letters with different frameworks, but <laughs> it's called mean because I guess it was the only one that made sense. Uh, and then N is the node part, right? right. So uh, we'll talk about Mongo and we'll show you how to save uh, to MongoDB using uh, the MongoDB client. We actually won't be using Mongoose. There's a, a little bug in the slides, but not a problem. Um, so why don't we just get started right into it and uh, talk a little bit about data-driven websites. What are data-driven websites? Uh, so essentially, it's <laughs> this. Uh, the, these are websites or web apps that are uh, driven mostly by uh, data, uh, data interactions, right? Like you've right. got some type of uh, thing that you want to create, all right, perhaps save it somewhere and then You're being read very it. descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be as uh, not too abstract because it's the thing, but like it's abstract enough because we don't know what that thing is. Sure. Right? I, I don't know. Like it could be, a, let's say that uh, we're building a blog. All right. right. Very famous example. Yeah. Uh, Data-driven websites that could be a blog. 
right? You have different people that can read things from that website. So there's a read operation that happens. Uh, it's, uh, there's a, a write operation in the sense that we're writing a blog post to the database that's going to be read somewhere. Yeah. Uh, update as well, even remove, like delete. Sure. Uh, so a data driven websites is this concept of, uh, it's a concept of websites and web apps that are driven mostly by data and data operations. Right. Right. So, and if you think about it, most things on the internet right now are driven by data. I was going to um, say, like, very, I mean, <laughs> the idea of static HTML, like, there are some things for sure that are static HTML still, but it's one of those things where you're yeah. kind of like, oh, yeah. That's yeah, most things are data driven now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you no longer write all the stuff straight into the HTML. You actually put it in a database, and there's an application layer uh, that reads from that database and it puts it on in the HTML and puts it on the screen for you. Right. Uh, so that's the Magically. idea. Magically. Magically, yeah. Magically. Uh, now, of course, data-driven websites, uh, because it's this sort of all-encompassing term, um, we've actually gone a little bit further than that in the sense that now data-driven websites are, are no longer, the data part is no longer done on the back end. It's mostly done on the front end mm -hmm. uh, with single-page applications where we have, uh, you know, like a, a very complex front end, perhaps using Angular mm -hmm. or some other web framework, and then that connects to uh, Express, a very lightweight framework on the back end that then connects to the database. Right. Right, and then that, that's what brings us to this concept of a mean stack, right. which is Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node. Plenty of resources on Microsoft Virtual Academy about that. I mean, yep. I know that you've done a couple of uh, Angular yep. uh, MBAs. Yeah, Angular. There's a, I've done single page applications. I know someone did um, a really good intro to the mean stack as well. So there's there's lots of resources there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I've also done uh, the Mongo MBA. So if you want to go deeper into Mongo than we do in this module, you you can want to you probably want to check that one out. Yeah. Um, but uh, all all overall, this is uh, essentially. Um, um, what we're trying to do with Node is try to build this uh, mean stack in the end. Yeah. Uh, and you can replace Mongo with other databases as well, including uh, Document DB, which is a, a great Azure technology. Yeah. Um, so I love for, that mean stack. The mean stack, yeah. For our oh. for our example, we're gonna we're gonna stick with what's considered the classic mean stack. Uh, in a sense, not classic because it's old, but because like that's what uh, sort of became very popular. Right. Because uh, Node is really not that old. It's actually fairly uh, yeah. new technology. Yeah, yeah. 2009. Um, no. 2009, 2000, roughly. Yeah. 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 So why don't we uh, jump into that? What yeah. is MongoDB? Yeah. Uh, so uh, our first, um, I guess, module is uh, what is MongoDB. And the first thing that we want to talk about is uh, actually what type of database that Mongo is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a NoSQL database. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people that just like their mind just go is like, Poosh. yeah, yeah. So perhaps you've had experience with database before, uh, and yes. for a long time, databases uh, mostly resolve, revolved around this idea of, of relational tables. Sure. Right. You had one table that was related to another table of data. Right. Right. And um, they were connected in little ways. That connected. You kind of, There's yeah. the keys that pointed from like one row <laughs> to the row of another table, and it was fairly like. Um, I want you to mime it all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So you so, take the key from this table and you put it in this table, but yeah, it's that idea that these things, things were, were connected, related in some way, but separated relations, but they're separated because that's how the database systems worked. And uh, now, of course, this is all based off uh, a mathematical uh, theory, set theory, uh, mostly, and there was ways to like do joins to bring data together and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, what happened over the past couple of years, uh, maybe even longer than that, maybe three, four years now, uh, the developers started realizing that hey, well. A lot of our data that we're putting on the web, most of it actually just sits on the same page. Yeah. Right? So why do we have to do multiple queries to get the different pieces of the data when we can just save the whole thing in one page, in one place? And then that's what led to the rise of these this idea of document databases and right. SQL databases, where it was not only SQL, it was also other types of querying that you could do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's what, what brings us to this idea of NoSQL databases among the Mongo, which is a document database. But of course, there are other ones. Right. Like graph databases, mm -hmm. cache databases, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, now, within the document world, yeah. okay, which is what we're going to be uh, talking about today and entering slowly into the <laughs> document world, uh, we're actually, there's actually a couple of ones that are out there. Uh, there's MongoDB, there's Couchbase, there's HBase, uh, which is a Hadoop-based. Uh, there's Cassandra. So if you think about it, um, there's a couple. All of, all of these actually work on Azure. So if you wanted a, a quick hosting solution for Mongo, or even if you wanted a, a very scalable uh, document database, uh, there's DocDB, which is a really great one. Um, and essentially, what they all provide in common is this idea of an, a document-based API or an object-oriented API. Right. Right. So it's um, 
uh, all given with this document API. So instead of having, uh, let's say when you had a blog, you had perhaps the user information for the person who wrote that blog post and then the post itself, instead of having them in two different places, like one table for the users and one table for the, for the blog post, yeah. you would have it in one. It would be like the blog post itself with the user information, the, the post itself, and maybe comments even in the same document. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is good because if you have tons of data, yeah. right, and your databases are huge and there's terabytes of, of, of information, a gigabytes of information, um, you don't want to do all of these different queries, right? Because it would just take forever, yeah. right? Ideally, you want everything to be like denormalized and put in the same place. Right. Uh, so you wanted to have like this one document that you would get. So it's, these uh, NoSQL databases are great for large amounts of data, and they can be scaled, and that's essentially what their main design was. Right. Uh, so for for our use cases, we're actually going to keep it a little smaller, though. We're not going to be working too much with gigabytes <laughs> yeah. of data. Uh, we're going to. Uh, I know. Right? <laughs> we do use like. We, the, if you go check out the Mongo MVA, we do load a, a big data set into a MongoDB, and we do some, some map reduce uh, queries in that MVA if you want to check it out. Nice. Um, but uh, for us uh, today, we're going to keep it a little bit simpler. Now, using MongoDB, how can you actually use it? Well, there's, um, you can either uh, create, a, well, first of all, you need to create a MongoDB instance. You just start an instance, all yeah. right? Uh, there's different ways that you can do it on Azure if you wanted to. You can go to Mongo, or even just uh, if you're not using Azure, uh, you can uh, go... Uh, and just host one on Mongo HQ or Mongo Lab. Uh, you can use the Mongo Lab add-in on Azure. Mongo uh, Lab's awesome, by the way. Like I just tried it out, and I was like, yeah, "Oh, this is awesome! It just it's works so easy, and it, yeah. yeah, everything's exposed to you." It just gives you a, a URI yeah. that you connect to. Yeah. Uh, or uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run it locally on our machine, so that we don't have to connect to the uh, to the internet. Uh, we can run things all on our local machine here. Uh, but there's different ways that you could use MongoDB. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, first thing that you probably want to do is run MongoDB on your machine. Um, ideally, you'd like to uh, actually go and download MongoDB, install it. Uh, if you're on Windows, you can install it as a service, so you can actually get it started as a Windows service. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to actually run it by calling the Mongo daemon. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that's going to do is going to start the server, and we're going to point it to a, a database path, so where, where the data is actually stored. Right. And on my screen right now, it's actually I'm actually in the... Uh, I'm just going to clear it up so it's a little clearer. Uh, I'm actually in the MongoDB server slash 3.0 slash bin folder mm -hmm. that, if I take a look at, contains a bunch of different tools. Uh, there's mongo.exe, which is like a client so that you can use it to connect to Mongo. And what's really cool about this is that it all uses JavaScript for everything. Yeah. So uh, that's one of, the, one of the many common things about the mean stack is that it's JavaScript and JSON throughout as yeah. the main data format. And in fact, whenever you store things in MongoDB, you're using JSON. Yeah. So your documents are represented as JSON. Um, now, uh, what I want to do is I'll actually want to run the daemon, which is MongoD. So if I do that, all right, I'm going to tell it, uh, basically, it's going to use the default data path, which is slash data slash db. Uh, it's going to start. It's going to say that it's running and that it's picking up things and allocating memory and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but if it gets to this point, it's saying waiting for connections basically means that it's running and waiting for something to connect to it. Right. Right. So let's take a look at some of the binaries that we had. So perhaps uh, if we can switch to the slide, um, we've got uh, MongoD. That was the database process. Mongo, uh, the without the D at the end, that was the CLI. Right. So we can use that to connect to see what uh, collections are there. Right. And uh, there's a really cool tool called Mongo Import that we make use of a lot in the Mongo MVA. And with that, you can actually load a bunch of data. Yeah. Now. Um, we mentioned that there's these things called documents, but how is uh, documents actually uh, represented to in the database? Well, uh, this is essentially what it looks like. It's a bit of a tree. The MongoDB server has a bunch of different databases, so you can go 0 to n, as many databases as you want, uh, or as many as many databases that you have met, uh, like storage for. Uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, Let's be careful there. There are, there are careful. hardware limitations. You know? There are hardware limitations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you can have databases in there, and then each database could have as many columns, uh, collections as it wants. Right. Right. And inside each collection is where you put all your documents. Right. Right, so that's uh, roughly how it's structured. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different from your typical relational database where you have a database with tables inside it. Right. This is all like 
You, just yeah. Collections, database, collections, documents. That's right. It. And and the idea of different collections is like they would contain different. You got to think of it like from that uh, like object domain idea, yeah. where like different collections would be different things. So you might have a collection of places, or or maybe it's a collection of blog posts, or yeah. those kind of things. But you know, all those collections aren't going to necessarily be interrelated, and sometimes they might also contain duplicate data between them, depending on what you're doing. And that's one of the things when you get into document based, that's just a little bit different, and you get used to thinking about things in a little yeah, bit Yeah, you, you gotta change your thinking model a little bit, you are correct. Yep. Um, and um, you raise an interesting point in the sense that sometimes there is data that's relational, yep. uh, and sometimes you will duplicate the data to, to make uh, for performance reasons, especially at scale. Yep. Uh, and then sometimes you will also just want to point to other things in other collections. Uh, and if you're using uh, Node, uh, there's a great uh, module called Mongoose that makes it a little bit easier to create these relations between Mongo uh, tables and collections. Uh, sorry, collections, not tables, collections. Uh, and we won't really cover it to today, but we will show you how to use the MongoDB client to connect from Node to Mongo and actually save and write and update and delete some data. All that good stuff. All that good stuff. All right. Now, if you're curious, well, how could I load some test data? Let's say that I had a bunch of JSON files already. Well, using Mongo import, you can just load bulk data from CSV or JSON files. And to be honest, it is the fastest way to load data into MongoDB without having to write a single line of code. And especially if you have like uh, data on one server and you know separate servers or something like production and dev, mm -hmm. and you need to update something, you know, export import, boom, done. Like you don't have to. Worry yeah, if you need that. to, if there's an like initial data set that you always need to have. Perhaps you know, like a, a list of all the countries in the world, mm. because you're uh, a, a ge geography website or something. <laughs> yeah. You want to use Mongo import for that because that data is not going to change. At least, doesn't change that often. That's actually you brought up one of my favorite things about um, Mongo is just all the built-in geospatial stuff. I think it's awesome, and it's like a lot of you know the ability like for uh, Latin longitude, and it does all the near radius stuff right away for you, and you just yeah. you just say give me near like literally, it's like give me near this. Yeah, within so, X, and it'll go and do all that stuff for you. Yeah, it, um, it's definitely got some really cool geospatial uh, yeah. uh, features, uh, and you can set different documents and the the, the key value properties to be uh, geospatial or not. Yeah, and then yeah, it's actually a really cool feature. So, uh, why don't we uh, do a little bit of an interactive um, uh, shell demo? And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to point you to a page on GitHub that contains. A wonderful set of information, and of course, <laughs> it's called the 404. I, I have I never seen the this. URLs. Yeah. So here was my partner when we did the Mongo MVA, and he's got a great um, repository right here that contains lots of wonderful things, and one of them is uh, <laughs> <laughs> the module getting started, and he's got some great uh, things in. Uh, the interactive shell. So um, we're going to do a lot of different things really quickly here, but um, if you want to get more information about the different things that you can do with the shell, here's the great place to go. He even covers things like uh, queries directly from the shell, uh, which is pretty cool. So let's say that we wanted to um, show collections in a database. Uh, I can open up my command prompt, type in Mongo. All right, it's connected to the test database. I can say, hey, show. DB, all right, doesn't know how to show DB, of course, because we are already in the test DB, but we can show collections, and there are no collections. Right. Right, because this is a fresh database. Let's say that we wanted to add a collection, or in our case, we already have one, uh, and we wanted to find something, well, then we can do uh, DB dot, uh, the name of the collection, find one, it will return something like this. And uh, we'll actually play a little bit more with the interactive query when we actually start putting data into the uh, uh, Mongo database. Uh, but this is the query that you can use, and uh, there's, it's got some wonderful tools like help that shows you all the different things that you can do, uh, like show DB, show collections, even show the users that have access to the database, yeah. show the logs. Um, and it's got some great uh, other uh, things in there, like uh, how to actually list objects in a collection, like for example, named foo. Uh, how to find object, uh, objects, and as well as how to change and, and load things up there. But again, in the interactive shell there, it's just straight up JavaScript, right? It is straight and up it's, JavaScript. And yes. it's very just, you know, go to the collection, do what you need to do on that specific, it's like, choose your database, choose a collection, boom, 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 and you're good to go. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to the slide. Uh, specifically, let's talk about collections a little bit more detail. We keep uh, talking about them. Yeah. Uh, so basically, they are uh, a container 
uh, for a group of documents. Right. Right. So if a, a, a bunch of documents belong uh, together, mm -hmm. you want to put them in a collection. Right. All right. And databases can contain many of these. And um, they're similar to a table in SQL database, yeah. but they're a little bit different. And right. you could do, depending on how you structure your data, you can actually have um, a constantly growing number of collections, and that's okay in Mongo. That's actually fine. Yeah. It's a very uh, well supported use case. Yeah. All right. So um, let's say that uh, you were building um, a database that had uh, data per country. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can just put the collection as the name of the country, and then that's it. So you can keep adding countries as you get uh, more things in your database. Um, but that's one of the beauties about collections. You can have uh, hundreds hundreds of them, uh, and that's a supported use case, and you don't have to have um, separate tables for that. You can just leave all the documents in one place. Right. It's pretty cool. Uh, the next thing that you probably uh, want to know about is uh, the query objects. And uh, essentially what they are is this idea of using a query object to fetch requested data. Uh, they resemble objects that are already in the database. So when you do right. a query, all right, um, you want to pass Mongo something that looks like something in the database. And for example, that could be uh, an object that has an ID with the ID that you're looking for. Right. So when you're querying something, all right, you want to pass in an object with the type of stuff that matches what's already in the database. Yeah. So it could be an ID, a uh, key value, or it could be even first name uh, value, last name value. Right. Right. So key value, so an object that's just first name, last name, yeah. and it will find the document that matches the most. Right. Um, the, in the database. So that's how you can use the query object. Right. Uh, and you can specify the type of things in the query object as well. Uh, and you can also use it to update or delete data right. as well. So not only just finding things. Um, now, the other thing that you probably want to do is uh, use projections as well. And this is what's uh, used to filter the data that you, that you want, right? Uh, it's very similar to what the select does right. in, SQL, in SQL queries. Um, and it takes similar forms to uh, the query objects that we're going to actually use in Node. So you'll see an example of a query object where I have the ID the, of the uh, document that I'm looking for. So let's get right to it and start by first showing you how to add MongoDB to your Node project. Ooh. All right. So once you've already got Node in uh, MongoDB installing and running, you uh, want to go into, um, in this case, we want to go actually into number 13. All right. So once I'm there, you'll notice I have my standard app.js, package.json. Uh, to actually install Mongo, you can do something simple like npm install MongoDB. And if you pass in a dash dash save, it'll actually add it to the package.json. Now, if I take a look at my package.json, I already have all of this stuff in there. So if I f flip over here and go to package.json, MongoDB is already in there. And a specific version is specified, all right, because the API does tend to change between different versions. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, what we're doing is we're adding this um, caret character. Yeah. And what this is going to say is that, hey, use Mongo 2.0 and any other advanced version after that. So right. uh, something you think above 2.0.39. So it could be 2.0.45 or something. OK. All right. So um, as always, I want to do an npm install. This is going to do some fancy work. It's going to go uh, create a node module and get me MongoDB. We need Fantastic. A we need a running person for the icon, <laughs> so the flipping thing with someone running. So NPM is, I think, open source, so you can actually just go ahead and pull a pull request for that. Hmm. <laughs> uh, be right back. Be right back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So once MongoDB is installed, um, we can actually just require MongoDB and get started. So that's actually our next demo, which is how do you actually create and update documents? Uh, so first thing that you want to do right at the top is, as we mentioned earlier, uh, import the language driver. So that's what we just npm installed. Uh, it's going to be a require a MongoDB. Now we're going to go right ahead in there and actually get the Mongo client object and set that as Mongo client, because we're going to be using this a lot. And the other thing that we might want to do is also require a search so that we can do some assertions to make sure things are correct. And again, we're going to require uh, the object ID, which is another thing that we will use a lot. All right, cool. The next thing that you want to do is create the connection URL for your MongoDB server. Now, if you were using something like MongoLab or, or something that's running on another machine, mm -hmm. you probably want to change this to be like, OK, this is not the right uh, host name. This is, uh, it might be the IP of the server, the port that it's actually running on. Right. Uh, but for our case, it's going to be localhost and the default port. 
And it's a little bit uh, interesting because uh, it uses the same URI scheme as you know, you're know you well known on the internet. So yep. instead of HTTP here, we're gonna put MongoDB. And then the database is actually gonna be the slash test. Yes. So that's what we're saying. We're saying connect to the local MongoDB server slash test. Okay, this is gonna be stored in the URL variable. And that uh, port number 27017, is that like the default kind of de facto what it uses until you otherwise uh, specify otherwise? That's correct. So if you start Mongo without specifying the port, it'll yeah. just use that one. Gotcha. But you can actually specify another one. Uh, let's say that uh, you want maybe a port 80 or something, or a port that was already open on your machine, mm -hmm. or or even if you wanted to just like uh, have a little bit of extra security by uh, changing the port completely so that people don't know that we're, what's behind that port, because yep. 27017 is fairly well known that it's a Mongo yep. uh, database. Perhaps you want to change that. Um, but for the moment, uh, this is exactly... Uh, fine, because we're running this all locally on our machine, and we don't are not exposing this to the rest of the internet. So uh, you can't have access to my database. <laughs> ha! I feel like that's a challenge. It is. A <laughs> <laughs> Let's see uh, how this goes. <laughs> yeah, maybe we shouldn't challenge the internet to no, find ways to no. <laughs> get into our MVA studio right no, now. No. <laughs> all right. So the next thing that you'll want to do is uh, connect to the, using the Mongo client to that URL. Now. Uh, this client uses um, callbacks quite heavily, mm -hmm. but there are other ones that don't use callbacks. So you can uh, check out other client libraries out there that use promises style um, style um, of uh, programming. Uh, in fact, actually, Mongo client does use promises style, but we're going to use the callback one because that's the one that we explained. So if you're curious what promises are, you can look them up. Mm -hmm. uh, for the moment, we will focus on using the callback API. Uh, so we'll want to do a connect with the URL that we just specified. And we're going to pass in a function that accepts an error. And this is something a pattern is fairly common in Node. Yeah. All right, all the callbacks typically have error first, mm -hmm. and then the result of something, mm -hmm. right? And the result here will be the database. All right. So here we are. If we connect, this should be able to connect and actually do something. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this just to show you that it works. But I'm going to put a return so that it doesn't do anything else. All it'll do is just connect and exit. So if I do that, and I go here, node app.js, it will connect and exit. Bum, bum, bum. Am I in the wrong folder? Or did I not do something right? Oh, no, it actually did work. Yep. Uh, but because we never removed the callback, it never did actually leave. So cool. But if awesome. I wanted to, I can actually check. Connection accepted. It's open. Something's going on. It did connect to the MongoDB database. Awesome. OK. And that's handy to have that kind of command uh, open anyways. And you can see, oh, I did connect. Like, yeah, I, I know that, that happened or whatever. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. It, it <laughs> Probably existed. should have said print something first <laughs> and like return. <laughs> Silly me, of course. <laughs> Doing things live always. Um, all right, cool. So. Uh, I guess the first thing that we'll probably want to do is create a collection uh, that has bank data. Yeah, let's do it. Perhaps, right? So yeah. uh, we can actually do that once we have the database just by going db.collection bank data. All right. And this will, if that collection doesn't exist, it will create it. Create it. Yeah. Uh, we're going to assign it to bank data. And then that collection, we're going to say, hey, insert one thing into that uh, collection. So we're going to have a document. All right. And it's represented by a object. See, that's an object right there. Uh, if you want to make it clearer, you can just put that right there. So that's a, a JSON object. All right. Uh, we're going to say first name, me, last name, me. Uh, I'm going to give myself a lot of US dollars, which I don't actually have, unfortunately. Because <laughs> you're Canadian. Because I'm Canadian. <laughs> um, and uh, so what we're doing here is we're actually embedding another document in a key here. So accounts, mm -hmm. giving it an array of other documents. Now, in a traditional SQL database, you might have had this in another table. Yeah. Right? So you would have had the accounts table and the, 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 the user tables. In our case, we're putting it all in one place because that's where we want to get it from. Yep. Uh, so it's all there, and it's uh, quite straightforward. It also kind of shows you that, like, you can put uh, your data in any structure as long as it's, you know, valid JSON, pretty much? Yes, it's pretty much valid So, you JSON. know, you, you could totally change it up or bring it back from an API and cache it or whatever you want to do. Yeah. And it's, you don't have to really work with it too much. It's just going to... Yeah, and, that, and that's the, the really nice thing about NoSQL databases is that yeah. uh, they're actually 
uh, very, uh, very flexible in the sense that there is no strict table format. So you can change how your documents are actually represented in your database uh, at any time. And you could update things, you could change things, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. And hence why it's, uh, these types of databases are very popular among startups yeah. right, that are trying to grow and don't really know what their data will actually end up looking like. Yeah. So with a, a very uh, flexible uh, um, type of database, no SQL database, they don't actually have to worry too much about yeah. that. All right, cool. So once we've actually inserted, uh, you'll notice that insert one also takes a callback. Yep. All right, so hence why we're slowly getting into our pyramid of callbacks. <laughs> All right, so if you take a look at the code, you'll notice it's Come with us. In Come with us on this in. journey. <laughs> and it goes in so far that it actually needs to put a scroll bar <laughs> to go in. All right, cool. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, with this callback, we're going to take the op result. All right, and what the, this is going to say is that it inserted a document. So if I go ahead and I run this now, it should say connected correctly to the server, inserted, this is the document that we inserted, and you'll notice it added something that wasn't actually in the document at first, and that is the object ID. Mm. Now, this is going to come in really handy when we try to find objects later, because right. uh, that's how they're represented, right? So, um, we did this very simple insert one operation, we got a callback, in this callback it, we wrote that we inserted this operation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually take back this object that it was returned to us mm -hmm. in op results. So when we when we went ahead and printed that, uh, this is what we actually ended up printing in right. ops result. This object sitting right here at uh, the first uh, index uh, of our array. Uh, we're going to take this as and uh, call it the updated person. Mm -hmm. And it's updated from this person because it has an object ID. Right. Right. So it is different from that one up there, but it's the same data. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, I want to actually give myself a little bit more money. <laughs> I'm trying to buy way too many Teslas or something. <laughs> All uh, way the too Teslas. many cars. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is that in this updated person, I'm going to say, hey, go into my account, account zero, uh, add some more things into my balance, and then I'm gonna, I want to go update it. I feel like you should not be the banker in Monopoly. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I... Continue. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So once I've updated my person, I can actually go ahead and re-put that in the collection. So I'm going to take the collection, bank data, and I'm going to go update one. Now, the thing that I'm going to say is, hey, I'm actually going to create an object that looks like the object I want to update. So in this case, all right, this object will look like it in the sense that it'll have the same ID. So if you remember, that was my query object. Mm -hmm. We're putting it right here at the beginning. Then I'm passing in the data or the actual object that I am doing. So like if I'm updating uh, just the account balance, I could have removed everything else. I just left the account balance mm -hmm. uh, and, and put this in the updated person. But instead, I'm just going to update the whole thing. Yep. And I'm going to give it a write concern of one. And what that means is that it's going to write it uh, right away to the database and not gonna and it's not gonna return my callback until it's done writing right right and of course I have to pass in yet another callback right okay so if I do this in theory here's our journey when my callback gets back in all right it should say successfully updated a number of documents all right yeah. and of course you can update more than one now because we're using an object query right here yep if we weren't using a unique ID, we were using perhaps first name, last name, it would yeah. be updating everything in that document, in that collection, that had the same first name, last name. Which could be totally handy if you, imagine you misspelled something, and you're like, I want to just correct yeah. all of those items or that misspelling across the board, for yeah. example. But of course, you probably don't want to do that too often, right? You no. want to have unique IDs in your, in your documents. Right. So that way you don't end up docu uh, updating the balance of two John Smiths, yeah. right? When in fact they're two different John Smiths, right? So you got to be careful how you do this. I um, make sure that your query parameters are specific enough to the data that you have yeah. that you out actually update the correct document. If or if you're planning on updating one or just multiple that are the same. Yeah, you, I mean Similar. you see the flexibility there. Yeah, it yeah. is actually extremely flexible. Um, so it's like select and select many. Uh, so yeah. there you go. So now of course we get a callback. We see if there's an error. If not, we return the console error. And uh, we will successfully say that we updated. Uh, now, if I actually run this, or I have already run this, it would say successfully updated one person document. Great. So now, why don't we show you? We've already showed you how to do create. We've already showed you how to do updates. Mm -hmm. Why don't we show you how to find things? Ooh. 
All right, cool. So again, <laughs> very similar to updating, finding uses a query object as well. Right. So here we are, we're going to find one, okay? And because we're going to say find one, it'll actually uh, only return one object. If right. you remove this and say find, it will return multiple All objects that matches that query parameter. But in our case, it will only ever find one because we're using the ID as the query parameter, right? which means that it will, because the ID is unique for that collection, it will only return one ID, period. Uh, and so if you do find one, ID with updated person, uh, again, we have to give it a callback. In this case, it's going to return the document itself that it found. So if we do that, we can again print out if there's an error, and then print out the retrieved person's first name and last name. So if I go back to my console, whoops, wrong one, here we are. Retrieve person is Rami Sayar, the same uh, document that we entered into our collection. Right. Right at the top, right there. Excellent. Now let's say that uh, I wanted to change my bank account uh, to a different bank. I can actually remove the document that we just inserted. And to do that, it's actually fairly straightforward, very similar. We have a query parameter that is ID and updated person. And then in this case, it will actually return the amount of times it deleted something. Okay, so it'll return the count. Mm -hmm. All right, and then if we, everything works all well, if there was an error, close the database. If there wasn't an error, close the database anyways, because that's the last thing that we're going to do. And don't forget to close the database, otherwise you end up with all these connections that are open. Um, yeah. And uh, if we run this again, uh, it should say, hey, but before we actually... Uh, before we actually uh, remove it, maybe we should print out the things. And that's what we're doing right here. So if we do uh, remove, uh, before we remove, it'll actually print out the types of accounts that I have, and then it will successfully say delete, delete the documents. Right. So if you were to go back into the interactive console and do a search for that item, for example, you shouldn't be able to find it. No. Right. If I do a Mongo, all right, and I say show collections, it'll say bank data. If I do db.bankdata.find1 without any query, it'll say null no. because there are no documents left in my database. There you go. In my collection. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That was really quick um, and certainly a teensy bit quicker than we thought it would be. Uh, so let's go back to the slides and... Uh, I think when it comes to like working with Mongo and, and that idea in Node is that uh, the basics, like we showed some of the basics going yeah. on. Um, it actually does a lot more than that. It does right. some really interesting things like MapReduce. So let's say that you had gigabytes of data. You can actually map a function right. to all these collections and then reduce to find the ones that are just match that mapping. Right. All right so it's right. pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And, and again, like in terms of using Mongo and getting started with it, it's like, I mean, I think personally, I don't know how you approach it, but I know when I first had to start learning it, I used it to aggregate APIs. Oh yeah. Um, so it's always that's like, that's give that's us good. like a, give us the last thing that happened, um, or you know, use the Instagram API to get uh, the last post with the, all the info on it, right? And it was like something you'd run every once in a while, and you put in a database, and then you would use that on your site to actually show things, versus always hitting up an API, you know, or that kind of thing, if you can, right? Right. Depends on the on the EULA and all the rest of it. But I remember it was the first time, and I was like, okay, I just went into the interactive console, got used to it. Uh, wasn't afraid of it anymore, or started playing, learned all the queries because you just have to get the syntax down, I think, mm -hmm. right? And then you're kind of, you're, you're good and you're golden um, at that point. Um, do you find that when you're working with uh, these kind of websites, are you like looking at your Mongo going, because right now we're working locally, right? So do you find that when you deploy all this stuff and let's say you're putting up in Azure or using Mongo yep. Lab or whatever, are you like, like oh, here's my my MongoDB, it's somewhere else entirely. Like it's not on the same system, it's not on the same VM, it's not nothing. Yeah, like, yeah it actually does happen fairly frequently, especially yep. if you're using services like uh, Mongo Lab. They're, yeah. They have their own system, so their own URLs, their own IP addresses, so it's going to be pointed out there. Right. Um, because MongoDB for me is so easy to run, like it's just really simple. Yeah. A simple, quick uh, app get install or a simple uh, installing file. I actually, uh, unless I'm uh, building a production system, yeah. so if I'm building a small, simple node app for myself, I actually tend to just run it locally. Yeah. And then just use it right there. Yeah, I, I do the same. I know working on a team, we would go and basically set up our server and we had our, uh, you know, our URI that we share amongst and it was just easy that way because all the data was always up to date. You didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you're running Mongo in production, there are different uh, approaches to that. You perhaps, maybe sometimes you will want to shard and 
yeah. and have different Mongo instances. So you'll have yeah. a little load balancer in between, and, and, and there's different articles online that will show you how to do that. Yeah. Uh, if you're building a very simple Node app that you don't expect to be scaling past like I don't know a gigabyte of data, then you can even easily run that locally. You'll handle it very easily, uh, and um, lots of great stuff that you can do with Mongo actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's got yeah. this really cool API for streaming, too. So we, uh, we talked about node streaming earlier in the other modules. Mm -hmm. So Mongo actually has these um, uh, collections and these cursors that will constantly send you new documents for every single time that it's inserted into a collection. That's cool. Yeah, so these, these types of cursors that you can create that instead of just uh, returning a specific query, it will yeah. just keep the connection open. And because node has... This callback mechanism, this event-based, uh, event-styled programming, yeah. it actually makes it really easy. Yeah, so if someone's uh, to-do list, the famous yeah. to-do list, so it's like everyone's like, after Hello World, it's a to-do list. But if, example, you know, yeah. if we're collaborating on it and you've added something, that's that idea. It might be keeping that, like, what are the tasks open? It might be just filtering in, you know, and you yeah. start to see how that comes across. Yeah, very cool stuff. So I wonder if there is uh, any question on the chat room. Oh, I should check. Let me check. Hold on. Uh, here we go. If you don't go. have a question, put it up now. Ha-ha. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, nope. I don't see anything Mongo related. Just a little bit about, uh, nope. That's it. Well, I think we can, we can, okay. uh, close it out. Um, yeah, so we'll, uh, be going to a meal break. Right yeah. Now, and really? then we'll be back roughly in an hour. Yeah. And, uh, we'll be showcasing how to do, um, Front end. A little bit more front end. More front end stuff yep. with Jade. And uh, we're also going to be covering um, more how to debug and deploy Node. Yep. Especially try to do some advanced debugging, show you how you can get the variables that are in there, uh, the callbacks and stuff like that. And then uh, finally, we're going to cap the last module with some Azure web jobs. Yay! All right, so stay tuned. Please come back after the break. And uh, looking forward to uh, showing you how to do all that awesome stuff with Node.js. <laughs> Your code with Node.js. My name is Rami Sarah, and I'm with Stacey Mulcahy today. And uh, this is the fourth module, but we'll be focusing on building front end uh, front ends <laughs> for your Express <laughs> web app. <laughs> all the front ends. All the front ends. Every single front end. All the front ends of the world. All right. Um, <laughs> anyways, so uh, welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Um, we've been focused a lot on Node.js on the back end. I mean, we've touched on a couple of really interesting things that Express does, though. It lets you do this templating. Right. Just, uh, you have different templates that you could use and stuff like that. And we saw that we had uh, talked about Jade. Yeah, right? but never really talked about it. We're not really talked about it. So I guess <laughs> we're going to change that this module, the, right? ele the elephant in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So uh, I guess uh, maybe we can go through an overview. Sure. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Jade, the uh, introduction of Jade, what is Jade, why was uh, Jade uh, constructed the way it was? What inspired this change? Um, I guess we'll also cover uh, Jade templates. What are the specific language features of, of Jade? And uh, finally, we'll uh, do some, some good demos. And then at some point, we're going to implement Bootstrap as well. Yeah. All right, awesome. I mean, I think every web app at this point has to have Bootstrap in it at some point. I, I feel like it's just like the de facto UI of the web now. It's the design. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's, 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 yeah. They all look the same. <laughs> All right, cool. So, um, well, can you take it away, Stacy? Sure. So, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, working with Jade and uh, how Jade templates actually work. And so, when you um, install Express out of the box, and you basically, the way you saw that we did it, Express Generator, you know, it created that whole uh, scaffold, a whole Express uh, application for you, its default templating, um, templating engine is going to be Jade. And so, that's what we're showing today. Jade's fairly popular. You do, like we've mentioned in the past, have other options for templating. And uh, there's a couple reasons why you would be, you know, templating with Jade if we want to take a look at that. And so, you know, templating uh, with Jade is, is basically to simplify HTML. You don't want to have to worry about opening your tags and closing your tags. It's in theory should make you a little bit more efficient, a little quicker because you're not worrying about all those kind of things. Um, and there is a syntax that, you know, Jade has, like all the other languages that map directly to the HTML. And so when you see it and you see it opening up a file, it does look a little bit different. Um, and sometimes the first time you do, you kind of have to wrap your head around it a little bit. Um, it adds the ability to kind of, you know, separate and extend your uh, HTML. And so, you know, 
that whole reduce, reuse, recycle, whatever the whole, you know, holy trinity of, of code is. Um, you want to make sure that you, you know, you're not repeating uh, code unnecessarily. So if you have, uh, you know, a chunk of HTML, for example, or even a page for, you know, another page or whatnot, um, you don't want to rewrite it everywhere. It, especially if you're going to change something in one place, you want to make sure that it's in uh, one place you're using a template. Um, and again, I think the previous example I gave was uh, like a product page where you have a picture of a product with a title and the information and maybe a rating system and all that stuff. I mean, fundamentally, that's kind of templated. It's going to look the same for 20 items on the page. Uh, certain items out of it are going to change based on the data that you feed it. And that's like a perfect example of when you use templating. Um, it does make sure that your HTML is, when you generate the HTML from Jade, that it's clean. Uh, sometimes if you're writing complex stuff and you've got divs within divs, you might forget to close something. Some browsers are more forgiving than others. And sometimes you don't even catch that um, until you're like, oh, I've got a bug in a certain browser. So it does ensure that you're you know, generating clean HTML. Um, and it allows you to, you know, dynamically populate those items, uh, you know, inserting data into them through the templates. So, you know, that's kind of the basics of Jade and working with Jade. And we're going to take a look at um, just a, a little bit of what the syntax looks like. And I'm also going to pull up the site to give you a sense of like what um, what the options are and documentation. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that templating with Jade um, on the left is basically what you see in Jade, and then on the right is its output. And so if you're looking at Jade on the left, you have your simple tags. And so, you know, a div, we all, I hope we all know what a, a div right. are, right? And on the output, you see what it does is it actually creates that proper, uh, cleanly written HTML, the div, it's open, it's closed. And then you'll notice in Jade on the left that it's using uh, spaces, um, to kind of differentiate uh, hierarchy. And so because the address is spaced over, um, you know, underneath the div, you can see on the right in the output that it's within that item. And so you have to be very careful with uh, Jade. I think that's one of the one things, especially with templating in general, a space in the wrong area, uh, you're using tabs instead of spaces or spaces instead of tabs, you're using both or any of those kind of things, I feel like can kind of trip you up a little. And so you got to be fairly, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, careful about that when you're working with it. So doesn't, uh, doesn't it uh, make your code a lot cleaner, though, if, you, if you're forced to have this nice spacing? I mean, when you look at a J template for me, yeah, I, I feel like I can look at it, even if it's complex, and I get a sense of exactly how things, the hierarchy, where they should be, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think most of the HTML developers, too, when they're writing just standard HTML, they'll go in and they'll indent and clean it up and do all that uh, prettifying, I guess. Prettifying. Prettifying yeah. um, of their code, you know, but you definitely want to make sure that you can see that hierarchy and, and understand where things are nested between. So... You know, if we're looking at those items, you know, for example, like we showed with the spaces, you just got to be a little bit careful of that. Now, if we're looking at, uh, you know, templating with Jade, if we're looking on the left, um, you start to get into things like basic tags, fine, but you're going to want to add things like attributes, or you might want to be adding classes or those kind of things. And so, again, in the green on the left is going to be uh, written in Jade, and the output, the HTML created from it, will be written on the right. And so the tags with the attributes on the left, um, you'll see, for example, we've got a, an H1 and we're giving it an ID. And so that attributes actually, you know, within those brackets um, and the ID is set to title and, you know, welcome to Jade, for example. And so that becomes its attribute and you see it on the right. And so you'll notice that there's just a space after that attribute bracket on the left, welcome to Jade, and then, you know, it's close at H1. And so you've written a lot less code, if you want to put it that way, uh, you know, a little shorter, a little cleaner, and it does all the output for you on the right. Now, if we're looking at the next one, we've got the button, and you'll see, uh, you know, the idea of adding um, another attribute there with the class. There's a data action. And you can see how, again, um, that button with the be awesome underneath and tabbed in, it's within that button item. You can see the output on the right. And so these are a couple of fairly you know, basic examples of, um, for example, tags with attributes in Jade. So if we want to continue, 
um, and look at, uh, you know, more complex things. Again, some of the things that you'll see at the very beginning are fairly simplistic. Um, you know, how do I add a, a, an anchor? How do I add a, a class to these items? But, you know, there is a point in time that you're going to get uh, a little more complex. And so one of the nice things is Jade uh, supports, I would call it, um, template inheritance. And so it does this by giving you two things, the extends and block keyword. And so the extends keyword allows a template to extend or a layout or a parent template. And it can override certain predefined blocks of content. And the block keyword allows you to establish a block to replace. And so when you think about this, and we'll show examples of this, this becomes really, really awesome because for example, you might want to, we need the awesome counter up, even though it's Rami's thing and not mine. Um, you need, you need, uh, you can start to think about certain, um, certain templates that might just have a slight variation. And so, uh, you know, I, I often, again, I'm going to come back to that product example of an item that has certain things. Well, maybe uh, you're going to have just a different view on it. Maybe one's going to have, um, has it been marked down? Maybe it's going to be uh, slightly less information depending on the page, um, that kind of thing. So you can start to use these templates and now extend them and overwrite or add things if you want. Um, that you might need. And so when you think about it, you might have a base template for a page and you might have another page that extends that template um, or another J template that extends it. And maybe just on that one page, maybe it's a game section, for example, of your site, you're going to add oh, you know, some new JavaScripts that you need just for that page, right? So if you only go to the games page, I'm going to add uh, you know, a couple of libraries, jQuery, whatever. And maybe it's just on that page. Maybe it's used nowhere else on any of the other pages. And that's a perfect example because you're not forcing the user to download all that stuff all over the place. And you're using templates in a really good way. So we're going to take a look at uh, using Jade templates, and I'm going to kind of walk through um, and kind of show you a little bit about, you know, again, that basic Express app that, you know, you can go in and scaffold out really quickly. Um, and then I'm going to show you, you know, where does the, the template engine get set? Okay, let's look at Jade templates. Let's look at a couple of different ones. Let's look at some of the keywords. Um, let's look at how you do some of the fundamental things in a Jade template. So I'm going to open up my code as always here. And is my font big enough? Should I make it bigger? Okay, perfect. I got the okay on my font, so I'm going to leave it as is. And again, this, uh, this folder that I'm working in, which is 14 underscore advanced Jade, um, was just created using the Express Generator, did it very quickly. We added a couple routes. We'll go through you know, what was added. Um, but if we look you know, through here and we kind of scroll down, you're going to see the view engine setup, line 14 to 16 here. And so you'll see, uh, and you know, we had pointed this out before, this is basically setting where the views are going to be uh, pulled from. And so it's giving that directory and the name of what it should be pulling. So this is where it's going to look for any kind of templates whatsoever. It should be in this views folder, which maps to here. And then in the next one, the app set, we're saying the view engine, use Jade. So if you wanted to go and use a different view uh, a templating system of that sort, you can start to change it here. And, you know, we mentioned some other ones like um, anything, anything with a facial, facial hair, hair expression. <laughs> handlebars, handlebars mustache. mustache, you know, there's a bunch of different ones. Again, it's whatever you're kind of used to. It's, they all offer, I feel like, and you can correct me if you're wrong or if I'm wrong, <laughs> if you're wrong, um, but I feel like they all kind of, they kind of offer a lot of the similar um, uh, capabilities, but some of them are just work a little bit differently, or there might be something nice about this that's different than that, and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and if you, what if, what if you don't want to use the template engine? Can you also just use straight HTML? Yeah. All right. Great. Done. But you know, again, the whole idea behind templating is that if you're writing something really simple and you just want to write HTML, yeah. go nuts. But if you if you are writing something, and uh, your favorite example of the day, mine is product, yours is blogs. If we're talking about blogs, you know, you think about all those things that you're going to just use over and over and over again. So why would you have redundant code? Exactly. Why not just you template it? You definitely want to have a template. Yeah, totally. Your footer, your you know, every, all that kind of stuff that you might be using. And so, you know, to use uh, any of those templates, you set this. 
And then what we want to do is let's just take a quick look at what Jade looks like. And if we go into the views here, and you'll see we have uh, index and we have layout. Typically what happens is that you get this layout jade and it's your, I don't know, I'm gonna call it your, your master layout, right? And it's your, the one that you're most likely to inherit from. And in this case, you'll see here the layout jade. And again, you could call it anything else. You can have things extend from other templates. But here you see that we've you know, listed the HTML, right? And I have a block head in here, for example. Anytime you see a block in front of an option, you can always say to yourself, oh, that might either be replaced, changed, or added to. That's the ability for me to extend that however I want to do it, whether it's overwriting it or whether it's adding to it or whatnot. And so, you know, you can start to see that this is where you're going to put in um, your links. And again, if you follow through, you'll see there's spaces and everything's tabbed in. And so a link, again, it's just kind of a keyword and everything's in brackets. And so you're gonna put in, you know, what is it, style sheet, where's the reference, where am I pulling it from? You know, all those kind of things. And so in here, for example, and we'll show you uh, in the future, uh, demo a little bit about Bootstrap, but you'll see that we're including these things. And then for example, body, it's just a block content. So at some point, something's probably gonna overwrite this, right? And so if you're looking at Jade, again, it's very, very, uh, completely sensitive to, you know, uh, spacing in or tabbing. You've got to be very careful. An extra space will basically just throw the renderer out. You'll get a nice big uh, error in the browser that's just giving you like line whatever, whatever, and it just shouts at you. So, you know, I feel like starting out with Jade, you, you experience that a little bit. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, layout is the base one. I don't think I really need to save that, but that's okay. And if you go into, you know, for example, your index page, you know, you're gonna see a couple things here. And so you're starting to see other keywords, extends. Uh, you're starting to see like a class that I applied here, for example. And so, you know, all these things that you can do in terms of how to format things, how to add classes, you can find actually on the Jade site, which I'm gonna quickly pull up because I think that that will be a great way to look at this. And so if you go to the Jade site for the no template engine, there's a big reference here. I'm gonna get rid of the tags, or we can keep it there. You'll see language reference. And language reference will give you everything that you need about the language. And I spend so much time here because I feel like every time I pick it up, um, I always wanna do something a little bit more and I've gotta figure out how to do it. And so you'll start to see, they'll have all the examples of you know, tag attributes, um, oh, comments, because everyone wants everything nicely commented, right? And so you'll see how it kind of puts the stuff out. So this is like content in between it and how it's generating those things. And so in Jade, you know, in terms of all these items, you can start to see uh, all the things that you can do from extending things, conditionals, um, you know, inheritance, for example, which is kind of what we're covering. So your, your kind of go-to thing, I think, here when it comes to Jade is um, A, get using it, <laughs> you know, struggle with it a little bit, um, and then use some of this reference material to help you get going a little quicker. The other thing I've noted is that there is a fairly big community around Jade or any of the templating engines. So if you feel like you're, uh, you know, you're stuck on something, it's not rendering properly, you can't get it to work, whatever, or you're trying to do something a little bit more complex, I feel like you're gonna find that answer. Uh, Stack Overflow, just generally someone's got a blog post, any of those kind of things. So just wanted to point that out as a reference to you, and we're gonna go back to code. Um, and I'm gonna kind of just walk through what we're doing here a little bit. Um, and explain these things a little bit more in depth. And so, again, just wanted to point out, so we've got our layout. If we think of this as like uh, our super uh, layout that everything's gonna extend from, um, you know, our index.jade, it's extending layout. And so basically it's saying, I'm taking everything from layout, which was all of the HTML, you know, the, the, everything in the head, all that kind of thing. And then it's defining block content. And that means it's gonna replace that block of content there that was in there previously. And just to kind of show that again, it was just right here. So it's just gonna replace this entirely. Um, and again, you can also append if you want. And so block of content, you'll see we have the H1 
and this is going to be um, you know set to the title and then we have welcome to title and so these are variables that we can start to actually populate from uh, node into the template and it basically gets injected into the template um, and we're just going to set this up a little bit explain this and then show how that data actually gets set in and then here's an example of an a tag this is going to be a class because I'm going dot Stacy, and then sorry. Is that a shorthand for uh, in in Jade? Yep, that's shorthand. Yeah. So you could also put it in uh, the, the the brackets, right? As a you, class. You can do it in the brackets uh, the way that was shown that we showed a couple slides back. Yeah. Um, so you can do class is equal to Stacy. All right. Um, and you can also, if you wanted this to actually be an ID, you could do like that. Sorry. And you could put that beside it. Very cool. So you have a couple options there. And again, this is just an href where it's going to, and here's the, the link tag, right? And very, very simple. Um, again, these examples are fairly simple. Um, and if we go into our routes, I'll show you a more advanced example, um, but I want to show you the routes here. If we go into the routes, and you'll see this index here. So index route, Again, in our app JS, this is going to be our you know top level entry point in. You will see here the router that we created. Um, it is going to get that basic you know index route, and you'll see that it's rendering again. Before we had done like a, a res.json, we'd shown this before, but it's actually rendering something. And what it's rendering is it's looking for that template, and so it's saying I'm looking for the index template. You'll notice that there's no dot anything here. And you'll notice that throughout today, right? We don't have an express.js, for example. You know, it's all that stuff. It, what it does in the back end is it maps all the directories and it assumes, right, all of the extensions based on the settings you give it. And so it's looking for the template that's index. And then you can pass it a data object. And so this can be any kind of format you want. Maybe at this point you went to an API, maybe you went to the dogs API that we had before and we brought all that stuff back and now we're you know, taking this object and it's gonna now render this template and it's gonna inject this data where it should be. And so in your template, you'll see that there are, you know, for example, options for where this should, had, uh, should land, for example. So let's bring this up. Um, actually, what I'm going to do here is I am going to run this from code. So a lot of the stuff that we've been doing today, um, because we put everything, we opened up the whole project folder, right? So we have right. several projects in it. Yeah. Um, what I did here is I just opened up the single project and we're going to show you debugging in the next uh, module, but I'm just going to show you kind of like straight up how you can just launch it from here if you don't necessarily want to open up your, your command. And so you can hit this little debug guy at the bottom. And if you don't have um, what's a, considered like a launch profile here, uh, it's a basic JSON file that gets created. Um, and if you don't have one, I'll ask you to create it. And it'll, it'll pretty much help you fill it in based on what it sees in your directory. But you know, again, if you're someone who's running something like uh, Gulp and you're running something that's, uh, we mentioned before, uh, always updating your node and restarting it or something along those lines, and you wanna run a different process or attach to a different process, you can. But for me, in this case, I'm using the you know, NPN start and I'm just you know, going to the program here there's not much else to set, but you'll see the configurations. And so there's a bunch of options that you have here and they're fairly well commented. So you can get a sense of what these items are gonna be. And then all you need to do is just basically hit start. And so the debugger is gonna listen on a port, but it's also gonna look at that uh, item that I wanted it to start and it's gonna launch it based on its defaults that was set. And so, you know, NPM start, the default, unless I specify other, otherwise, is going to be uh, localhost 3000. And so I can go back here and I should be able to refresh this page. Moment of truth, right? Yes. Oh, Whew. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You love me. You really love me. Um, and you'll see that this works, and you'll start to see that if I go to that route, which was places, right, 
you will see a bunch of different templates being used. And so again, at that index page that we did, we said, you know, here we go, Express, welcome to Express Places. Well, if we go back to this template and maybe, maybe we just modify it a little. So I'm gonna stop this so I don't have to worry about it. And I'm gonna go uh, back into the index, right? And I'm going to, actually, let's just change the data we send it. Instead of Express, let's write, Rami is sleeping, <laughs> okay? He's really not. Well, he might be. I don't know. I can't tell. Does it? Can you sleep with your eyes open? Is that like a hidden talent? No, I don't know. Can I endorse you on the on LinkedIn for that? You should try. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite pastimes. Um, so I changed that title, and again, we can go and launch this. You know, bring this up, and hope. Come on, you can do it. It'll take a second. There you go. And you can see that wherever that variable is used, it's going to be changed, right? So we can start to add more things here and we can add, uh, whether it's text, like a title, maybe we're going to add, um, you know, certain variables that are like true, false that we might want to check. We can do all that kind of stuff here. And so that's the start of, you know, very simple. But if we look at places, that second route, You'll see that that looks much different, right? There's a lot more going on there. Yeah, it's crazy. It's very overwhelming. <laughs> very overwhelming. We need some UX here. <laughs> we need got, some design talk help. To some of our design help, yeah. Yeah, we need some design help. But I actually created this template to give you a sense of, you know, a couple more things that you can do that might be a little bit more complex. And so, if we go and we look at that places, let's look at the route first of all. Okay, so if we go and we look at the route, you'll see that I am rendering, instead of the index template, I'm choosing a different template here. And so I have a places template here, and I'm choosing the places template. And then I'm passing in a bunch of different things. Okay, and so I have a title with a value. I have a, like a Boolean here has places true. You know, you could put anything that you want there. And I have places. This could be your dogs, for example. And for example, I did them, you know, kind of structured them like this. Again, you could do it any way that you want to set them up, but I have a name and a URL, you know, a little bit more so to, uh, associative, like when the number one has an object, number two has an object, that kind of thing. Something just a little bit more complex. Is, is that so that you can iterate over it in order? So, exactly. So for here, the reason why I did that is if once I do that for each, you'll see in that thing, it definitely comes in order. Once I take that out, uh, it just ends up, you know what I mean? As soon as you take that number out, boom, it's not going to necessarily be in order. So it really depends on what you're doing there. Now, if we look, so we have our data, right? Kind of makes sense, it's just a set of places. And um, if we look into our places, you're going to start to see a whole bunch of things, and I kind of want to walk through here. So I have extends layout, so we're taking that layout. Again, layout is the one that gave us all the Chrome of this page, the HTML, you know, our header script, everything else. But you'll see that I have block append head. And so what I'm doing there is because I, in the index page here, I have, sorry, layout page, I have block head. This means it can be added to, replace, change, whatever you want to do here. I basically am saying, take that block and append it. So take that block name head and append this to it. And what I'm doing here, for example, is just adding in an extra script. So this is where you might add in something that's just for this page. Maybe uh, on this page you have a carousel and it needs a specific, uh, you know, uh, carousel script for it. Uh, and you're only going to include it here, for example, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a page that only a mobile device is ever going to see. I don't know. You might just add in stuff that only belongs here. And so you can do, uh, you can just go append head, for example. You can get rid of the block and go append, append head as well. Uh, there's prepend as well. So this is a nice way of not modifying a whole bunch of stuff and just adding it where you need it. And if we go down here, you'll see block content. Um, and again, I'm replacing what's in there. And there's a couple things going on. So we have the H1, and the H1 is going to be equal to the title variable. And then we have H2, and I gave it an ID, for example. So that's shorthand. You saw shorthand for class. This is a shorthand for an ID, right? And so in this case, maybe I'm giving this item an ID, and I'm going to style it with CSS after. And then 
for example, doing things like, uh, you know, links in a paragraph can get a little weird sometimes in templates. Things in, uh, usually embedded within things, um, sometimes templating can be what trips you up. And so in here, uh, we have this kind of syntax, which allows you to escape through and you go here and you add in your link and your space. And again, you'll notice for example, that there's a space there. And so even if you can't see it, it's still gonna render that space for you. Um, and this is how, for example, you would do a link within a paragraph, which I remember the first time I had to do that, I was like, how does that even work? Um, and then you go down and we have a div. And within the div, we have an unordered list, UL, good old ULs, right? And this is where we're iterating. So, you know, we talked about that uh, variable that I called places, which is, right here and what we're doing here is we're iterating as you would for each val um, index and places and again we're not necessarily using these items we're just using the val so give me each item that i'm going through over every single one of those items and you'll see i'm creating a list item for each so you know if you had to generate uh, a dynamic navigation Right, well, WordPress is a great example almost, right? Like yeah. we always see like you add sections, you never know how that's gonna work. This might be where you might have that, you know, navigation you're building out. And you can have the href is equal to the URL. So again, if we looked at the way, and you can structure your data in a bunch of different ways. This is not necessarily the right way. Um, you know, it would go to this one, it'll bring back the first item, this one, and then you would go to the URL, you know, dot URL property of that object and then is equal to, you know, the val name, which is basically, you know, let's write that link with that val name. And then the other one I have at the bottom here is I kind of want to show uh, a few things. How do you, you know, sometimes you don't want to write HTML if certain things don't exist. So a really great example is you, you have a product. Again, I'm going to my product. It's like my, you know, default, what I want to do. Always got to go to the product. But if you go to the product and, for example, there's an, uh, there's none in stock. So if no stock, should I really show the buy item, you know, buy button? No, I should probably show the like request to be notified when in stock button, yeah. right? So you can start to do if else, for example, I only got an if, cause I don't really have an else for the scenario, but if it has places, hey, let's show this link that's home, anything underneath of the show. Otherwise, you know, you might show something else. And again, that if has places, that's a variable that I'm passing through here and it'll check for it and then I'll write it all out. And so that's how you can start to see uh, it working. Yep. Can you do more complex statements in your if? Uh, yeah, you can do way more complex. You can, uh, you know, if, I mean, you could be looking against several variables, for example, okay. you know, if it's in stock, um, if it's of this size, or if it meets these criteria, then do this, then do that. So you can definitely do more complex, but it gets, oh, I'm not, I didn't start it. It gets a little, you know, again, uh, a lot of these things you can do, you can get fairly complex with it. Um, it just, I don't know, I don't know how you feel about it, but I feel like it takes a little time. Should you have so much logic, though, in your templates? I would say no. I, you're, I mean, it's presentation, right? Right, yeah. So a presentation, to me, should be, uh, uh, what's the best way to put it? Uh, unawares, right? You just want to render stuff to it. And you really want to, you know, maybe maybe that logic of, um, if you could put that if else statement in how you render that data to the page, for example, that's probably where it belongs. If you can do it in the query to the database, that's probably where it belongs. Um, but there are just situations in your template, I think that you are going to have an if else. And you- Come in handy every once in a while. Come in handy, you can do it. Should you abuse it? Absolutely not. I think right. would be my best advice. Yeah. Um, but I mean, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? <laughs> so, you know, you're starting to see those kind of things. So that's kind of the basics of uh, J templating and how it works. Um, again, do not be shy. Try a couple of the other ones, uh, handlebars, mustache, whatever. I feel, I wish I, I need one more in my repertoire. Um, but, you know, to get a sense of which one you like the best, um, a lot of them kind of cross different languages as well. So something like um, handlebars might be available for PHP as well as uh, other languages. So you gotta, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, Jay's a, a good place to start. Um, so the next thing I think that we kind of wanted to look at was, uh, you know, we have basic templating in place. 
showing you basic inheritance, uh, several templates, how it gets rendered, how do you pass data, how do you change that data, um, you know, some, some of the basics of, of Jade formatting and templating. I think the next thing that we're going to want to do is we're probably going to want to talk a little bit about Bootstrap. And so I'm going to bring up um, the Bootstrap page. Now, I'm going to assume most people have heard of Bootstrap. I think, do you think that's a good... Yeah, if they haven't heard of it, they've definitely seen it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. So <laughs> Bootstrap is probably the most popular framework out there. I mean, you could probably bet that most of the stuff that you're seeing is definitely uh, using some bit of Bootstrap. And, you know, Bootstrap, again, it, it, there's a couple of aspects to it. Um, you know, one is that it gives you... Uh, you know, the whole grid uh, responsive layout uh, ability for yourself. So you don't have to worry about um, a grid framework. And that can be a lot of work. So what's a responsive site, though? So, oh, going back to the, yeah, throwing it back old school. <laughs> so, I mean, a responsive, a responsive site uh, is basically one that um, that's, uh, looks, I'm going to say in the most easiest way without getting crazy about it, because I think people argue about what responsive means these days. It's it's about, uh, you know, creating um, a site that works in all browser uh, sizes, uh, dimensions, variations. At, at the very least, it's it's that's its aim and goal. Now, there's all other things around it, but um, a lot of people focus that it's just on layout, and it's not on layout, it is problem solving more so, a design problem um, more so than anything else. But when most people think about responsive design, they really think about like moving the browser in and then you see shift, uh, things shift and change and it means that you know your one site that you're writing, your one code base is gonna look good on your mobile device, it's gonna look good on your tablet, it's gonna look good uh, on a big screen like I have right here, you know, so. I think at the very base, that's that's what it is. And Bootstrap's really popular for that because it does a lot of that kind of like dirty work for you. You know what I mean? Like a lot of that kind of, oh, I got to write all that CSS uh, to handle all these grids and how things collapse. And so one component of it is definitely going to be um, the grid structure, understanding how things lay out, how they can squeeze in, um, and doing that responsive kind of grid layout for you. It also gives you a base level CSS. And so it kind of provides, uh, it's like Bootstrap saying like, this is what we think everything should look like templated wise. And that's how, uh, you know, it's quick and easy and they make it look good. Like so, everything kind of looks nice. So it does two things. It resets the CSS. It does, well, it will reset the CSS so and it'll apply. It's exactly the same across all the Normalize parts. it. That's sure. Normalize CSS. Yep. Right. All right. Yeah. It'll do that. And it's also going to go in and basically say, here is, uh, and again, normalizing the idea of all browsers might have their own little defaults for different little things. Font sizes. Colors. Font sizes, padding. It doesn't, you know, there's a bunch of different little things. And if, if you're not really used to that, it's a good way to just go in and basically say, okay, let's reset this. We have, we have a baseline now. Um, and then it gives you its idea of what your standard uh, kind of, uh, template or whatnot for CSS should be. So your idea of like, here's how your font sizes and your colors and all those things. Um, here's what we're recommending you do. And so that's why people, uh, especially devs, to be honest, really love Bootstrap because they just include it and automatically. You don't have to do all that CSS work, right? And everything automatically just looks a little bit better. Slightly better. You know, it depends on what you're doing, but everything looks just a little bit better, right? Yeah. Like they have nice choices and, and they've really thought about all the different variations. Um, but there's a couple other things that Bootstrap does give you. And so part of it is going to be uh, JavaScript components as well. And it all works together. And you can also choose what you want to be using from each of it. You can customize it, customize the download. Yeah, so you have like, and we have that here where they have the customize. Let's go Bootstrap. Come on. And you can basically go in and customize, okay, I want some of the components. I want the common CSS. Um, any of these kind of things you might use again and again. And so for some people, this is really handy because, you know, maybe you are a person who's like, I need that carousel. Boom, it's right there. As long as you follow their documentation for how to set it up and what CSS classes to use, you know, you're, you're kind of golden. And then you have, you know, the idea of common CSS, which is going to be your grid systems and your forms. I mean, styling forms is such a headache. 
and this alone for forms is, is golden. Now it's it's good practice to actually reduce the size of your bootstrap if you don't if you don't use the components, right? Oh yeah, you should always go through. You know, if you listen, if you're going to start out and just download it and include it, cool, awesome. You know, I mean, but always looking for ways to increase performance, right? Uh, right. Lower the footprint of what people are downloading. So yeah, you want to go in and, and make sure that you're kind of taking uh, some of these things away, what you know, what you don't need. And again, we talked a little bit about some of the plugins that they have, like jQuery plugins, you know, all this kind of um, very commonly found functionality that's written for you. And if you can take it out of the box and make it work, then, you know, perfect. So there's a couple of ways to actually get started and using Bootstrap. And so, um, you know, you can download it as a package and include it alongside your project, right? Or you can actually just go to a CDN and include it. And that's what I did. And, you know, each has its own reason of why you would do it. But if we look at uh, right here, if we look at the layout, so that's kind of like our base level class, you'll see that I included it from the CDN and it's minified. Obviously you're gonna want the minified and I took the CSS and then I included the JavaScript as well. Now I'm not really using any of the JavaScript. I just wanted to show how to include a script and that we could include multiple scripts. But what you wanna do here is you wanna include this uh, file. Again, if this was local, you would just point to where it would be locally. And then you probably, if you wanna overwrite any of those things or add to it, you're Chances are you're going to want to include that first so it does all of his work. It normalizes everything. It does all that. And then if you need to overwrite or add to it, you might have something in your own style sheets, for example. And so if we look at just running this example, um, and you can kind of start to see the difference between uh, how things look. So, you know, we look at this, this is a bootstrap in it, and we can start to see, and again, we'll, we'll take it out and you'll see what it looks like before, but it's kind of prescribing what these things should look like and how they should work and how much padding, for example, is on this UL and what the sizes are, you know, across the board for some of these items. And so if I go back into here and if I remove, just comment out, I'm gonna keep that script. If we take this item out and I stop it and I run it again, I feel like I should just sing everything that I'm doing. <laughs> it makes me feel so much happier. It's like, yes, I'm singing, right? And if I go back to my page, let's see if we got it. Come on, you can do it. And you'll see that you'll see the change, right? That font's like looking here a little bit bolder, not as big. Um, the one thing you'll notice is a lot of the defaults for Bootstrap, they're not using like hard black, like a zero zero zero. They're yeah. using like a just like a dark, dark, dark gray. Gray area. Yeah, that's because in design, most people say never use black, never use straight up zero 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 black. Um, it's it's your eyes. It's a little softer. Use just a little uh, lighter shade of gray, and so you start to see they're doing um, little things like that. And so you know, for example, here in the fonts, you'll see that you know we can go through and uh, see mostly the difference in the fonts, uh, some of these colors. But again, it gives you some defaults. You can go back to uh, Bootstrap, and you can totally customize any of those things that you might want to do. And uh, we talked a little bit about overwriting it. And so if I just include it back in and if I go back here and I have this um, styles for example well I had an element in here that was called main title um, you know it was an ID of main title I also had an element I think it was like Stacy on the index page right I had a CSS or sorry a class there so I could overwrite this if I wanted to Stacy, uh, one of the things I love about this editor is if I'm going to do color, um, you know, you see how it gives you the little box and what's your go-to color? That's mine. Sounds about right. It's pretty awful. Nice one. But it gives you like that sense of what the color is. You, you start to see the crazy amount of um, autocomplete here that's all you know ready for you in terms of CSS and again in terms of the editor and autocomplete 
uh, you know, we didn't show a lot of like live coding necessarily, but for all the node stuff, it's basically reading that TypeScript definition file and it's, you know, allowing itself to do the audio autocomplete and you can quickly add those kind of definition files for stuff that you're using. Very cool. So again, let's see, let's see if this is going to work. That's always my, let's see guys, just trying to overwrite a style here. Right, this should be on the index page. And you right. see that it's that really awful color. Yeah. <laughs> this my everyone has a de facto color. If you have a your go-to color, whatever it is, you know, put it in the chat room. I'd love to know what it is just out of curiosity. But so those are some of the things. You know, working with Jade, um, working with Bootstrap. We didn't show you a lot of the capability about Bootstrap because there's tons of resources out there, and MVA yeah. has some really great ones, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you take a look at my slides. <laughs> slides. Magic. <laughs> and the magic happened. Awesome. Uh, we've got some, uh, some, uh, a couple of courses that uh, Microsoft has produced. One of them is on <laughs> uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy. Uh, it's just aka.ms slash build UI bootstrap. Uh, and we've got another one on edX, if that's uh, another one of your favorite uh, uh, course uh, yeah. softwares. Yeah, so you know, we didn't spend a lot of time on on Bootstrap again because there's courses devoted to it. You could spend yeah. all day. Um, teaching Lots of you. resources online. Yeah, but yeah. we definitely wanted to show you how it's just included, and and again with the Jade templating, there's uh, lots of resources online as well that you can follow. You can start to use, um, and just kind of showing you the basics and uh, you know some kind of examples that maybe aren't uh, exactly Especially that passing basic. Passing data yeah. between Node and Jade. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Completely. So I think I think that's it for this module, right? Yeah. So uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat room. Uh, we'll take a look at them at the beginning of next uh, our next module. Yeah. And uh, until then, we'll see you after the break. Yay! Hi, and welcome back to Visual Studio Code with Node.js. We're at module five, and we're going to be talking about debugging and deploying. Oh yeah, all the, all the good stuff. <laughs> All right, uh, so why don't we get started with a, a, a module overview, I guess. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, Azure Web Apps today, I'll doing a quick overview. Uh, we'll introduce you to the Azure dashboard, uh, deploy to Azure yeah. uh, with GitHub, and then uh, do some advanced debugging right at the end. Yeah, so we'll show you a couple of new things that you can do with the debugging, but we definitely are going to go over uh, Azure Web Apps and how they work with Node because it's one of the most seamless integrations, I feel like, in terms of deploying, uh, no matter how you want to do it, whether you're like a visual editor or command line or whatnot, um, to work with uh, the web apps. Yeah. And so if you look at um, you know, Azure Web Apps in general, uh, it doesn't really matter. Well, I shouldn't say it doesn't really matter. I should say we're very open about all the kind of things that you can possibly deploy, whether it's going to be uh, a website that's uh, you know, built with Node, or maybe you're using Python, um, ASP.NET, of course, or PHP, um, all those things. You know, uh, there's very uh, quite simple ways to go and deploy those items, uh, some nice configurations that you can do um, that kind of make that whole process a little bit easier. Um, you can install some software we provide through the gallery and the gallery is actually kind of like a really nice way to go through and uh, see what's available in terms of these uh, you know basically pre-configured stacks that you can put together and so an example that we had on the slide was like the mean, sla uh, mean stack or, or WordPress. WordPress is probably one of the most popular things I think I've seen used and it's literally you know that beautiful one-click install um, idea. Um, there's a few limitations, right? Like if we're using uh, Azure Web Apps and we're using uh, you know, the whole pass, there's a couple of uh, limitations around it. What do you think they are? Uh, I would guess that perhaps you can't always set the ports that you want. Right. Yeah, ports would be one. Um, the other thing is, you know, sometimes in uh, Node you need native modules to be compiled, yeah. right? That's not necessarily going to work. Gonna work yeah. And that's because in Azure Web Apps, they're really taking care of everything for you. And you're not having to worry about doing all the behind the scenes, configuration, installation, any of that stuff. It's platform as a service and right. you, you know, you're good to go. Okay. And so they're trying to you know, make that as easy as possible for you. Um, the couple things that, you know, we get a lot of questions like what can you do, um, what are the limitations? Well, you know, custom domain, no problem. Uh, I know a bunch of people who, who run their sites, custom domains, uh, very easy. You can add FTP users. So all those common things you want to do, um, maybe you're going to deploy through, um, 
you know, source control of some sort. Maybe you're an FTP person and someone needs to just be able to put a file up or whatnot. Um, you can run multiple sites. Uh, it's actually really great for production and staging environment. And I feel like a lot of web developers these days um, have this process now that they're getting in. You're, see, you're seeing it's more structured. Um, and it depends on what environment you're in totally too. You know, if you're a lone web developer versus a enterprise team, uh, you might have different processes, but definitely the production kind of staging environment where, you know, you're able to test, um, you know, use all these things in a certain environment. And then once you're ready and you're good to go and it's been tested and it's golden, you can, you know, go live, so to speak. Um, it's really easy for that because you can so you easily- can, can you swap back if you, uh, if your production and your staging you can, uh, the, yeah. The problem that arised? No, you can. T I mean, you can create those slots. You can easily um, switch them, remove like whatever you need to do. There is, it's quite easy. But it's again, you know, uh, a prime example might be, you know, you're working on a project, let's say, and um, we're going to use GitHub for our project because right, yeah, because it's a nice way to automatically deploy, isn't and it? And because we're awesome, of yeah. Of course, and, GitHub is the best. <laughs> and so, you know, we're working through that environment, and maybe we have two branches. And um, maybe one branch is going to be uh, what we're currently developing in, and maybe the other branch is master, and master is good. It's solid. It's stable. Uh, maybe that's going to be what, what is our kind of like our golden um, deployment, whereas the other one might be one that's a little bit in flux. And so you could create two, for example, two separate environments, you know, have each one pointed to the different branch of the repo, and, you know, just set that up, and, and you're kind of good to go. And every time you make a change, it's automatically going to hook into that, see that, and deploy it for you. Very cool. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you show us how what it looks like? Yeah, Azure dashboard. Azure dashboard. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna pull up uh, my my dashboard here. Um, I've got my my test account, my demo Mulcahy account. Um, I decided I'm gonna call everything demo Mulcahy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is the the dashboard. Uh, once you've logged in and you've set everything up. Um, you can do a free trial of Azure uh, and, you know, be able to use it for a certain amount of time, get credits, try everything out. Um, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff going on. One of the things I love about this is that, uh, and again, maybe I'm hard to please, I'm not sure, but visually, um, and I'm not looking at the newest dashboard. We have a, a, a newer one. There's a preview one. dashboard. Yeah, there's a preview dashboard. Um, I'm kind of keeping it with, I think, just what uh, more people might be familiar with at this point. Um, and then we'll be going to the preview at some point. I'm sure in a further or a different MVA, but looking at this dashboard, it's uh, one of my favorite things is that it's visual and it's nice to look at. And I know that's really insane, but for someone who, um, you know, I do a lot of things from the command line. I'm quite comfortable with that. But for someone who maybe isn't quite there yet uh, to come to something like this and not be freaked out is really, really important. So to be able to look at this stuff and say, okay, I need to go here, here and here. Um, everything's like, you know, you're getting responses and feedback and, um, I don't know, every time someone, uh, a web developer who's maybe not uh, a little shy around deployment, uh, start to look at that and they're always like, oh, that looks really good. And so, you know, if we look at the dashboard, you have um, all of your options that are going to be on the left. And so, again, Azure, we're focusing on web apps today. Right. Right. But there are a bunch of different things that you could be using in terms of Azure. Everything from, you know, uh, databases, storage, um, service bus if you're doing IoT stuff, uh, you know, uh, you could go on and on, CDN, et cetera, media services. So there's a lot of options there. All your items show up here. And so any, you know, for example, in my own kind of development account, I have so many things listed that I should probably, you know, maybe consider shutting some of those things down or maybe deleting what I don't use so much, right? But you get a very basic overview of all the things that are going on uh, with a, your um with your Azure subscription and you get a sense of what type they are. So for example, I've got a storage account going, which we'll be using in the next module. I've got some web apps running, you know, and it tells you where they're running from, which server, all that kind of thing. So your all items show you uh, just a basic overview of what's going on. Now we're dealing with web apps today. So we're gonna mostly be in this section right here. And so with web apps, um, you know, it's only showing you anything that's related to any of the web apps that I'm using. And it gives me a sense of what's running. And you can start to see all these items and click into what they're doing. And so, you know, I can look into this um, SM test node 
And once you're here, you see these other items that you have, and you have your dashboard here. And so this is your kind of starting page. You'll see that this is kind of, um, uh, you know, the portal page almost to a certain degree. Here's all the things you could be using. Here's how you can be publishing. And, you know, your first kind of stop, I think, a little bit is the dashboard. And your dashboard kind of gives you an overall quick glance view of what's going on, quick links that you need. Um, for example, you can start to see traffic and, and requests or errors or any of those kind of things along this uh, this graph here. And, you know, scroll, uh, if you scroll down, you can get a sense of, like, just a high-level view of what's going on so that, you know, if you're a basic web dev or someone who's got to go in and just see, hey, like, you know, do we need to scale this out? What's going on? I can see a sense of, um, from a very holistic, high-level view, what is going on with my site. And then on the, you know, on the right here, you get the quick glance items. And so we're going to be probably in these quite a bit. And you'll see things that are like, okay, we talked about the new preview portal, right? Right. Um, view application, uh, applicable applications and services, connection strings, you know, uh, publish profiles, deployment credentials, you know, um, for example, this one is, is uh, configured from GitHub, add a new deployment slot. So you can see all these like, quick glance things that you might want to do, the URL to your site. So, you know, by default, if you create a site um, or a web app in, in Azure, it's always going to take that name that you gave it, and it's going to do a dot .azurewebsites.net. You can set that up to be different. You, you can totally use a custom domain. You've got to do the standard, um, you know, setting uh, setting the C name and right. doing your record switches, right. everything that you, you would do anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, your DNS register and stuff yep. like that. Yeah, right. totally. You just need that information, and it's actually, you know, if you've done it before, it's 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 the same kind of step. And so you again, you can uh, set your own custom domain. Um, we talked about FTP a little bit, and so FTP, uh, you have a sense of what your host names are, and you can set an FTP user, for example. So this is if you wanted to deploy uh, through FTP instead of GitHub. Sure, maybe you want to uh, maybe you want to deploy through FTP. Maybe you just want access so that you can grab stuff or. Or maybe it's like, you know, you're using it almost as a, a way to allow someone to put something there if you have to. Like, however you want to use it, you can totally do that. You could deploy through FTP if that's how you want to do it. I can't remember the last time I deployed through FTP, though. Yeah, you? me neither. It's a, it's a, that would be a really long time ago when sometimes the only way you could deploy things was through FTP. Yeah, I remember, I remember trying to set up, like, a GitHub process. Like, I think I might have been in university last time I had actually used FTP. Oh, uh, you're showing your age. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. And that's really, it's a really interesting point because a lot of things have gone continuous integration in that sense Absolutely. of, like, automatic deployments. Yeah, automatic push deployments, uh, having the source control be connected to your deployment slots. That's something that's a very common trend now, especially with the, the Git push yeah. semantics. Lots of um, different uh, uh, services now just let you Git push something to it completely, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we do that in Azure Web Apps. We do that in other Azure services. So yeah. it's, it's way more convenient for a developer to just be able to push things out than have to open up an FTP client, uh, connect to the, the server, get the right username, password, and then watch it like take a while to load every single individual file. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's good and bad. At the moment you hit that commit, yep, it's being deployed, you know. Yeah, it's but it's automated, if, especially if you connect to a service like GitHub or even yeah. Visual Studio Online. Yeah. Uh, the minute that you just commit to master, you're good to go. So be yeah. careful not to commit bad code to master. <laughs> Make sure you have a you know, development branch Don't or something like build. that. Don't, Don't break, break the, the build. Don't break the build. Yeah. So you start to see all of these kind of um, you know high level things on on the dashboard, and we're going to kind of just walk through um, you know a couple of these high level things to give you a sense of of how this works, how you deploy, and then we're actually going to deploy a site to kind of walk you through it, and so. Um, this site in particular is uh, actually being deployed by GitHub, and we'll walk you through that steps because uh, in my experience so far, that's been one of the most commonly used ways that people have been um, deploying from. Now, there's a lot of options in terms of deploying from source control, but I've seen mostly, mostly people really like the GitHub option. And so in deployments, for example, if you add an option to deploy from source control, you get this tab up here, and it tells you your history, which is kind of cool because you can go back, you can see when it was deployed, uh, you know, the idea of the deployment, you can go, you know, a link to the, to the GitHub repo, all that kind of stuff all in one place. 
And so if we go into, uh, you know, monitor, again, this is giving you more of an ability to monitor your site at uh, greater granularity. And so, you know, being able to check everything that's going on, whether it's, uh, you know, CPU time or any kind of server errors, I mean, that's a huge one. Understanding like what kind of what what's happening in terms of server erroring, uh, the qu requests that are being made even, you know, so you can kind of get a sense of what's going on there. Um, we have, uh, I'm going to skip web jobs for now. We have configure. And so configure really allows you to go in and, you know, choose some of those options in terms of uh, exposing any kind of configuration to you. Because again, you know, it's taking care of all of that stuff in, in the back end. You don't have to worry about managing. Uh, it's basically doing your VM management for you, really, is what it's kind of doing. And in, in that sense, you don't have to worry about anything this that's going on. This is something that's uh, uh, special to the platform as a service. Uh, sort of stage, right? Like we're we're providing a platform that's ready for you. All you need to do is just put your code on there. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you don't have to worry about any of the other stuff. And so if you look at this, you know, maybe you're writing something in PHP and it needs the latest version or it needs 5.6 or using something specific to it, you can go in and, and you can see that you can configure that, you know, um, you got your Java, your Python versions. Um, you also have WebSockets. And so we talked a little bit about like you can't uh, specify specific ports. But you can use WebSockets, turn them on, no problem. You just got to remember if you're going to use something like Socket.io, you just got to turn on your WebSockets. Right, you know? yeah. Um, then you have, uh, you know, anything from you can edit in Visual Studio online. So it's one of those things where if you deploy a site, you want to do a quick fix, you're not sure, it's not hooked up into your GitHub, you want to use Visual Studio online. Um, it's very easy to, to just go and open up that file, you know, save, commit, never leave this browser window if you don't want to. Uh, really depends on your workflow. Um, again, we talked a little bit about domain names, SSL certificates, um, and, you know, uh, we're getting into authentication, authorization, deployments. Again, you know, it's showing you where we're deploying from, all those kind of things. You even specify a different branch than master to deploy. You totally can, yeah. So if you had a different branch for whatever reason. Perhaps like production or something. Yeah, you might have. I mean, I think a lot of people using Gitflow will often have like a develop and a master. And right. so, you know, depending on what you're doing, maybe you're going to deploy develop, you know, so that might be something you would do. And you can specify that. Um, again, logging, if you want more advanced logging, more verbose, um, you can decide even where the logging is going to go. Are you going to put in storage somewhere? Is it going to be in a file system? Um, so you can, you know, turn those things on. Um, you have some site uh, diagnostics that you can do as well in terms of getting a better logging and error messaging. Uh, I think that's one of the things that I'll, that happens to a lot of people is, oh, okay, well, I know I deployed this, but I, I need to know exactly what's going on here. Why am I getting this error? Like a little bit more specific. Where are the error logs? You know, those kind of things. And so, again, you can turn this on or off. Obviously, if you're turning everything on and it's really verbose, you know, that's that's going to be a performance hit. You know, it's logging everything. Logging too much. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, if you're testing something out, you want to check that out. Um, and then we have something that we'll cover in a little bit. We have app settings here. And so this is where you can kind of specify your environment variables uh, for your application. And so we have an example in the next module that will kind of walk through this. Um, and if you're a node, uh, we had seen an example earlier, and I think you used it, Rami, it was a, a process.env.whatever, right? Yeah, the port ports. number, right? The port number. So, you know, these process and variable, uh, process uh, environment variables get set and you want to have access to them, how can you set stuff that maybe a user shouldn't see or have access to in your code base, right? So API keys, uh, database information, all that kind of stuff, um, anything that's a username, password, anything that's sensitive that you are not comfortable putting in GitHub, you don't have to. You know, you don't have to put it in your code base, you can just put in your app settings, and then it becomes available to that process through that variable. Um, so, you know, walking through uh, some of this, going to go up to the top. Um, you know, the other one I'm going to cover, I'm not going to worry too much about some of these other ones. If you want to scale or, or any of that kind of stuff, you can go into these tabs. I'm not too worried about that here. Um, web jobs is just something I want to talk about very, very quickly, even though we're going to cover it in the next module. And web jobs is just the idea of um, being able to, maybe you write a script. Often, sometimes I do this I might write a Python script that's running locally and all it's going to do is just resize or make thumbnails out of images and I just pass it what it needs to do, pass a directory and it does it. Um, 
So, you know, and you might be doing something along those lines. You might be aggregating an RSS feed or something that you need to do every hour. Maybe you need to do it only once. Maybe you need to do it and it needs to be triggered by some other thing. Um, you know, kind of like the idea of a cron job. And you can use uh, web jobs uh, and, and, you know, write them there and uh, have them as part of your site. Um, again, what, if you want to write anything like a web job, it's got to be attached to uh, a web app. So that's kind of a quick overview, I think, of the portal, just to get you a little bit more comfortable with it. But I think maybe we should consider looking at GitHub and yeah, talking let's, about let's deployment. Talk, yeah, talk about deploying to Azure with GitHub. Okay. Let's do a demo. <laughs> let's, yes. Okay, yes. Stacey, don't demo, stop demo, talking. Demo time, yeah. demo time, demo time, <laughs> demo time. Yeah, 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 Oh, yeah. too much energy, so much energy. <laughs> um, okay, so. I have a basic site. I created a really, really basic site. Uh, and um, in it is basically uh, an Express app I, I generated. Again, I didn't do anything crazy. I just generated an Express app. It has all those standard routes. And I just want to show you how you would deploy uh, your Node project. Now, when it comes to Node, it, what it cares about is, um, you know, depending on how you how you deploy it. If you're deploying it, for example, we're going to deploy it from source control. What it's going to do is you're going to go and create the site, the holder for it, the infrastructure for it. And then you're basically going to say, I want you to deploy from GitHub. Uh, what are some of the benefits from deploying from GitHub? It's super easy. Well, or source control in it's general. It's automated. Right. Uh, it's, uh, you can revert back different versions. Right. You can have different branches. Right. If you use site deployment on Azure, you can run two different branches at the same time. There you go. And see what the differences are. Lots of awesome advantages for using source control. There you go. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a classroom. That was like a very uh, professor. Uh, I love it. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like. You in the front. <laughs> Tell me what advantages. Is it this? <laughs> Is it that? <laughs> so I'm going to walk you through right now how to create basically a new web app and you know assuming that you just created your your node site let's just you know again can't specify a port we're not using native modules here so i'm using a basic express site but and regarding the port thing th yep. that's all right right because uh, from my understanding once uh, Azure Web Apps identifies that this is a Node app, yeah. it figures out how to actually route the port directly into your app. Yeah. So you don't have to specify the uh, port number at all. Yeah, it, it's, it's doing the work for you. But it's, if you're one yeah. of those people who, again, you mentioned it, like, for example, in Mongo, right. I want to, like, change that port or any of that kind everything. of... Yeah, yeah, I want to have control, then maybe this isn't... Control. Yeah, control. Control. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this isn't the, the perfect environment. Maybe you're, you're better off to do, um, you know... Running set, it yourself. Yeah, maybe. totally. Uh, on virtual machines, Docker stuff like that yeah 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 so we're going to start by deploying and so i'm going to show you first step first so once you log in you're going to want to go to the new button down here and i'm in web apps you know just click that again and you want to go new and compute and again you have all these options and we showed the market or we talked a little bit about the marketplace so maybe we can show it after and so you want to go compute web app and i'm going to do just a quick create and quick creates just going to uh, give me a name. Rami is Rami sleeping. Why is that a theme? I don't know. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I, I don't know. Are you arguing with me? Okay. So this is basically going to take this and append it to here, and this is going to be the URL. Now you can decide, uh, you know, where depending on your subscriptions, where it's going to, you know, what plan it's going to use, or those kind of things. If you're a person who ends up using, uh, you know, having Azure for a bunch of things, you may have multiple plans. Um, you just hit create web app. Okay, and again, it's just going in the background, it's like magic. And um, going in the background, creating, setting up everything that you need to do, and it's gonna prepare that space for you, right? And so, if we go to that item, we see that it's running. Okay, we know the location, we see the URL. Let's just click the URL out of curiosity, right? There'll be a placeholder page. And so you'll get this, and this is like, okay, good. I know that it's working, um, awesome. I can go back and now deploy. And what we can do at this point is I'm going to click in here and I'm going to go to the dashboard. And on the right hand side of the dashboard, there is going to be uh, basically set up deployment from source control. 
So I'm going to click that. Now, you have a lot of options when deploying from source control. So you can deploy from Dropbox? You could totally do from Dropbox. Um, some, you know, some teams, some teams love Dropbox. Um, a lot of design-oriented firms really like Dropbox. Um, you know, Bitbucket, CodePlex, uh, another repository. You could actually create a local repository there. So if you create a local one, can you push your Git repository to that local Git repo? Yeah, you can. Awesome. Yep. So, and, and again, we, we mentioned Visual Studio Online. I'm going to choose GitHub because that's how I roll. And it's going to go basically what that little blank page was, is it was trying to figure out if uh, it makes me authorize it, right? Because it's going to access all my, my GitHub credentials. So you need to go through that OAuth process. And you'll see that I've been very active on this GitHub user. I only have one repository. Um, and I only clearly, have, it's not a demo user. Clearly, clearly, <laughs> I am. Clearly, people aren't looking at my GitHub as my resume um, with that <laughs> demo account. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to deploy this branch, and it's just the master branch. And so, you know, I can just hit complete. And again, if I had different branches here, you would see them show up here. And I just hit that. And you start to see, okay, it's working. It's going to give you some, you know, uh, knowledge here the, or kind of messaging on the bottom. But now I have this new deployments tab. And so if I go to deployments, you will see that it's showing the process. And what it's doing is it's basically going and fetching that repository um, that I asked it to fetch. And it's starting to deploy it. And so every time that I commit, to GitHub and make a change, it's going to go through that process. It's going to have that hook where it sees that there's been a change, and then it's going to go grab it, deploy it, you know, take a couple minutes. Um, this one's taking a little longer than than uh, I'm used to seeing, but we'll see. TikTok, right? Yeah, a couple of seconds. Yeah. Should be up and running. You know, and so again, it gives you. There it is. Boom! Active deployment. It tells you when it was deployed. Um, Again, if we added a comment, any of those kind of things. So, you know, if so that would be the last Git message that you put in. Yeah. So, like, if you had committed, made a, a commitment, or if you made a commit and you had some kind of like, you know, comment, like, because I'm awesome, um, it would show up there and I would see that. And so, you know, that's actually useful. That's why those messages when you commit are so important because even right here, I could see, oh, this is a fix for bug, blah, blah, blah. And I have a sense that that's actually that deployment. So, it's telling me there's an active deployment. And I can go back again if I wanted to see where I'm deploying from or what I'm pulling. Here's a GitHub repository, so I could click there and it's going to take me to that. But I'm going to go back to the dashboard and I'm just going to go and click on um, the site link again. I love this link, I'm keeping this one forever. And we need to refresh, and you'll see that it's there. Right? And so it's deployed it. You've had. That's the classic Express Generator page. Right. Yeah, that's your. That's your uh, you know, 101. Go to yeah, yeah. Express page. Right. But again, you know, if you're working on a, a node, for example, an Express app, or you're working on some kind of a node project of that sort, and you're working locally and you're committing it to GitHub, um, you have a variety of options in terms of how to deploy it. But again, just using that continuous integration and deploying it in that way gives you a sense of, you know, how that all works. Um, now, a couple other things to see here. Uh, in terms of those items. And again, I just wanted to go back to, um, so if we were to make a, a commit to this uh, repository, you would see all your deployments being listed here. And you could easily, again, uh, decide what you want to do with them. Um, and for GitHub, that's kind of as, you know, as easy as it gets, really. And every time that you go and you commit, you're going to get that feedback. And you don't ever have to open this browser window. It, I mean, it's really just showing you what's going on. But um, once you've set it up, you don't worry about logging in anymore to the portal. You just commit. Wait, you know, you saw the deployment. Initial deployment sometimes takes a little longer Maybe than than so. you know right. uh, deployments that come afterwards. Um, usually, it's fairly quick. Initial anything you're setting up initially, and then after that, you know, just refresh your page, and it's going to show up. So, you know, that's some of the options you have in terms of uh, deploying Node. Um, Node is not for us, uh, at least in my feeling, it's not a second class citizen like JavaScript. Oh, absolutely. It's, not. First, it's first class. class. You'll see it be used across the board in Azure. You'll see it be used um, our Node tooling, whether it's going to be Visual uh, Studio Code, um, which uh, tremendous support, or Visual um, Visual Studio with all the Node, Node SDK. Tools for yeah. Visual Studio. Amazing. Uh, that plugin. Yeah. 
So, you know, those are some of your options. And, and one thing that uh, we didn't show that you can do as well um, is you can actually install the Azure SDK. It shows up, uh, you know, you can use NPM to install. And you can, again, uh, you know, use that, log into Azure, and do anything that you need to do with that as well using Node. And so, again, you know, another, another great way to probably, uh, you know, introduce that into your workflow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, so, so there's a couple of things that I, I'm hoping uh, we can talk about now. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, That's never a good sign. We need to talk. No. <laughs> no, not a good sign. <laughs> well, I want to talk about advanced debugging. Ooh, I'm excited for this because there's a lot of great info that I feel you could share here. That I could share. We can share. That we can share. <laughs> we can share together. All right, let's get right to it. Be like, you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so can we switch to uh, yeah. code editor? Go. Awesome. Uh, uh, is it me or you? I think it's you. Okay. One sec. Got to bring up code. Boop. We lost it. Uh, uh, code. Here we go. Right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so a couple of the things uh, that we mentioned a little bit in, in the code editor here is that, you know, again, we talked a little bit about um, how can you run this item and not really worry about, I mean, you've seen us all morning kind of going um, back and forth between doing it this way or, or running or through the, the command, prompt, command yeah. line. And again, it really depends on how you work or how everything's structured. Um, in this scenario, if we look at the file folder, you'll see that I opened up just um, this project here, and you'll start to see that, okay, well, I just opened up this, so I can actually run just this project. And so, you know, the debug here um, tools, we talked about setting up uh, your configuration for your launch uh, JSON and getting a sense of, um, you know, where you're going to, uh, what program are you running when you launch this? Um, what type of program is it? Um, you know, what are you naming it? So what does it show up in here as, for example? Yeah, and absolutely. And there's a couple of really interesting ones down there, the runtime uh, args. Uh, that could be used to actually tell Node to be very verbose and stuff like that. Yeah. Which very is useful when you're debugging. Which is uh, one of those things that are awesome. Environment variables passed to the program. This is like, when I saw this, I was like, oh, yes. Because otherwise, I mean, I'm so used to, I don't know how you did it, but if I had to pass environment variables, I would go in and I would... Yeah, you would have to set it, and then it'll actually be in your global environment variables, and it might be a little bit annoying because yeah. you have perhaps a global variable for other things. Uh, it might just overwrite it. So if you just want to use uh, environment variables for your specific debugging program, mm -hmm. all right, because your assumption is that once you put it elsewhere, those environment variables will be the global ones. But just for this program, while we're debugging it, I want to set the environment variables. I can do that straight from uh, from uh, Visual Studio Code. So I don't need to actually uh, do it to my all of my environment variables on my system. Um, and I mean, that's one of the that's one of the. I mean, some of the configuration things when I saw that, I was like, yes, okay, <laughs> this is this makes me feel good. Because I'm just so used to writing in one editor and maybe like, you know, maybe I'm just a command line person, I'm not sure, but I open it up that way. Um, and so, you know, with debugging, one of the things about uh, debugging here is that you can set breakpoints and you can go in and um, let's close this out. Let's go into my app, a JS, for example, and you can start to go and set some breakpoints and figure out like what's going on there, um, what is actually happening, and you get a better sense of actually debugging Node because you know depending on how you've been doing it in the past, uh, I mean a lot of people are you know console.log or they might be using not quite the most effective way to do it. No, well I no, but I mean it works. It does right? work, yes. That's like sort of the base starting point, and then you want to have better tools right and do so, more better <laughs> debugging and faster more and better yeah more and better so you know you can start to go and set breakpoints that you might want to set um, for example you know again you just kind of uh, go over onto this column here and set a breakpoint and what's going to happen is that when you go and run it in debug mode is that it's going to give you some of those traditional debug uh, debugging tools in terms of hitting that breakpoint you know allowing it to play through the breakpoint stepping into the code um, all those kind of things and you'll start to see the variables and uh, you know those items being populated and set up and so you know setting for example a breakpoint at the view engine I don't know if that makes any sense but you know running it, 
you'll see the debuggers listing on that port. There we go. And boom, it's paused on a breakpoint. And you can start to see all of these variables that are getting populated. And so... So those would be your local variables at this point. Right. Right. For how, we created the app, the Express app. Perhaps we can open that one up. Yep. And we can see what's in there. So, I mean, we created that Express app. It was like a, an instance of Express, right? So we start to see that there's an events object, right? With all of these items. You can see the length, everything else. You get the add listener, all, cache. You know, you really do get a sense of like what's going on in each of these objects. I got to collapse that one. It's a little too much for me. But, you know, um, scrolling down. You get a sense of all these objects. And this is like really, really great if you are like, what is being populated there? How is that working? What's in that object? What, what functions are available? Well, exactly. Like, why am I getting an error on this? This API says it had, I had that the other day. It was horrible. And I was like, I'm trying to use this. Why is it not here? It keeps telling me it's not there. I go, instead of going into the code base and looking across the code base, I could have just done this. And I would have thought, well, that's, it definitely does not exist there. It's not in my imagination. It's outdated documentation. Um, you know, save myself a little bit of heartache. That there. happens a lot, outdated documentation. <laughs> All the time. It's just like, come on. <laughs> I'm okay if you're gonna if you're gonna remove stuff, remove it from the docs, you know? At least, at yeah. least when we, when we uh, try to search for things and we see the function is supposed to be there and then yeah. and it's not, how, how disappointing. It's, yeah, well, I mean, it's one of those, uh, it's, I don't know. If someone can fix that problem, solid. They'd be just loaded, full of money. <laughs> um, and then you can start to see all of the other kind of like local variables uh, that are being populated. Um, again, we talked a little bit about that dir name, right? And we weren't sure like this uh, dir name, for, exa for example, right here, what does that even equate to? And so you can get a sense of, oh, you know, it's pointing to here. The current working directory. Yep. Let's point to this directory. This is where it should be looking. If it can't find a file and I'm using that variable, maybe I have to move it, you know, those kind of things. And so, you know, you start walking into um, all of these items uh, and you get a sense of what they are. Remember, we had that users variable, right? And that's actually should be, um, you know, a route. So it is named router. And you start to see like what's, you know, its prototype is router. So you can start to walk through these things and take a really good introspective look at what's going on. Try to figure out which, uh, what objects they are and stuff like that. Right. And then you have, we have local. So local are the ones that often are the ones that you need to go and check. But then you have like anything that might be set up in global here. And so it's going through. Um, Think of everything that's global in JavaScript, which could be uh, array, the, the array uh, prototype. The sure, string. String, yeah. a whole bunch of stuff that, that are global variables that you can use. Yep. Um, and then, you know, uh, you have your controls up top here. So again, you know, it's paused on that. Maybe I just want to inspect it. I just want to see exactly that it has what it needs to have, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, you know, maybe this is coming back from a, a call and you want to make sure everything's populated. Can you hover over the variable app? Uh, where are you looking? Right, right here? Right at the top. Boop, boop, boop. Or actually any, any app. Yeah, so it actually shows you uh, the variable itself and, and what's inside it, what type of variable it is. And in this case, app is a function uh, as, as seen right, right. there. Uh, so pretty cool stuff that you can do. We can also do it with like integers or uh, other types of variables. Uh, see what type they are if you're in a place where you just don't know what's uh, what type it is. And in this case, like if you look at routes, it would be a, a, a right router a router function that's correct. Uh, user is the same thing. Place is the same thing. Uh, it's it's uh, also handy if you don't want to search for the variable in the in the corner. Right. And you can just kind of scroll through them and yep. see what's going on there. Um, you've got some of the, the items at the top as well, and uh, you know if you've walked through debugging, I feel like I honestly feel like, um, and I probably am the first one to take it to be honest. But I feel like there could be a whole course on debugging, like on introspecting, understanding things, like yeah. on, you know, because I it's a, I definitely believe that take it, people take it for granted, right? And you kind of you yeah. learn it from someone else, or you learn it from like going through like me, like everything else, you know, self taught. Like, oh, how does this work? And and figuring it out. And yeah, um, there's you know. a couple of great tools in Node that actually let you uh, debug. Uh, uh, as well, uh, there's a, a module called Node Debugger. Mm -hmm. It comes in really handy if you have to debug things on a server where you don't necessarily have uh, a desktop environment. Yeah, you can't connect it you at all. Or, or mm -hmm. you can't do a remote debug. Yeah. Uh, lots of great stuff that's uh, available in Node. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like that, honestly, that's got to be a whole 
Uh, it's got to be, be a whole course. Yeah. Point. <laughs> so, you know, again, so you got all these items at the top. I can stop it. I can, you know, go over or um, step over, uh, you know, step into. And so that might be a function that's complex and you need to make sure that you're stepping into the function to understand what's going on within that function. You know, those kind of things. Um, you can press play to, you know, just basically let it go past and, you know, go start running it or whatever. So you have some options there. Um, I didn't go through too much of the call stack. Um, it would be useful uh, to actually uh, see some of the call stacks, though. Yeah, hold on. Let me run it again. We'll do this. So there you go. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. So it's interesting that... Uh, Look at in... this. This is like, this is beauty. <laughs> it's it just is. beauty. Excellent UI. Thank you. Love it. Sorry. So if you look at uh, the call stack there, although we are in AppJS, uh, just to get to that point, uh, Node has to do a bunch of things. Among them, load the module, get all the module requires, and do a whole bunch of other stuff. So you can see the call stack right over there. Uh, and uh, typically, the call stack is in the order of a stack. Yeah. Right? yeah so if yeah. you've done your computer science uh, yeah. uh, homework or, or if you've been in a computer science class, the stack is something that... Or if uh, you've listened to a lot of people or, talk about it. Exactly. <laughs> so stack is something that you pile up on top of. So that's, that's the stack looking down, uh, downwards, which is pretty cool. Um, one thing that I absolutely think that we have to show is sure. watching variables. Uh, I don't, you know what? Yeah, show me how. I don't think we've done it. All right, great. So let's pump, uh, go back to the, the, the uh, IDE there. Yep. Visual Studio Code. Yep. And we do that. All right, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you start debugging again, mm -hmm. uh, you can set a couple of variables to watch. So um, let's say you can add the plus variable right there mm -hmm. and then type in an expression. Like say perhaps app is uh, not equal to null or something. Yeah, so if you do that, it should be able to notify you every single time that that uh, variable changes value. So right now it's true, it's not equal to null, because at that breakpoint we've already set to var. Right. Let's say that we put a breakpoint right before, uh, and then rerun the entire uh, program. Uh, it should uh, basically tell me, uh, maybe at the line 10. Boop, 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 boop. Right there. there. Yep. Yeah. So if we run it again, at that point it will tell me that it's false. And... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay. It didn't. It didn't stop at that breakpoint. Uh, maybe put in something else like a console.log in between the uh, require. Right there. Yeah. Sleeping. It's the theme. All right. Oh, it's not settling on that breakpoint. Okay, so now it's set, it seems. I can see it at the bottom. Uh, try, try, try again. Share. So you can see all the breakpoints that you've set right at the bottom over there. 10 and 16. I think it just runs so fast that it goes, oh no, wait, it's not stopping on it. Interesting. Well, there you go. All right. Let's try doing this. Yeah. And... Maybe it might be just not... Uh, there we go. Okay, cool. Uh, so you can see that the watch is false. So if we step over one... Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, and then we do it again. And then we do it one more time. Alrighty. Boom. True. We'll change to true. That's really handy. I can totally see that being like waiting for something to populate in terms of... Yep. Especially if you're doing like async stuff, yep. right? And you're just like waiting for that item to be populated. And exactly. then you're just like, okay, now I see... I see the problem here. Maybe I didn't schedule this car, you know, you know what I mean? Some things are at a joint or whatever, right. and I gotta do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, some of the some of the things uh, with anything else you wanna like throw out there that you're all uh, well I really like the the breakpoints tab at the bottom, and there's one thing that's really interesting right there. Uh, if you look, there's uncaught exceptions. So these are exceptions that happen in Node that uh, you don't have a catch anywhere uh, for. So yep. mm -hmm. um, Basically, what it will do is it will break point whenever there's an uncaught exception, yeah. which lets you see the call stack to figure out where that exception came from. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so like it's no longer like, oh. Like, why did my program crash? I have no idea. <laughs> you can finally have a solid answer for why my program crashed. You can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Well, I think that's uh, some of the basics of deploying.
Mm -hmm. um, and also walking through just with code itself um, and getting a sense of just how you're debugging a program. Um, one of the things I saw actually on the interwebs the other day, I thought was really interesting. We don't have it here, but um, again, different people work different ways in terms of their development process. And so I saw this one developer was using Gulp to basically continuously uh, compile things and run things, you know, whether yep. it was a... Uh, Watching local folders, waiting completely. for change. Completely. Yeah, you know, whether you're using SAS or something, any along those lines, using all those processes, putting it in, in, in a task runner gulp. And, but then was like, oh, how do I, how do I actually attach to that process? Because I want to listen to this process, because um, that's really where it's running it from. And showed this whole great uh, demo. I think it was on on uh, the interwebs there about how you do that. Um, so you know you have you have it doesn't have to exactly be like the way that we configured it. You can yeah, absolutely you can configure it to to work with um, how your workflow is. Absolutely. Yeah. I think All right. That's it. Yeah. So uh, we've got a couple of um, uh, resources perhaps that we could share. Yeah, that'd be uh, awesome. There is one that I would like to share absolutely if I can open up a. Yeah, browser. let's do it. Uh, and that is no debugger. If you want to check it out for the situations where uh, you can't debug it, um, except for using the no debugger. So it's quite simple. You allow, it allows you to do no debug, myscript.js, and set a bunch of breakpoints, uh, and it's very handy. Uh, and then finally, I guess we should make sure that we have uh, shared uh, where you can get the tools that we are using which is Visual Studio Code, because I don't think we did that in our first module. No. Uh, right here, code.visualstudio.com. Not a mistake. <laughs> uh, you can see it there. OK, cool. Uh, so thank you very much for this module. And stay tuned with us. We're going to be coming back and talking about Azure Web Jobs. Woohoo! Awesome. Welcome to module six Whoa. of <laughs> Visual Studio Code with Node.js. I figured we had to start this one really, really loud, just in case uh, some people were not as excited anymore as we are. And clearly, I think I'm the only one who is excited. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Objects are as loud in person as they are on the stream. <laughs> so this module we will cover using Node for Azure Web Jobs. Yeah. My name is Rami, and with me is Stacy. Yeah. And uh, let's let's yeah. get started. We're gonna dive in because we're gonna learn a couple of little fun things. So we're gonna talk about using Node for Azure Web Jobs. Um, and uh, again, in terms of what we're gonna learn today, we're gonna talk about okay, what is a web job? Uh, you know, how do they work in Azure? We're going to talk about introducing uh, you to how do you create a web job, um, creating a simple web job, uh, you know, otherwise known to me as, you know, not the most useful web job. And then a good example of like uh, something that's maybe a little bit more robust, more something you're more likely to do. And then just a couple options in terms of uh, debugging those web jobs. So, First thing that we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about Azure Web Jobs overview and, and what they are and how they work. And for most people, um, they kind of think of uh, a web job uh, as a cron job. And, and for some of you who don't know what that is, it's the idea that you're going to continuously or at some point call a script somewhere. Um, and so uh, in terms of Azure, we call these web jobs. And so the overview uh, for Azure Web Jobs is that it's the ability to run a background task on demand or continuously or scheduled. Um, so, you know, you can start to think of uh, various uh, tasks that you might do in, in the sense of, of running them continuously or scheduled. Maybe it's always looking at something. Uh, maybe you're doing something once an hour, for example. Um, and these get deployed uh, using the platform as a service or the pass. And so it's actually hand in hand with part of websites. And so you need to create um, a web app uh, and then you can now kind of attach your, your web job to it. So what are they good for? You know, when you think about a, a web job, well, they're really great for tasks such as, um, for me personally, API aggregation. I feel like I work with so many APIs, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Stack Overflow or whatever. Um, and so they're really great for that. 
um, batch processing, uh, you know, anything that you need to do where maybe you're taking all of these items uh, and converting them to a PDF or something. Um, so good for that because you don't really want it to be part of anything that's going on. It happens at a certain time. Maybe you, you know, schedule it at night. It's going to batch process something. Um, something like image resizing. Maybe you have a bunch of images and what you want to do is maybe compress them down, make them a little smaller. Um, maybe, you know, someone's uploading something into an area that you can just grab all those images and you automatically have this resizing ability, for example. Um, when it comes to a web job, you can use a variety of languages uh, to write them. And so you can use, you know, uh, PHP, Python, Node, Bash, etc. And you have a bunch of options, uh, you know, in terms of how you want to write them, because it's really just going to be calling that script. And so uh, we're going to show you Node, because we've been doing Node all day. And it'd be really weird if I showed you Python all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Introduction to creating web uh, jobs for Node. What happens in a web job is when you create a new web app, which I sh showed you in the last module, uh, you have this section called web jobs. And so you can add a new web job. And uh, what happens with this web job is you can uh, create a zip file and you could have uh, sometimes a web job is only going to be one file, so maybe you just have like one simple node file and it's doing something very basic. Um, sometimes you might have multiple files, um, uh, you know, things that you separated out and written, it's quite complex, and that's fine too. It doesn't really matter. All you need to do is package all those uh, things that you need in order to run that job um, together in a zip, and you can basically just upload that zip. And so what happens is once you've uploaded this directory of the zip, um, it's looking for uh, a file in your folder that starts with uh, the name run. So it's looking for a run and it'll like ultimately look for any of those kind of supported languages I mentioned. So it'll be looking for a run.py for Python, uh, you know, PHP, uh, run.js, for example. It's looking for that. And if it finds multiples of that, it's going to take the first alphabetical extension and run it. Now, you can also not name it run. You could name it something else. You could name it stacy.js, for example. It's going to look for run first. If it doesn't find run, then if it finds uh, something else with the supported extension, it will run that. So if you only have one file, you can kind of name it what you want. If you have multiple files, your entry point into your web job has got to be that run dot whatever supported language you want to use. Um, and then, you know, uh, again, as many files as you want, and you can have multiple web jobs. Um, and when you deploy them, you'll see that what happens is they get in your uh, kind of uh, file directory of your site. So if you were to FTP up into your site, for example, um, you would see that it gets unpacked at a folder that's called app underscore data, and then it's slash jobs. And so all your jobs, if depending on what type of job they are, if it's triggered, it'll be in a triggered folder. If it's continuous, it'll be in a continuous folder. And so it kind of organizes them alongside your site because they go hand in hand with your site. Can't really exist without a, a web app being present. So I'm going to kind of just walk through a very, very simple example and show you the process uh, for Node and then show you a more uh, complicated process that involves things like environment variables and storage and other good things from um, Azure. So we're going to talk about just creating a very simple web job here. And we're going to, again, go back to the Azure portal, portal sorry, and see how to uh, package this and upload this and all that good stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to code as I like to do, and we are going to go to uh, zero or sorry, 15 web jobs simple. And in 15 web jobs simple, I have just two files. I have a package JSON just in case I, I'm ever going to need any dependencies, and I have a run JS. And my run JS, this is once again, I said simple, meaning meh, not useful. All this is doing is it's setting an interval and it's repeatedly calling a function, you know, every five seconds. This is a basic, you know, again, you can put anything that you want into this file. Um, any, any, you know, again, all I'm doing here is, is calling something on an interval, but if you wanted to have something that's going to reach out and call an API or any of that kind of stuff, you can totally do that. Um, 
I did this, I, I could test it locally if I wanted to test it locally, but let's say that this is gonna be my very simple web job, right? And again, I kept it simple so that we don't have to worry about all the moving parts. So what I need to do in order to take this item and if I wanted to deploy it, is I need to go into the folder system and I need to go into that web job simple and uh, even if I went to up a level here, and I need to basically, uh, boop, 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 I need to create a zip file. Why can't I can use a zip send to, there we go, sorry. Yeah, could use that. And it's gonna create that zip file, right? And I see it at the bottom right there. Okay, and so again, anything that you're working in your directory, for example, in a web job, um, you can just basically take that directory and you can zip it up. And so what you wanna do is now that I have this, this zip here, is I can go back to um, my, my Azure portal and I can easily, if I wanna go up into, I already have something running here, for example, I have a couple web jobs already running. So I'm gonna add another web job. And so what I can do here is I'm on web jobs and I can hit add, okay? And I'm just going to call this a uh, simple job. You give it a name and you can browse for uh, your files. And so I'm gonna find that file here that I created, right? And it's a zip file. And remember that my JS file is called run.js. And now you have some options here in how you wanna run it. And so we'll see that it's run continuously. So run it all the time, run it on a schedule. Um, like how should this be called? Run on demand, you know? So that's the idea that you would have to trigger it um, explicitly. And so what I'm gonna choose, for example, is gonna be uh, for, you know, run on demand to make it easy. We'll try this one first. And then you say complete. And you'll see that what it's doing is it's you know gonna take that file, it's gonna upload it. Um, you'll see that it's ready and it's enabled, this item right here. And I can hit this run once, for example, because this is run on demand. I can hit this run once if I want, and it's gonna run that job. You'll see that it's a last run result, it's running. Okay, and I can go into the logs here, allow access, copy. You can do it. Maybe it's taken a second. Yep, yeah, just give it a couple of seconds. And you'll see that it gives you a little bit of details about you know when it started running, um, all of those things. And if you click into here, um, you can go in and you'll start to see it's loading this out and it's giving you this output. So any of those console.logs that you're using, it will show up here. And so, you know, if you're writing a web job and you're tr not trying to figure out, not sure how to debug remotely, um, you know, you can do this console log and it does get, uh, you know, toggled into this output here once you click into it. Now, if you wanted to do more advanced debugging, um, you know, you could be using uh, the web jobs SDK in Visual Studio, attaching a process to it. Um, but for most of the stuff that I've been doing, this has been enough for me to go in and make sure that things are, um, you know, as they should be. And again, I can refresh this or, or download this log that's happening here. So, you know, that's the idea of a very simple web job. Now, again, practical application of a set interval every five seconds, not so sure. <laughs> Don't do what I did, maybe. Um, but it does give you the sense of, uh, you know, what's going on there. And again, I triggered it once. And because it never really ends its process, it's always doing a set interval. It's just going on and on and on, right? So I'm going to actually delete that one. But that gives you a sense of the actual process behind uh, all of it. So a couple of neat things that I noticed. That page was actually also built in Bootstrap. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see you you see a lot of bootstrap being happen everywhere. Including on Azure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um I mean, yeah, come on. Why not? <laughs> right? So the next thing I want to show you is we've done a, a simple web job and again you're like, okay, you know, great. Um I'm not really quite sure how that works. I want to walk you through uh, maybe a more realistic example um of what you're doing or what you might end up doing. And so 
Um, one of the things that I end up using web jobs for uh, quite a bit is I end up aggregating APIs. I love building applications with APIs. Um, the beauty of Node is that there's so many modules out there. It's so easy. I don't have to worry about OAuth. Anyone who's ever had to really deal with the OAuth process themselves, uh, what a pain. So for me, I, I love using this stuff. And what I've got here is I've got a basic script. Again, it's only one script. There's nothing too complex here. Um, but there is a bunch of things going on, and so I'm going to walk you through it. And so what I've done here in this example is that the whole aim of this web job is to go out to Instagram. It's to look at a certain user, and it's to get their most recent, so their last 20, for example, posts on Instagram. And what I'm doing is I'm taking those images and I'm putting them up on blob storage. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking those images, those URLs, I'm copying them over to blob storage um, so that I have them, you know, somewhere else, right? If I wanted those so images. A, a backup of your Instagram A, a backup. If you want to do a complete backup, you totally could. Awesome. And so, and, and store it where you want to store it. And so we're going to show you a couple things here in terms of how this works. Now, the first one you'll see is I have an Azure variable, require Azure storage. Well. Again, Azure Storage uh, is a, a module that you can get from NPM and you install it and it's going to be my package JSON here. And I just installed that and that's going to allow me to work with Azure Storage. Now there's a bunch of uh, different modules you can use. You can download the whole Azure SDK. Uh, I highly recommend that just pull what you need. Um, and so here we're going to be using Azure Storage, and I'm going to be in, uh, specifically using uh, Blob Storage. And then again, we talked a little bit about FS, so the whole file I/O file system. Um, I'm going to be doing an HTTPS. Uh, HTTPS. There we go. I'll go a little slower. Um, you know, request. Uh, so you can start to see the things that I'm, I'm using up here. And what I do right off the top is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be passing in, when I go to deploy this, I'm gonna be setting some environment variables, which we'll cover on how to do that in Azure. And what I did right at the top is I was like, I wonder if I'm getting these variables, if they're being populated. And so I just logged out one, for example. Now, what, I do, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to initialize in line 10, I'm gonna go var blob service is equal to azure.create blob service. And so I'm gonna pass it the name and the key. And so I'll show you how to set up uh, storage and what you need in order to do this. But basically, it needs a key so that it can access it and needs to know uh, the name of where it's going to. And you need to initialize it with this. So the key, depending on how you set your storage, whether it's private or public, um, it really allows you that access to you know, use the SDK with it. Uh, the next one I have is I've required the Instagram node uh, library. And um, again, I'm making an instance of it in IG. And then I'm telling it what to use. And again, I'm getting these variables um, from uh, the um, uh, web app uh, variables or environment variables that I processed. Uh, I blame Diet Coke right now for me like talking so, uh, uh, uh. So, <laughs> um, so that's, you know, I'm getting these actually, they'll be set in Azure. You'll see how we do this. Anytime you see a process environment, and then you see these constants um, or you know capital here, that's coming from the process dot environment. Those are items that we're gonna be set or that Azure has set, depending on what we're accessing. And then um, I go, uh, you know, same thing. So I'm basically telling it, here's my access token, here's my, um, my client ID and my client secret. So those are the things that you need to work with Instagram. You need your client ID, you need your client secret, and then you need to go and generate yourself an access token. And that's the easiest way to get uh, working with it so that you can avoid the whole um, authentication back and forth. And so what I'm doing in the next one is I'm basically saying, hey, Instagram, this module that I'm using, I want you to go to uh, this user, which is I'm going to set it. I'm going to give them a user ID and get their recent media. What have they posted? Um, and this function in Instagram will turn you the, I think it's like the last 20 posts. Um, and it returns you, you know, everything you need to know uh, 
Some you, pagination there, I see. You've got error, you've got media, so this is like basically an array of those 20 items, if there's 20 items, for example. And then it'll tell you like, yeah, it, are there more items? And if they are, it's already got that URL appended to it, so it's a really nice, they've done a nice way of like just saying, oh, pag if there is pagination, just go pagination.next, and it's kind of held within that object. Um, you know, remaining limited, all those kind of things. And so what I'm doing here is I'm basically just, you know, storing the length of the items. I have a counter and I did this old school. This is maybe somewhere where I should be using a library along the lines of async or queue um, because I do have asynchronous calls happening. What I am doing here is I'm basically saying, you know, call this function next. And what next does is it's going to the next item in that list of medias that it returned. So I have this call go to Instagram, get recent, that's asynchronous, that's gonna take who knows how long. When that comes back, this is the callback within it. And then I'm saying for each item in there, what I wanna do is I want to take that item and I wanna write that item down locally so that I can write it locally. Um, you could create the stream or you know basically send it right up to Azure through a stream. Um, but I'm gonna write it locally into this placeholder uh, JPEG and when I'm, you know, done that, what I want to do is I want to take that item and uh, once it's finished piping it in and make that request for that image, get the image name, create a file, write it into the file here, response pipe file. When it's finished, I want to now say, let's go back to the blob service. So when that file is finished writing locally, that one file, I'm going to create a, a blob from the local file. And this is like a function within that module. It's really handy. You basically pass it the container, you pass it um, the name you wanna call it. And then you can also, uh, you know, pass it uh, the what item it should upload. And it handles that and it'll give you an error or tell you, you know, if there's success. And so if there, if it's, you know, successful, if there's no error, I just want to basically call this function again. And I just want to do it for uh, until I have no items left in that array. So a couple of things going on here. Um, and, you know, these processes, again, you could probably, uh, I was like saying around me, oh, this could be a little more elegant, but it works. So it's like MVP, MVP, MVP. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally, you know, but it gives you a sense of what that is. And when I'm done through all of, you know, if there are items left, let's go next. If there isn't, let's just exit this process. Let's stop this process. So this process isn't always running. And so this gives you a you know, a sense, um, let's see, maybe I can clean this up a bit. Uh, Shift, Alt, I think it's F, maybe not. All right, um, and you can start to see like just how this process is. So a little more practical, maybe you're gonna go out to uh, an RSS feed, maybe you're gonna do a search against Twitter, find something against a hashtag, maybe you're running an event and you wanna find everything against that hashtag and just store it somewhere so that you can, you know, see that fairly easily. But what's gonna happen here is I've basically downloaded that image from Instagram and then I've uploaded it into blob storage. So we should see a bunch of images on my blob storage. So what I wanna do is at this point, sorry, let's go here, let's go back to here. Um, so I already have this kind of running and I'm not gonna necessarily worry about uh, going through the process. Well, we can kind of go through another process deploying, but I'll show you this running here. And so what's happening is I talked a little bit about all those variables in that script that, uh, you know, the Instagram client ID and access token and, um, you know, any of those things that I might need that I don't wanna put in that file. Because if I commit that file to GitHub, I definitely don't wanna have sensitive information um, in it. I don't want people to have access to any of the, those items. And so when we're looking at the web jobs here, what you can do is if you go into configure, um, and we go to the bottom where we talked a little bit about app settings. Uh -oh. You'll see all my app settings, right? Uh -oh. Yeah. So yeah, that's okay. I don't think anyone's gonna, I mean, I can remove all that stuff, but you'll see all those app settings getting set there, right? And so I can set those app settings there. I don't have to worry about it. 
right? And those will now get populated not only to my website, but to my web job. And so all those items that we want, we might need, whether it's, you know, the blob name, the container, Insta user, et cetera, um, the access token I generated, they all get set there. And if we go uh, back up top, and if we go to web jobs, you will see that it is running here. Now, let's just take a second to look at the storage that I need to do. So I set up storage. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through how I set up storage. Now I have my storage all set up, but in order to use storage, I, I use blob again. You have a couple options. You have blob, you have table, you have queue. They're all kind of useful for different things. Um, you also have page blob. And so I'm gonna go new storage and I'm going to go quick create. And you can start to use storage. And so again, Rami is sleeping. He really is. <laughs> I'm not sleeping. I don't know. So you can choose basically um, your location or affinity group, where you want it to be closest to. I'm gonna say East US, cause that's, I mean, that's where I'm from. You know, replication, geo, -dundant, uh, geo redundant, locally redundant, just keeping it at that. And when you create your, uh, create your storage account, it's gonna come up. And there's a couple things that we can do here in terms of storage. Now for what I set up for this web job, I have a storage uh, account, I'm gonna use blob, and I set up a container to put them in. So it's this container is gonna hold all of these blob items, which happen to be JPEGs. And so when we get this set up, uh, we can go in and the next step that we need to do is we need to set a container. Now using the Azure SDK and Node, you could also do this uh, through code. And I could have wrote it in that web job. I could have said, if this doesn't have a container, or, you know, create if it doesn't exist, you know, and it'll create it if it doesn't exist. Um, but, you know, I went and I set up everything on, on, uh, on Azure. And so now that I'm here in storage, and storage has gotten uh, this I icon at the bottom here, kind of like a, I don't know, what, what would you say that is? Like grid it's paper? It's like grid. Grid paper, grid. Um, you can go to containers, and you can create a container. And so I created one in my last one, um, and I called it images, so I'm gonna do the same here. And you have different levels of access. So sometimes you don't want people to have access at all. Um, and if so, they need certain keys. Sometimes uh, it's gonna be private or public. I'm just gonna make mine totally a public container for now. So one of the reasons why you'd wanna have it public is so that uh, you can store images that you're gonna serve on your website. Right, yeah, yep. And if we look here, Right, it'll say it has no blobs. There's nothing, you know, been put here at all, for example. But, you know, if we go back and if we need to go into any of these things in terms of monitoring, you can do, again, all these things are kind of the same across the board. You'll find that you can set the logging, you can set the monitoring, um, all those things. And what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to go back um, into here and you'll see this little bottom part. And again, I'm kind of just walking you through the steps uh, and then I'm gonna show you the other one, but you have the manage access keys. And so what that means is that I can take this primary access key and that becomes a key that I need to pass it to the SDK or to the module and node so that it can use it. And so you have you know, your keys here that you can start to use. You can also do uh, fun little things like specifying uh, a certain amount of time that people can have access to things, um, you know, with a shared access policy, those kind of things. Um, but again, we just, uh, well, at least I've just done it super simple. And so if we go back to the Stacy node MVA, um, you'll see here, let me go, oh, uh, 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 sorry, I wanna get out of my, oh. You wanna get back to your no, web apps? No, I wanna go to storage. Okay. If you go into the storage, I've already set this one up. I've already run this web job. So in the previous one I just set up, I showed you like how you add a container, where the keys are at. If we look at the containers here, you'll see that I have images, right? And you'll see I have a whole bunch of stuff here, right? So let's just delete all this stuff. Let's delete this container and create it again. Um, 
because we want to see that web job actually work, right? Like it's been deployed, we want to see it work. So let's delete this. This is a moment of truth, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, deleting something. Look away, look away. I'm going to create that container again. I'm going to call it images. I'm going to make it a public container. Uh, sometimes you just have to wait a second because you just deleted it and it's like, what are you doing? Make up your mind. Okay, hold on. Give it a second. Give it a second. Third time's a charm. Is that what we're thinking? Yes. There, there we go. go. Right? You, you do have to definitely wait a good minute before you, it's like, it doesn't like indecisiveness. Um, my fault. It's, <laughs> it's my fault. And so you'll see that, again, in images, I have nothing there. And so what I want to do in, uh, now that my storage is set up and it's kind of empty, I want to go back into my web apps. We'll go into my Stacy node M, uh, MVA. Let's go to my web jobs. Okay, now I've already deployed this item. Um, maybe, maybe what I can do is I can deploy another one. Let's just see if we can uh, get this going. So let's go into uh, web job storage. Okay, good, I've got what I need. I'm gonna right click. I'm going to send to compressed folder. Okay, and it's there. So let's try just creating another one. Add, okay. Insta part two. I mean, sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to select this folder again. And I'm going to say uh, run on a schedule, for example. So I'm going to show you how to run this on a schedule, but I'm going to trigger it right when it starts. So we're going to say run on a schedule. This might be the idea that I want to call this because Instagram, maybe this user is very prolific. Maybe they're posting 20 photos a day. Maybe I want to be checking this, um, you know, every hour. It would be a lot of selfies, though. You know, probably be. Uh, I have the Instagram user I have. He posts a lot and it's like photos of his kid with food. And it's the cutest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> Um, so let's just, sometimes the run on schedule just pulls up for a second. So let's just see if this is going to, yes, thank you. And you just tell it the region that you want to, you know, be, I'm just going to say North Central. And, you know, that depends on obviously how you want to do it. So reoccurrence, a one-time job, a reoccurring job, um, starting now at a specific time. Okay. And we can go in. Okay. Successfully uploaded new job. And, you know, this one's on demand, this one's on a schedule. I can select this one and I can choose to run it right away. And usually I'll just do this. This is also like, uh, this is going to work. Failed. Uh-oh. That's not good. Let's look at the logs. Let's go look at the logs. It's a good thing I didn't delete my other one. Mm-mm-mm. All right. Let's see what's happening here. Let's see if we're getting any errors written back. Okay, so you start to see status change initializing, cannot find module Azure storage. Did you do an NPM install? So what happened here is that I obviously did not include any of the things that I needed there. All right. Right? And so what I can do is if I go back to command line, Right, and I'm gonna go CD documents, Git, GitHub, node, oops, uh, dir, CD node NBA, and then I'm going to uh, go into CD, oh, I gotta look it up, it might be 15, right? Uh, 16. 16. 16 tab. Okay, you'll see that none of those uh, actual modules, if I do a dir, I don't have a node uh, module, but I have a package JSON, right? And so what I can do here is let's see if this is going to do anything along the lines of installing those items. Well, 
Let's see if it's going to install stuff. Okay. I've got a few things. What I want to do is I want to check to see what it has. So I have those items that I need, right? And what I can do is go back. And again, it needs everything um, that it's looking for. And so I can go boop, 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 send to, here we go, compressed. And I'm going to go back up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that one. Hit yes. Again, if I had FTP, I could also just like easily FTP the files up and replace what I need. It's not going to hurt us to create a new one again. Instagram, inst Insta part two and browse for the file. But again, you know, we got to see that those documents actually tell us what the problem is and that there's missing things that it's looking for. I noticed there's a limit that's of uh, one gigabytes for user files. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what... <laughs> what cron job would be a gig, <laughs> yeah. big, but... Well, that's not a challenge. That's not a... I'm going to say one-time job. Someone's going to do it on the internet. Someone's, someone's going to be like, oh, look at this. Threw down, one gigabyte. Um, you know, but, you know, let's say you included a whole bunch of libraries and stuff, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, so we have Insta Part 2. Oh, that didn't look good. Mm, might need to refresh, perhaps. Yeah, let's try there it. it there we go. Okay, on demand. Okay. And I'm just going to hit run once. Let's hope I have better luck this time. It's initializing. So it's giving you some feedback and it's running. Okay, and if I go here, let's see what's happening. And I can go 11 seconds ago. Okay, and you start to see my traces are coming out and then I'm getting these, you know, I was tracing out, for example, the link to every one of these images. So if this worked in theory, and this is all saying it successfully did, well, let's see if my traces are right. If this worked in theory, we should be able to go back to my storage and we should be able to go into the uh, storage container and you start to see all these images. So all these images are being copied over, right? And we could probably take a look at these images without being, let's see if this is gonna work, right? Oh, baby with so food, funny. that's food baby on um, Instagram. So you can start to see, uh, you know, all these images again, just got copied over uh, quite easily and it only takes a second and you could sit there and schedule that job to happen however much you want to do it. Uh, I clicked it to run it, but it could be scheduled every day, whatever along those lines, especially if you're working with APIs or um, RSS feeds, things like that. You got to be careful of rate limiting and how often you can call them. So, you know, again, scheduling might help that, you know, you can schedule it every 20 minutes to make sure you got the most up to date. It's not going to be real time you know, um, but that's not what you're looking for here. You're you, can, looking... you can get something close to real time by running a script continuously, can't you? You you totally could. It depends on what you're doing, though. I mean, again, if we're talking APIs, it's probably not what you want to do. Probably not what you want to <laughs> Especially with some of those APIs, they can ban you outright, and you have to get a new, whole new access token, a whole new thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not, not fun when that happens to you. Yeah, not that it's ever happened to me. Uh-huh. Ever. Uh -huh. mm -mm. <laughs> like all the time. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, I need to put a delay on that. Um, so, you know, uh, web jobs are another way to kind of take your node skills. And even if you're not necessarily uh, using them, you know, to complement directly your site, but they're, they might be really great for a background task. And, you know, this is something you could just run independently. Again, I, I created a whole web app but I'm not deploying a website on it. I'm just using it for a web job and you can totally do that. And you can deploy a couple of web jobs that you want. And what I showed you right here was integration with Azure Storage um, and Blob in, in, in particular, but there's a lot of other opportunities that you can do. You can get a sense of uh, you know, uh, having them triggered if, if something's been added to a queue or um, you know, uh, adding information to the table or those kind of things. Um, you know, for example, I wrote a Raspberry Pi, uh, kind of like a, 
a photo booth, and every time that it uploaded an image, it got triggered, there was a process that went through, it sent email in the background, it did all this stuff. And so you can totally have it run as a background task and not necessarily as part of your app. And it made the app feel 100% more responsive. Um, so, you know, a couple of options for you uh, in terms of leveraging some of your node skills, but also getting them up on Azure and doing things that are productive for you. Because um, I always think of uh, web jobs as like utility, right? Like, it is, it is. You, know? you need to, to run it in the background. It's, it's meant to, it's, it's there to uh, save you the need from having a virtual machine just to run that simple script. Right. right? It's, it's there for you. And it's a common use case scenario when you're developing websites, like you're always uh, there's always going to be some point where at some you'll need like some recurring job. Yeah. Uh, and a web job is perfect for that. Yeah, or something that you should maybe think about. It should be a job. Yeah. Because sometimes you're you're doing stuff and then you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm always pinging this API and some of these results might be cached and I don't really care about those kind of things or, you know, whatever it may be. You'll find ways to kind of introduce it into your workflow. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's for this module for in terms of web jobs and in terms of uh, node knowledge. Um, I walk you through a bunch of different things, a lot of Azure on the back end, mm -hmm. introduced you to storage, but you didn't see that coming. Um, you know, <laughs> ah, uh, and you know, kind of, kind of getting you going, thinking in, in a different way. And um, you know, for example, this example I'm doing, I actually have a purpose with it. I'm building out a whole other site, and this is doing something on on the back end that's going to help me make it a little bit more performant, I'm hoping. So, you know, maybe you can kind of take uh, a little bit of that and, and introduce it into your own workflow. All right. Well, uh, are there any questions in the chat? Oh, here we go. I don't know. Hold on. Chat. Chat, are there questions? Can I ask that? Maybe. Did we lose our page? No. Nope. No, it's there. No, but someone said a really nice comment about openness at Microsoft, so that's lovely. Nice. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a question. Is DocumentDB similar to Mongo? You. Yes, uh, it is very similar. In fact, um, uh, they're both document-oriented databases. Uh, DocumentDB has a, a bit of a different interface in that it has a more SQL-like interface. So if you're coming from a, a SQL background, you can definitely um, leverage some of those skills and know how to write queries for DocumentDB, but they're both, in fact, document-based. Uh, the other thing is that DocumentDB runs on Azure and is fully scalable and is asset compliant. Uh, and those are some of the key criteria that uh, the DocumentDB product team decided that they needed to, to work on. Uh, and they might be a little bit different from um, how MongoDB does uh, the work. So uh, definitely uh, very simple, uh, very similar. They're both document-based. And um, uh, you can use them for roughly the same purposes. Uh, just the query interface will be a little bit different for uh, both of them. Uh, here's another one. I'm, this is gonna be question hour. I love this. Yeah. Give me, give me the, give me the, all the hard ones so I can give it to him. Uh, can, can I use, can I use TypeScript for Node.js? <laughs> Sorry, I tried to say traitor, and then it just like, and then you got it didn't deaf. let me. <laughs> yeah. uh, see, uh, hello, can't, can't do that to me. Can you use TypeScript with Node.js? Well, <coughs> uh, fundamentally, TypeScript can be compiled back down to JavaScript, so uh, sh I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> Water, aisle six. Okay, we have another one. Where can I follow on training for the Visual Studio uh, Node SDK? So uh, if you look up on, um, uh, if you s literally so search for no tools for Visual Studio, um, I'll put a link <laughs> into the chat. Uh, you'll find that there's a whole kind of like, uh, a lot of them have like little mini portals um, for getting up to speed with Node, uh, with the SDKs, with the tooling. Um, again, th we have that for Python, we have that for across the board. So I'll put a, I'll put a link into the, the chat room for that one. Um, here's one. Uh, how does an Azure web app keep a Node application alive? Uh, Nodemon forever, uh, you know, one of those kind of modules, something else. Uh, it does similar things, I believe. Yeah, on the um, back end. Yeah, uh, I'm not 100% sure. I Good question, though. don't believe that they use Nodemon, but uh, uh, I believe it does restart the app if it crashes. Good question. I think that's, I think that's about it. Yeah, that's all I got. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today uh, with... Uh, Visual Studio Code yeah. with Node.js. Yeah. My name is Rami. This is Stacy. Hi. And a uh, couple of things that you absolutely, absolutely, oh. really, really want you to do. Uh, there's going to be a little pull right at the bottom. Yeah. Somewhere down there. 
Yeah. Somewhere down oh, there. 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 <laughs> All right. You definitely want to uh, fill out that poll. It, it really helps us out, uh, and it tells us uh, what content that you didn't like, what content you did like, which one yeah. you want us to spend more time on the next time around. Uh, so please, please, please fill out the poll. Yeah. Uh, it's right at the bottom. It won't take you very long. At least I don't think it'll take you very long, but I'm pretty sure it won't take you very long. Uh, just do it. Uh, roughly one minute, our, our friend in the back says. One click. Uh, one click. One click. One click. One click. One click, even. And How fast can you click? <laughs> and feel free to reach out to either of us um, if you have any questions or uh, any feedback, any of that stuff. We're, you can easily find us on Twitter, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you can find us. It's not a problem. I think that's All right. Well, thank you so much for attending, and yeah. uh, hopefully you'll have uh, a great time, and you had a great time learning Node.js with us. Yeah, Node on.